Order, please. We'll now begin the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions. Presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. Statements by ministers. Government notices of motion. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture. The, we'll try the Honorable Minister of Communities, Culture, and Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Amy Walsh, Halifax native and executive director of Hockey Nova Scotia was recently named to the National Hockey League's Female Hockey Advisory Committee, and whereas in 2018, the National Hockey League and the National Hockey League Players Association formed a female hockey advisory committee, which is a group of women from the hockey community to help increase the participation of girls and women in the sport. And whereas Amy is the mother of three boys, a former minor hockey coach, a longtime volunteer, a decorated amateur multi-sport athlete, and one of only two women leading a provincial territorial hockey association in Canada, who is dedicated to creating initiatives to diversify hockey, including leading the Hockey Nova Scotia Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, which will produce recommendations to eliminate racism, discrimination, and abuse in hockey. Therefore, be it resolved that members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating Amy Walsh on her new appointment, her current success as Executive Director of Hockey Nova Scotia, and her role in helping to lead the way for female leaders in hockey and in sport. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please indicate aye? Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. We'll now move on to introduction of bills. The Honorable Minister of Finance and Treasury Board. The Honorable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 18 of the Acts of 1998, the Municipal Government Act and Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting virtual meetings. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 18 of the Acts of 1998, the Municipal Government Act, and Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting virtual meetings. Bill 98, an act to amend Chapter 18 of the Acts of 1998, the Municipal Government Act, and Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting virtual meetings. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Ensure Universal Access to Health Care Advice. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Ensure Universal Access to Health Care Advice. Bill 99, An Act to Ensure Universal Access to Health Care Advice. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. I beg leave to introduce an act entitled An Act to Amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act, and Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1995 through 96, the Education CSAP Act regarding school capital construction. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act, 
In Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1995-96, the Education CSAP Act Respecting School Capital Construction. Bill 100, an act to amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act, and Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1995-96, the Education CSAP Act, respecting school capital construction. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South on behalf of the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On behalf of the member for Dartmouth North, I beg leave to introduce an act entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 12 of the Acts of 2011, the Public Procurement Act, respecting transparency in public-private partnerships. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South, on behalf of the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North, begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 12 of the Acts of 2011, the Public Procurement Act respecting transparency in public-private partnerships. Bill 101, an act to amend Chapter 12 of the Acts of 2011, the Public Procurement Act respecting transparency in public-private partnerships. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 197 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Health Services and Insurance Act respecting virtual care. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 197 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Health Services and Insurance Act respecting virtual care. Bill 102, an act to amend Chapter 197 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Health Services and Insurance Act, respecting virtual care. Yeah, ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honorable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter. Bill 103, An Act to Amend Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for sackville cobequid Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 213 of the Revised Statutes, 1989, the Housing Nova Scotia Act. The Honourable Member for sackville cobequid begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 213 of the Revised Statutes, 1989, the Housing Nova Scotia Act. Bill 104, an act to amend Chapter 213 of the Revised Statutes, 1989, the Housing Nova Scotia Act. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Minister of Finance and Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, I uh, hereby request to order uh, to table a bill an act respecting certain financial measures. The Honourable Minister of Finance and Treasury Board begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting Certain Financial Measures. Bill 105, An Act Respecting Certain Financial Measures. Order that the bill be read a second time on a future day. Notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to inform this group that you are never too old to dream. 91-year-old North Sydney resident Bernice Sampson had mused that she had always dreamed of going for a ride in a fire truck. Her grandson Adam, a volunteer firefighter, got to work. That tr dream came true, Mr. Speaker, on January 31st of this year as the truck arrived at her home and took a delighted Bernice for a drive through town with sirens and lights fired up. Bernice was almost giddy as she pulled the lever sounding the horn. Then Mr. Speaker, on March 10th, Bernice celebrated her 91st birthday. 
Her newfound friends at the North Sydney Fire and Rescue returned to visit her, wishing her a most happy birthday, presenting her with a de fire department t-shirt with her name on the back. I would like, like to thank everyone at the North Sydney Fire Department and Rescue for enabling Bernice's dream to have come true. CTV's Ryan McDonald was on hand to film Bernice's ride and captured her great adventure for the news that evening. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Halifax, Needham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's been widely noted that uh, the COVID-19 global pandemic has shown us places where our societies are broken or unjust. And I would suggest that that is the case in Nova Scotia when it comes to health coverage. Um, I have advocated for various people who do not have MSI coverage, but who live and work and are raising families in Nova Scotia with the past three health ministers. Um, and uh, I've made the argument that uh, health coverage should be, should be tied to residency, not to immigration status. Uh, just in the past day, I've heard about clients of the Halifax Refugee Clinic who have been billed for symptomatic COVID testing and of an NSHA employee invited to register for a vaccine but who was unable to because she does not have an MSI number. I beg the health minister's intervention to address this issue. Thank you. The honorable member for Kings West. The honorable member for Kings West. The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaverbank. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Mr. Speaker, our youth are our future, and the individuals who commit their lives to the development of youth cannot be understated. It is with that fact that I'm thrilled to highlight the ongoing tireless efforts of Captain Catherine Gayton of Liverpool for her work as the commanding officer of 545 Privateer Royal Canadian Air Cadet Squadron. Once a cadet herself, Captain Gayton wanted to give back to the program who gave her so much. Mr. Speaker, there is no doubt that she has done just that and more. Working at times shorthanded, Captain Gayton persisted and persevered to ensure more volunteers and staff joined to help her support the youth of Queen Shelburne. If that wasn't impressive, Captain Gayton has a daytime job as a paralegal in Liverpool. Captain Gayton will celebrate 20 years of working with the cadet program this month. I ask all members of this house to join me in congratulating her for her many years of service and the impact she continues to provide to the youth of Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to bring awareness to post-secondary education students' ability to afford for, to further their education. Over a month ago, I met with the local representatives of the Confederation of Students. The COVID-19 pandemic has been hard on post-secondary students. It has meant moving to online classes, taking on more debt, dealing with instability in housing and food insecurity. It also means graduating into an uncertain job market as tuition rates continue to rise. Mr. Speaker, this government can minimize the financial burden of students and make access to post-secondary education more readily available by reducing tuition by 10%. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Marjorie Simmons is an award-winning author and beloved figure in her community of Discoose. She began her career as a freelance journalist in Vancouver. She has published numerous essays, uh, articles and stories across Canada and the United States, as well as three books, Coastal Lives, Year of the Horse, and Memoir, Conversations and Craft. Marjorie also teaches seminars and courses on memoir, memoir writing across Canada. Marjorie was one of the artists honored at the 2020 Creative Nova Scotia Awards Gala. She is one of three winners of the Established Artist Recognition Award, which acknowledges people who have emerged from their initial training and development into established artists. Mr. Speaker, prior to this, Marjorie received gold in the delightful category of entertainment in the 2019 Atlantic Journalism Awards for her article profiling well-known musician Matt Minglewood and his wife Babs. 
Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the constituents of Cape Breton, Richmond, and the members of the Nova Scotia Legislature, I congratulate Marjorie on her recent awards, and I look forward to her next book to be released in May, Some Beach Somewhere, The Harness Racing, racing Legend from a One-Horse Stable. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. On November 17, 2021, the communities of Onslow, Crows Mills, Belmont, and Masstown will celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Onslow Belmont Fire Brigade. On January 30, 1961, six outstanding leaders in the community met at the Lower Onslow Church and planted the seed that grew into the brigade. Those outstanding leaders, namely Carl Barnhill, Lee Higgins, Daryl Clark, Maynard Wilson, Keith Hamilton, and Kenneth Crow saw a need within the communities and were prepared to make a difference. Since that time, the brigade has also grown to its current membership of 48, both men and women, who have made the volunteer commitment to protect their communities, both the people and their properties. In fact, the number of properties has also grown to over 2,000 private residences and over 70 commercial and residential businesses. Leadership in any organization, Mr. Speaker, will determine the success in meeting the objectives set by the leaders. Let me congratulate both those past and present who have provided wisdom, guidance, and direction over the life of the brigade. In particular, the current chief, Chief Greg News, and his deputy, Deputy Daryl Curry, who have stepped to the plate, made the commitment to their community, and who have earned the respect of all of their fellow firefighters. Congratulations, Greg and Daryl, and thank you for your time. The Honorable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate the staff of the Sackville Business Association, along with the organizing team of the Sackville Snow Days Festival. The seventh annual Sackville Snow Days Festival was held from February 12th to the 15th. And although the festival had to take a different shape this year, the team worked very hard to successfully bring the community of Lower Sackville together. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask all members of the House of Assembly to join me in congratulating the Sackville Business Association, along with the countless community groups, organizations, businesses, volunteers, and sponsors who continue to support the Sackville Snow Days Festival each year. Without their commitment and hard work, this winter fun weekend would not be possible. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Cape Breton Center. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to thank the Kinsman Club of the Waterford and Area for sponsoring a Canada Day 2020 nine months later motorcade. The motorcade was composed of first responders, frontline workers, and in recognition of the incredible contributions made by the first responders, our frontline workers in our community. Mr. Speaker, I was honored to be invited to participate in this event. It was, it was, it was a joy to be had. Um, and I want to thank to, I want to thank the kinsmen for organizing uh, organizing this, and to all frontline first responders and essential workers. Thank you. The honourable member for Chester St. Margaret's. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate the Hubbard Streetscape Project, co-chaired by Melanie McIver and Matthew Morash, which was able to secure over fifty thousand dollars for their new community improvement plans. A project committee was struck to work on the creation of both safer roads and a more vibrant main street in Hubbards. The project secured grants from the Nova Scotia Association of Community Development Business Corporation, the Nova Scotia Department of Communities, Culture and Heritage, as well as the Aspetagan Heritage Trust. This money will go toward the creation of a community plan as well as to further and to further engage community involvement and support. Mr. Speaker, I invite all members of the House of Assembly to join me in congratulating the Hubbard Streetscaping Project for securing funding to embark on their uh, uh, vision for a safer and more vibrant community. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the Bull Run Trail Association, a dedicated group of community volunteers whose hard work and determination over the past 18 years has created the Bull Run Trail, a place where everyone is welcome to explore, be active, connect to nature, and share good times. The 24-kilometer trail connects to Bridgewater on one side and to the region of Queens on the other. It travels through the communities of Hebville, Hebs Cross, Italy Cross, Middlewood, and Danesville. This multi-use trail is used for hiking, running, cycling, ATVing, snowmobiling, horseback riding, and many other activities. 
The Bull Run Trail has lots of little surprises. It is one of the only covered trail bridges in Nova Scotia and meanders along Fancy and Wallace Lake, as well as farmland, streams, marshes, and awesome businesses, including the Tasty Freeze and Indian Garden Farms. The Trail Association's chair, Rayburn Wynott, says, there's some lovely scenery, as well as a wetland area that's great for bird watching, taking photos, or painting. I ask members of the legislature to join me in thanking these outstanding volunteers with the Bull Run Trail Association. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, real top salespeople are excellent at their job due, due to their creativity and originality. Ron Mosier has been at the top of his game as a very successful vehicle salesperson for 37 years, receiving numerous awards in the process, including national sales leadership recognition on several occasions. He has also been the recipient of the highest recognition, peak performer, at his dealership on more than one occasion an award presented to exceptional salespeople in Canada. <clears throat> Mosier is a consistent top three Atlantic salesperson because he has perfected the art of identifying what his customers want and delivering on those expectations. Ron is resourceful and goes above and beyond to satisfy the customer and close the deal. That is why he has a long list of lifetime customers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to uh, share with uh, fellow members just a few highlights from a conversation hosted yesterday by the Housing and Homelessness Partnership called Housing and Homelessness in 2021. Uh, it featured a conversation with Jim Graham from the Affordable Housing Association of Nova Scotia. Just a, a couple of notes shared to me from my constituency assistant. In December 2019, there were 145 chronically homeless people in the Halifax area. Today, there are 345. There was a conversation about what would prevent landlords from increasing rent as income assistance rates increase $100 a month as, as uh, released in this budget. And uh, the comment was that only rent control, in fact, will keep landlords from increasing rents in response to income assistance rates rising. Uh, there was urging again of uh, the government to seize the potential of purchasing buildings that are affordable, older, older buildings right now because there is otherwise no quick fix. Um, indeed, there is no quick fix for homelessness. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in honor of Daffodils Month, I would like to highlight the amazing contribution of uh, our local uh, Canadian Cancer Society located downtown Halifax. On February 6, 2020, my CA and I had the privilege of getting a tour of the Dr. Susan K. Roberts Lodge uh, from the director, the regional director, Kelly Cobb. The lodge is funded entirely uh, by, donors, by donors' dollars and has provided a safe and friendly space for over 800 guests from around the Maritimes. Furthermore, Daffodil Campaigns shed a light and has provided funding for cancer research for prevention and detection. That is why I proudly wear my Daffodil pin today. It is said that one in two Canadians is diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. Daffodils signify love and support. As their famous motto says, when daffodils bloom, hope grows. Mr. Speaker, would the members of this house join me in applauding the efforts of the, cancers, uh, of the Canadian Cancer Society and all their hard work and research? Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize Rebecca Stickings, Vice Principal at Mount Edward Elementary School in Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, it's been said that your life can change in a single heartbeat, and this was the terrifying reality for a student, a family, and a school community when in December of 2020, uh, a student experienced a medical emergency on school grounds. Rebecca immediately jumped into action and administered life-saving first aid until uh, first responders arrived. Due to Rebecca's quick thinking and first aid skills, the student is now receiving the medical care and attention they need. No amount of recognition will ever equate to the magnitude of having saved a student's life. 
but the Dartmouth East community will always be grateful, Mr. Speaker, and proud of Rebecca's heroic actions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, a wise person recently told me that it takes a full season to become a hockey mom. And Mr. Speaker, I am almost there. This weekend marks the end of the Dartmouth Whalers under seven and under nine season, and it has been a fun, rewarding, and roller coaster of a first hockey season for our little family. Aside from watching my kids gain confidence and skills on the ice and being proud as punch of what I've seen, I'm simply amazed by the incredible work of the parent volunteers who have worked tirelessly against some pretty tough COVID-19 odds to make sure the Whalers players had every chance to be on the ice and to do it safely. From receiving kids at the door and getting them on the ice during the times when the parents couldn't come to the arena, to getting COVID forms sent out each week to be filled out to make sure everyone there was healthy, to live streaming practices and games, to the regular work of scheduling and fundraising, the work of the volunteers was truly amazing. As a first time almost hockey mom, I'm really grateful for all of the folks who kept our kids and so many other kids from our community safe while learning new skills and having fun. Thanks to all the incredible coaches and assistants and special shout outs to Jillian Hatcher, Krista Holland, Clinton McLeod and coaches Alex and Brian. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaverbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to thank four groups of young children who showed up a true meaning of giving back, fundraising to purchase additional halter heart monitors for the IWK. Alicia and Ainsley Rose, Olivia and Reese Whittle, uh, Kaylin Piercy, and Casey and Caden Sprague all contributed to the fundraiser. Alicia initially came up with the fundraising idea for her sister, Ainsley. Ainsley was born with a heart defect, so they wanted to raise money for the IWK, who has been helping uh, her. Ainsley received her heart monitor and her halter monitor, and that motivated Sister Alicia and her friends to raise uh, funds to uh, for more halter heart monitors. The kids uh, held lemonade stands during the summer and hot chocolate stands in the winter. They I also did a fundraiser with homemade cards and Christmas bows. bows. People were really generous. Uh, and would often pay more than they uh, were asking, said Olivia. One person literally emptied their pockets and gave up uh, us everything they had. Mr. Speaker, please join me in thanking the, uh, the and thanking uh, this caring group of children for their hard work. Thank you, Mr. The Speaker. Honourable Member for Cole Arbor Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the Volunteer Firefighters Christmas Tree Fundraiser at Station 16 located in the Eastern Passage community. It may not be known that 100% of the funds raised by this program stays in the community. Funds raised go towards supporting school breakfast programs, educational bursaries, community crossing flags, Station Number 16 Annual Open House, Ocean View Continuing Care Centre and Passage Days, Princess, just to name a few. With COVID-19 restrictions, the 2020 tree lot was still able to operate with the inclusion of proper safety protocols. I ask all members of the Legislative Assembly to join me in recognizing Fire Station 16 volunteer firefighters for their hard work and dedication dedication to our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, April is Cancer Awareness Month, and I would like to recognize Dartmouth North constituent Eric Gould, who in October, which is Childhood Cancer Month, uh, raised $2,200 for cancer research and support. As an incentive for folks to donate to his fundraiser, Eric committed to cutting off his self-described golden locks of hair, which he had grown halfway down his back over the course of the last two and a half years. At the end of the fundraiser, his hair went to the charity Angel Hair for Kids to be turned into a wig for a young survivor of cancer. Ms. Nicole Steger at Studio 1081 donated her time and talent to cutting Eric's hair, in addition to making a donation to his cause, bringing his, him past his goal of $2,000. The most amazing part about this is that it wasn't his first time cutting his hair. In 2017, he, he did it again, or he did it before, to raise $1,000 for the same cause. And I ask all members of this House to join me in congratulating Eric in exceeding his fundraising goal and to, and to everyone who uh, donated to his campaign. Eric and his supporters brought much light to, um, to, to our community in 2020. Thank you. 
The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to praise a remarkable young woman from Lordways, 19-year-old Tamika Stevens. Her 15-season minor baseball career began with the Richmond Cougars Minor Baseball Association before moving on to play with the Richmond Royals. She then went on to play the under A18 Dodgers in New Waterford for two years before joining Cape Breton Expos. Mr. Speaker, although Tamika has played on all female teams, including provincial under 14 and under 16 teams, she predominantly played on male-dominated teams. In fact, Tamika was the only female to compete in the Sydney Sooners Competitive Baseball League last season. I would ask the members of this House, Mr. Speaker, to join me in thanking Tamika for giving back to the sport she loves by volunteer coaching for the Richmond Royals T-Ball and under-11 teams. May she continue to inspire other young women and embolden others to pursue their life's passions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. One of the great things about Nova Scotia is the excellent sportsmanship of our young people. And there's no better example of the sportsmanship than what we witnessed recently at a junior high basketball game between Maple Grove and Barrington. In this game, a student from Barrington, Cameron McKinnon, who has Down syndrome, was on the court in the final minutes of the game. With tears from the crowd and both teams' benches, Cameron took a shot but missed, and the ball landed in opponent Curtis Middleton's hands. Without hesitation, he passed the ball back to Cameron a few times until Cameron was able to score a basket. It was a thrilling and special moment that none of us are soon to forget. Curtis's sportsmanship and Cameron's perseverance exemplify who we are uh, as a community and a region. And Mr. Speaker, please join me in thanking Curtis and congratulating Cameron on reminding us all what true community and sportsmanship looks like. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the community of River John for their Veterans Banner Program. With the dedication of a few community members, River John displayed 32 banners of local veterans on telephone poles this past fall. The idea started when a resident of River John read an article about veterans banners being displayed in the community of River Hebert. A local printing company was contacted to create a sample banner. Phone calls were made to family members of known veterans in the area, and the project grew from there. The banners will be put up each September and taken down after Remembrance Day. Mr. Speaker, I applaud these volunteers for their efforts on this worthy project and for honoring their local veterans. I look forward to seeing the display of banners again this year in River John. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to congratulate two junior girls sports teams at New Germany Rural High School. The junior girls soccer team became district champions when they defeated Bayview Community School on November 2nd, 2020. In February, the junior girls volleyball team also became district champions in their final game against North Queens Community School. Mr. Speaker, I wish to recognize the teams for their hard work and dedication throughout the sports season. Congratulations to the players and their coaches for winning the district championships. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville, Beaver Bank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge Yomai Schwa, also known as Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is to recognize in Can which is recognized in Canada this year on April the 8th today. This Psalm Day, we honor and remember the approximately 6 million Jewish lives that were lost in the Holocaust between 1933 and 1945, and to pay tribute to the Canada's diverse community of Holocaust survivors. With this year marking the 76th year since the Allied troops stormed the gates of Auschwitz against the Nazi regime, despite the devastation of the Jewish people have faced during the war, they have persevered and with admirability, bravery, dignity, and heroism. Mr. Speaker, Holocaust Remembrance Day is to ensure that the legacies of the six million Jewish lives are never forgotten and to ensure that never again shall we stand for any forms of discrimination in our communities today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to congratulate Bedford resident Ed McHugh on being named both a Halifax uh, on being named both a Halifax Volunteer Award winner and a Provincial Volunteer Award winner this past year. 
Ed has many volunteer accomplishments and has been involved in many organizations over the years, including, but not limited to, 100 Bedford Men Who Care, Northwood, Special Olympics, the Community Justice Society, the St. FX Alumni Association, the Alzheimer's Society, the Governor General's Canadian Leadership Conference, Large Canada Foundation, Basketball Nova Scotia, the Bedford Eagles basketball team, the Nova Scotia, Scotia Association of Basketball Officials, and the C.P. Allen Junior Girls Varsity Basketball Team. Phew. Ed's also on the organizing committee for the Bedford Volunteer Awards, and we so appreciate his involvement in recognizing the many achievements of volunteers like himself in our community of Bedford. Thank you, Ed. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to honor a Second World War veteran, Alcide Leblanc, who turned 100 years young on March 21st. Formerly of Wedgeport, Mr. Leblanc lives at the Veteran Place in Yarmouth. On his 100th, uh, 100th birthday, because of public health restrictions, there was no big party. And to celebrate his 101st birthday, the Wedgeport Legion members and others gathered outside Veterans Place to wish him a happy birthday as he watched through a window. He was presented with a regimental scroll and a coin of the Re Royal Regiment of the Canadian Artillery, both of which were the highlight of his 101st birthday. Mr. LeBlanc spent 11 months in combat, landing in Normandy in July of 1944. He fought the retreating German army all the way to Berlin until VE Day. In 2014, he received the French Medal of Honor. Mr. LeBlanc is the only surviving founder, a founding member of the Wedgeport Legion and its uh, second World War veteran uh, and member. Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of the legislature to join me in thanking Mr. LeBlanc for his service and wish him a belated happy birthday. Bonne fête, al -Sid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to congratulate the St. Margaret's Bay Seniors Association for creating an important kit called Ready for the Storm, especially targeted to senior residents in rural areas to stay safe during winter storms, especially those who may live alone or have mobility issues. Bay Seniors have put together a handy tip guide as well as emergency storm kits for seniors living throughout the St. Margaret's Bay area. While many of us keep candles and flashlights on hand, this publication emphasizes the need for such items as extra batteries, a fully charged phone, and most importantly, an I need help sign that can be posted in the window in case of emergencies. Mr. Speaker, I invite the members of the House of Assembly to join me in congratulating the St. Margaret's Bay Seniors Association on their initiative to help seniors stay safe during the winter storm season. The Honourable Member for Kings South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians, particularly younger audiences, may recognize, recognize the music line, You Can Be a Superhero Too, sung by Colebrook mu music artist Matt the Music Man McFarlane. The lyrics often reflect on Matt's childhood experiences that included bullying in school. Creating children's music was inspired by the birth of his first child, and his lyrics include messages of becoming more self-confident. Matt has been writing and performing music for nearly 20 years. In 2019, he was the recipient of Nova Scotia's Children's Artist of the Year Award, and most recently, he has been nominated for an East Coast Music Award. His onstage performances capture the full attention and imagination of his younger audience with costume changes and a platypus as a sidekick. On behalf of Nova Scotia's House of Assembly, I would like to thank Matt, the music man, for his contribution to providing positive and inspirational music for our children and congratulate him for his recent nomination for an East Coast Music Award. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to recognize these outstanding individuals and to spotlight these hardworking professionals by offering thanks for their endurance and hard work during COVID-19. Teachers deserve public recognition for all of the challenges they have faced as they adapted to work to ensure learning could continue during these uncertain times. For many children, school is an anchor in their lives. The loss of social interaction and extracurricular physical activity, as well as possible stress at home from loss of employment by parents is a lot for our children to deal with. Mr. Speaker and members of the legislature, please join me in thanking our teachers, Cumberland North Pandemic Heroes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Armdale. 
Mr. Speaker, access to healthy, affordable local food is vital. Halifax is fortunate to benefit from food security initiatives that are making a difference. I want to highlight today Shabakto Connections and Mobile Food Market, Square Roots, Fairview Clayton Park, and the new Clayton Park Farmers Market coming to the Cedar Event Center. Shabakto Connections distributes free produce packs twice a month to those in the Spryfield and Sambro area who need them. The Square Roots team operate bi-weekly market days out of the Fairview Citadel Salvation Army and provide low-cost and, low and free veggie bundles from local farmers as well as bread to residents. Clayton Park Farmers Market will provide an affordable option for up to 40 local vendors to sell directly to community. I'm proud to support these organizations and I'm grateful for the generosity that keeps them running. I ask all members of the legislature to join me in thanking the countless volunteers helping put nutritious, affordable food on tables. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to rec recognize and congratulate Truro Junior A Bearcats Head Coach and General Manager Sean Evans and Truro goalie Alec McDonald. In November, Sean was recognized for his 1,000th game coach in the Maritime Junior Hockey League. Sean plays an integral role in the local grassroots development and of junior, and of junior hockey players in our community. Last week, one of his players, Alec, McDonald of Truro was named the MHL Goalie of the Week. And after four years with the team, he celebrated his 100th game and has an outstanding record of 55, 29, five and five. Mr. Speaker, our hometown Bearcats are currently on 10 game winning streak and are preparing for the MHL's Canadian Tire Cup playoffs during these COVID, un during these uncertain times. Mr. Speaker, I would like to congratulate both Sean and Alec for achieving these milestones, wishing the Toronto Bearcats great success in the 2021 playoffs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Preston Dartmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize Rod McDonald of Lake Echo, one of Canada's prominent type designers and educator as a man on a mission to preserve some of the history of Canadian type, as well as samples of his work in, in an online resource called Canadian Type Archive. Since 1970s, his type practice will grow and include design word marks and letter forms for General Motors, the National Art Centre in Ottawa, Blackberry, and magazine Chatelaine, Applied Arts and Canadian Business and Toronto Life. This newest type inspired initiative, the Canadian Type Archives, which he hopes will become an online resource dedicated to the history of Canadian typograph. He's seeking information on anyone that who's worked in Halifax earlier printing industry and historical samples of printing and typograph in the Atlantic provinces. He also hoping to determine if there are some important type artifacts and historical prints in the collections of the uh, Atlantic Canada libraries and archives that could be included on the online resource. Halifax is the home of the first printing press in Canada, the first newspaper in Canada, the Halifax Gazette, which was presented on, which was printed on that press. Rod McDonald, through his initiative and expertise, is serving an interesting part of Canadian history. The Find it, fill in a need in the community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northside, Westbound. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to thank Jim Cronlund, formerly from Niagara-on-the-Lake, now a resident of North Sydney, for his Facebook group, Capers Community Books. This group invites people from across the island to drop by his home and borrow from his hundreds of books. Another major focus is recruiting volunteers to drop books free of charge to seniors or anyone else experiencing a difficult time getting out. These are difficult times for many, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Cronland wanted to give people something to connect with other people, to enjoy their time a little more so we're not so isolated. With COVID happening and so many restrictions in place, an endeavor such as this is wonderful. Mr. Speaker, I invite all members to join me in thanking Jim Cronland for making this difficult time a little easier for so many in our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Guysboro Eastern Shore, Trackety. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize and honor the lives lost at sea. Each year, on the second day of August, the community of Canso holds the Provincial Seamen's Memorial, a service to commemorate the lives that have been taken while working in the fishery. Canso has had four centuries of fishing heritage, and their memorial contains numerous names of fishermen and women who have lost their lives at sea and commemorating the seagoing traditions of the Canso, Hazel Hill, Dover, and surrounding communities. The memorial draws attention to the hazards associated with the fishery and its importance to many Nova Scotian communities. Not only do they provide their families with a livelihood, but they provide their community and beyond with food to eat. I do not take this sacrifice lightly. It is a dangerous job, and many of these fishermen and fisherwomen pridefully carry on that role despite the risks. Thank you to all the fishermen and fisherwomen out there and to those who have been taken by the sea and are no longer with us. May you rest in peace. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Queens, Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I acknowledge and congratulate Caitlin Leslie on the recent opening of her preschool for children in Queens County. Little Hearts Preschool opened its doors on October 5th of 2020 and offers classes for both three and four year olds. Preparing and opening a preschool requires hard work and determination under normal circumstances and in doing so in the midst of a pandemic means even more challenges to overcome. The kind hearted Miss Caitlin has worked hard to make this dream a reality and has created a wonderful space and environment for her students to learn successfully and safely. Mr. Speaker and members of the legislature, please join me in thanking Caitlin for opening this wonderful new preschool in our community and in wishing her many years of success teaching our young students. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour, Portland Valley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to acknowledge and congratulate Melissa Sutherland on the first anniversary of her new business. Melissa is the owner and operator of Paw Prince Doggy Daycare and Grooming, a business that has been open since 2016. Then COVID threw her a curveball and she was forced to close. So in April 16th, 2020, she decided to find a new way to sustain her family by reinventing herself and opened a shop selling quality dog and cat products online to her local neighborhood of Coal Harbor and surrounding areas. That business is Paw Prince Doggy Supply Shop. During the pandemic, pet ownership increased with so many people working from home. So why not provide all the products she loves and trust to her pet, to, to, to her own pets? When Melissa's business opened online, customers can choose to have those orders delivered or they could have them the option of uh, con contactless, sorry, contactless curbside pickup. This helps to keep the cost of the to the consumer at a, as low and so it's low while helping to keep the pets safe and healthy during the pandemic we are happy to say that melissa's doggy daycare has since reopened and her online pet supplies are thriving and and i celebrate her first anniversary melissa we acknowledge and appreciate the business sense and congratulates. We congratulate you for all your success. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chad Lindsay is, uh, I want to recognize Chad Lindsay of Lower Sackville. Chad Lindsay through Sackville.live keeps residents informed about what is going on in the local communities. Sackville.live is a fun and informative community-based virtual news channel which highlights the events taking place around Sackville, Beaverbank, Lucasville, and Mount Uniac. Chad Lindsay, the host of Sackville.live, shares positive, interesting, and informative news stories, sports events, and entertainment. He also focuses on highlighting those people who are working very hard to make their community a better place to live. Mr. Speaker, I ask that all members of the House of Assembly join me in thanking Chad Lindsay for his continued dedication of bringing the local communities together by sharing information and to 
and enjoyment through Sackville.Live. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Pictou Center. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a car salesperson whose skills are product knowledge, business communication, client engagement, and simply being very social are great attributes to have. Butch Mosier, known as Croc to by his many friends, always maintains a good balance of communication between himself and the customer. He easily goes with the flow, adapting to the client's schedule and preferences. He's clear and concise in what he's communicating. He finds out what the customer wants and needs and does his best to satisfy them. Presently in his third decade selling vehicles, Mosier has earned the trust of numerous lifelong customers. Butch Mosier always sets the bar high and goes above and beyond to satisfy the customer. That is why he has been such a popular and successful car salesperson in Pictou County. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to recognize Deb Hartland, the owner of the flag shop on Main Street in Dartmouth East. Uh, prior to opening the flag shop, uh, Deb worked as a registered nurse for over 20 years. And uh, Deb is, is an accomplished professional. She holds both a master's degree and a, and a PhD. Along with these professional accomplishments, uh, Deb finds time to, to, to volunteer in our community and is instrumental um, in, uh, in facilitating the youth choir uh, at Christ the King Parish. Once the pandemic hit, uh, Deb and her team at the flag shop quickly changed gears in order to make masks for the public as quickly as possible. And she also wanted to support frontline workers who were responding to the pandemic. So she designed the Healthcare Heroes flag and a portion of all the proceeds went to the QE2 Foundation's COVID-19 response fund. And by the end of May of last year, they were able to make their first donation of over $2,200. So Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the residents of Dartmouth East, I'd like to thank Deb and her staff for their quick and incredible response to the pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Coal Arbor Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to thank author Jacques Gaudreau for gen generously donating three signed youth books that he wrote. In February 2021, I placed a request for children's books on social media to fill a local free library bookshelf at the South Woodside Elementary School. The donation response from the community was heartwarming and overwhelming. Each of the almost 800 books that came in were appreciated, but Jacques' book, Rebecca and Ruby, Meet the Bully, the Haunted House and The Mermaid and the Pirate are very special because they were signed by the author. I ask all members of the Legislative Assembly to join me in recognizing Jacques Gaudreau for his generosity, kindness and willingness to give back to our Coal Harbour Eastern Passage community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pico West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge Mr. Ronnie Bailey for his 23 years of service as a councillor and a warden for River John, Tony River, and part of West Branch. Mr. Bailey was first elected as councillor in 1997 and has served as deputy warden for four years and warden for eight years. In his 23 years in office, Ronnie counts the River John Library among his biggest accomplishments. Some of the other highlights of his time in office was the creation of the River John Community Action Society, building of a septic treatment facility, and being the first community to get LED streetlights. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank Ronnie Bailey for his years of dedication and service to District 4 of Pictou County. He has certainly been an integral part of the success and growth of the community he served and as a dear friend. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate, congratulate uh, CIOE Community Radio members of its planning committee and the many volunteers at the station for their presentation of Inspiring Women in Song, a concert which was held to celebrate International Women's Day. The concert showcased several award-winning Nova Scotian female artists. Enthusiastic music fans were uh, treated to an evening of original music and entertainment. I ask that all members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating CIOE Community Radio and their volunteers for their hard work and dedication to the arts and culture of our province. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. The time allotted for member statements has just about expired and that gives me an opportunity to remind all members that the time allotted for each individual member statement is in fact one minute and I know sometimes it's tricky uh, but I would encourage all members to keep their eye on the shot clock there so we keep in tune. The House will now recess for 15 minutes uh, for a mandated COVID break and proceedings will resume at 12.15.
Uh, Mr. Speaker, my... Uh, the mic is on, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure why.
Order, please. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question for the Premier. I read this morning in the uh, CBC article about the rise in heart attacks and strokes in Nova Scotia. Uh, in, the, in the article, the, the heart attack uh, statistics are, are truly staggering. This past fall and winter, Nova Scotia saw nearly double the heart attacks that we would normally see. And the reason doctors are citing is that the public are afraid to come to the hospital to see their doctor because of fear of COVID, even when they get the early, early warning signs. So when Nova Scotians ignore early symptoms because they're afraid, they get sicker and sicker. And we know that low case counts don't save us because we've had low case counts in this province and people are still afraid. Just like that's the Premier, uh, does the, does the, uh, how does the Liberal government plan to tackle the growing danger to Nova Scotians by ignoring early symptoms? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think it's, uh, we're in an enviable position if you look at uh, other provinces right now where hospitals are overrun, Mr. Speaker. If you look even at our neighboring uh, New Brunswick in the northern region, they have challenges in the Edmondson area and obviously across the province uh, where they've had shutdowns, Mr. Speaker. Uh, now we're able to open up more because of our positive epidemiology. That's because of the positive work of Nova Scotians. Uh, we have work to do in this province to ensure that we are uh, intervening earlier on to make sure that we keep people healthy in this province. That's why in this budget uh, we put more supports in public health uh, to ensure we have more public health nurses in communities to make sure that we're looking in the front end and not just dealing with the illness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The article goes on to talk about the additional pressures that, being, that are being placed on paramedics and our ambulance services. Uh, Dr. John Sapp noted that while calls for cardiac arrests are within a normal range, uh, they're at the high end of the range and they haven't seen the seasonal dips uh, that Nova Scotia generally sees. Uh, with high offload times and constant code critical warnings, the system is stretched to its limits. We've already heard that this session that increased cardiac arrest calls can have tragic results. Uh, will the Premier Will the Premier acknowledge that the healthcare system that was struggling even before the pandemic continues to struggle today? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and this is a national issue. Uh, all Premiers are united in asking for an increase to the Canada Health Transfer, Mr. Speaker. If you go back in time to the 70s, they, they were funding health care in levels of over 30 percent, and that has been reduced. Uh, we need to continue to use uh, the resources we have, Mr. Speaker. The member knows we're in deficit, uh, but we have strategic increases in areas that Nova Scotians inspect, and health care is top of the list. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I like to dig into the, the federal component there. I think the Premier just indicated that he's, he's advocating uh, to Ottawa for higher trial health care transfer payments to Nova Scotia. I'd like to ask the, the Premier if he can share any, any correspondence that he sent with Ottawa and specifically is he advocating for a uh, change to the health care transfer system away from just straight up per capita to a more demographic based health care transfer system? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, uh, we would like to see uh, more consideration given to demographics, the aging population here. We've been uh, united for some time uh, in Atlanta Canon with that approach. Uh, and right now, all premiers across uh, the country are united in asking the federal government uh, for more uh, of their funds to, to do, uh, deal with the issues of long wait times. This is a national issue. Uh, we're going to continue to support that. Uh, and my name is part of that correspondence from the chair of COF. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Premier spoke yesterday again about his plan to balance the budget in four years. Now, the four-year fiscal plan he presented to the House shows that his path to get there includes a drop in departmental expenses next year of over $200 million. Now, since the Department of Health and Wellness represents 46% of the government's spending, that means that the Department of Health is going to have to cut $96 million from its budget next year in order to meet the government goal. Uh, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier tell the people of Nova Scotia how he plans to take $96 million out of the health budget? Honourable Premier. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And what we have is an achievable plan uh, before the House. Uh, we made some strategic investments in this uh, budget. Much of the spending that uh, both parties opposite have been asking for would have put us in a more uh, challenging position. I said yesterday that I will not support uh, putting this province back into structural deficits that predated our government. Uh, this is the only party now in Nova Scotia that advocates uh, for balanced budgets, and I'm proud of that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. But this is the only party that in 2015 cut the film tax credit. It is the only party that then uh, cut the funding grants to the Schizophrenic Society of Nova Scotia and the Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia and the Eating Disorders of the Society of Nova Scotia. And it is the only party that took millions in 2016 out of the nursing home budget. The, the, the health minister at the time called that a belt tightening year. Mr. Speaker, I think the Premier owes the people of Nova Scotia a straight answer. How does the government plan to further tighten the belt around the health budget over the next three years? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of the increases uh, of investments in the core of what government should be due provincially. We're increasing uh, health care spend spending so we can modernize. We're spending record amounts in infrastructure so that we can attract world-class health care providers here to the province. We're increasing our spending education as we've done. That party cut $60 million, $65 million out of education, which we reversed. We created the biggest social program of a generation with pre-primary, which both parties opposite voted against. I'm proud of the the fiscal responsibility that this party continues to stand for, and that will continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. This is not a history lesson. I'm talking about the present budget that is before us. It says that $209 million is what the government is going to take out of government expenses this next year. That's more than the budgets of agriculture, energy and mines, environment and climate change, and fisheries and aquaculture all combined. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier give his word to the nurses and the CCAs and the teachers and the EPAs and all the frontline people in the province of Nova Scotia that there will be no layoffs on his path to a balanced budget? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thought I was getting some history advice from the member with his uh, first question. Uh, the reality is some of the places that he's referencing did need support. Uh, we've invested in <laughs> mental health. We've invest invested in long-term care. Historic investments, a hundred million increase to long-term care. That's what I said would, would be my priority immediately on day one, and it is. We continue to look at capital upgrades across the province. I firmly believe that we should not be burdening future generations with the programs that we're incurring today. That's a principle of this party. We're going to continue to look at ways that we can grow the economy in record ways as we went before the pandemic. We were leading in economic growth, uh, best economic performance in decades in this province that helps support more revenue into the province, revenue that we can use for health care services and education services, and we're going to continue to work from a balanced approach to ensure that we have fiscal capacity for future generations. The Honourable Member for Northside Westbound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, two weeks ago, I asked the Minister of Health a question about Nova Scotia's new online casino and some of the incentives that were being offered to play at alc.ca. I was concerned about the use of taxpayer money to incentivize gambling, particularly at a time when many people are staying close to home. Layer the increased stress of a pandemic life, and I was concerned that the province was creating fertile ground for Nova Scotians to develop gambling addictions. The minister responded that the play at on the site would be monitored and interventions made when needed. Can the minister detail what questions of what types of support or programming will be offered through these interventions? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So uh, the uh, decision that was made uh, through Atlantic Lottery was to provide a regulated, uh, safer, uh, gambling site than the uh, internationally unregulated ones. Um, furthermore, the a certain percentage of the proceeds that go into Atlantic Lottery and through our casino here in Halifax are actually redistributed into uh, gambling awareness uh, as well as uh, direct supports for those uh, dealing with uh, with with um, addictions uh, issues. Uh, uh, furthermore, government is expanding our addictions and mental health uh, services uh, through various programs, including expansion of our uh, mental health 
uh, our, our e-mental health services, uh, creating single session uh, therapy for the non-urgent uh, cases, and uh, creating uh, centers for addiction and, and uh, uh, withdrawal uh, treatment uh, in every single zone in this uh, province, because we do know that those suffering with gambling addiction oftentimes are suffering uh, from other uh, mental health challenges as well. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the minister. Um, I want to quote the minister directly from March 26th. The minister said at the time, we're doing so in a regulated format where there's actual tools for intervention. People monitor gambling behavior and folks who support those in trouble reach out when they see a problematic situation. Now, when you go to the alc.ca site and read their terms of service, it says ALC will not track or assess your gambling risk and will not be responsible for taking any action or, su or suggesting that you may, that you take an action yourself. Forgive me, Mr. Speaker, but those sound like contra direct contradictions. My question to the minister, why is the minister promising a level of protection that seems to be against the terms of service of the site? The, Hon the Honorable Minister of Health. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the interventions are provided uh, through through government uh, services and a portion of the proceeds that um, uh, Atlantic Lotto uh, receive does fund uh, some of these uh, some of these services. Uh, so I've identified uh, a list of those services uh, in my in my previous answer. Uh, but again, uh, these services are being enhanced through government. Uh, those are uh, virtual services. Uh, single session uh, therapy in this budget, uh, as well as uh, withdrawal uh, management and, and addiction services as well. So uh, we are enhancing those services through government and certain proceeds from Atlantic Lotto uh, help fund gambling awareness uh, issues and, and, and intervention um, options. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased that the government is enhancing services. However, I have grave concerns about a program that puts the onus on the province to detect problem gambling behavior. If this program exists as the minister describes, then the province is assuming a duty of care, where if they fail to identify a problem gambler, then the gambler can stand up and say the province said it would be there to stop me and it wasn't. It places the province in a potentially terrible situation. It has absolved every player at alc.ca of personal responsibility over their own actions and made the government their caretaker. Last year, the government passed legislation that protects itself from certain lawsuits, but as the finance minister of the day said, the protection does not apply in situations of alleged negligence or omission by operators. My question to the minister, um, does he acknowledge the duty of care that the ranking government is now taking on? Order, please. Just like to remind all members that it's uh, not within the rules of this chamber to refer to the current government using the for the last name of the premier. Oh. Those may be CNS uh, rules and regulations, but they're not the rules of this chamber. You can refer to past governments using the name of the premier of the day, but not the current one. The Honorable Minister of Health. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I mean, the, the health department's role in this, we do not oversee Atlantic Lotto. We're not their regulator. Um, our role is to provide mental health and addiction supports to Nova Scotians. Uh, those supports are being enhanced. Uh, we're also uh, providing grants to local organizations that provide peer-to-peer -peer support and community assistance for those struggling with mental health uh, addictions as well. So our uh, supports through this department, uh, which is, is not related to Atlantic Lotto, um, have grown over the years, uh, and I hope that the member will vote for our budget because there are significant increases to our mental health budget, uh, which will help us reach more Nova Scotians in a more timely uh, manner when they need us. The Honourable Member for Northside, Westmount. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to redirect to the Minister responsible for Gaming and Corporation. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize for um, my last question. I thought that, that was good news that the government was taking on a duty of care. Anyway. The duty of care is a serious undertaking. It says that the province will stop anyone and everyone who has a gambling concern, whether they ask for it or not. If the problem player slips through the cracks, if a problem player doesn't get flagged as a concern, then the province has failed them. 
If that player continues to play, any harm that comes to him or her is the responsibility of the government. And with that responsibility comes potential liability. Mr. Speaker, my question to the minister responsible for Nova Scotia Gaming Corporation, what preparations are being made for this potential liability? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to assure the member that all the Atlantic provinces have been working on this initiative. This is much safer than what uh, current uh, individuals who are gambling online are um, exposed to. The limits are lower and uh, it is all housed in-house. And uh, again, this is much safer than the alternatives that are out there, which are hundreds of websites. Atlantic Lotto is government run and we are uh, providing the safest way for anyone to gamble online. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I admit I'm confused. The Premier told us that COVID-19 vaccines were being given out based on priority with healthcare workers and seniors, especially those in care homes being given priority. But just yesterday, I was contacted by an irate long-term care supportive living homeowner in Metro who looks after seniors in their home in the Metro area. She had been begging continuing care and the Department of Health and Wellness for appointment times for her staff as well as for her residents for months, many of whom who are in their 80s and 90s. She would finally send an email on March 31st to indicate that her staff and residents could receive the vaccine, only to be called a week later to say, sorry, uh, you're not getting it now. When she, they were asked to put that in writing to explain why this was being withdrawn from them, they refused to do so. This isn't just isolated to Metro, it's happened in rural areas as well. So my question for the Minister of Health, can he explain to me what happened to those vaccines that were promised? The Honourable Minister of Health. Sure, I'm happy to get that information uh, uh, from the member to look into that issue because our priorities are getting into our long-term care uh, facilities where we know the greatest risks are. Um, and that's also why we've prioritized our vaccine delivery uh, based on age, because we know that's the single greatest uh, risk factor. Uh, so very happy to uh, receive that information uh, from the member and look into that specific case um, uh, on her behalf. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour, Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I will take you up on that. The residents in these homes have been on lockdown for almost a year. Many have not seen loved ones the entire time. Staff have sacrificed almost all of their social life in order to stay home for the safety and well-being of their residents, whom they treat like family. Three weeks ago, Dr. Strang told our caucus directly that 48 of the 133 residential and long-term care facilities had received their vaccination. This was at the same time as the public rollout started. I received a letter from one of the nursing homes in the, the um, uh, province saying that their residents were not going to be considered a high enough risk for the vaccine and therefore they were being skipped over. After I raised the question to Dr. Strang and his staff, the residents of that facility got vaccinated. My question to the Minister of Health is simple. Why are frail seniors in residential care facilities who are much older and much more at risk of the complications of COVID-19 still not vaccinated? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We actually are leading uh, leaders in the country when it comes to vaccinating our long-term care uh, facilities. 70% of, close to 70% of those uh, facilities have been vaccinated and 40% uh, of those residents have actually received uh, their second dose. Uh, so the priority was, um, was, was focused on the public uh, continuing care, uh, long-term care sector, uh, but private, if the member's talking about a private uh, home sector, those are being uh, vaccinated uh, this month. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Earlier this week, Adsum for Women and Girls shared that it has spent $50,000 since December to put people up in hotels who would otherwise be sleeping rough outside in the winter. To, re to respond to an urgent situation with compassion, Adsum drew on funds intended for longer term, permanently affordable, non-market housing projects. Coverdale Court Work then also shared that it has spent 15,000 so that women exiting custody would not be released into homelessness. Does the Premier think that it's acceptable for, a chair, for charitable organizations to cover for the province in a housing crisis that is the provincial government's responsibility? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I want to thank the Honourable Member for raising this question. It is indeed a serious one. Mr. Speaker, 
when an organization indicates that they um, have spent money uh, on, on housing of this nature, we really want them to come to us and talk to us about it. To be quite honest, I had never had a conversation with anyone from those organizations about that particular issue going on this fall. It deeply concerned me, Mr. Speaker, and I want to uh, ask them if they would please reach out to the department. We would be most happy to discuss it with them. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate that response. At the same time, uh, these organizations are at tables with the province. They're at tables with Housing Nova Scotia, with, with, uh, which has moved between various departments. So I, I just can't accept that, that, is, that it is landing on the government as a complete surprise. You know, th this province has been at the Housing and Homelessness Partnership since 2014, and all the while has underspent on housing and failed to show leadership. And while we're now waiting for the Affordable Housing Commission, frontline organizations and their staff are responding at their doors when people who are experiencing homelessness knock late at night. Will the Premier or the Minister commit to reimbursing Adsum and Coverdale Court work for their costs in addressing homelessness this winter? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question, Mr. Speaker. I think it's really important that when organizations are, are facing a pressure of this kind that they reach out to us. I know that we spent more on, on hotels this year too because of COVID, Mr. Mr. Speaker, because we were uh, making sure that shelters were abiding by the the, um, the distancing requirements, and so uh, things were changing and things were in flux. I certainly understand that. I would invite them to come to the department, uh, bring their bring their bills with us, so we can see what was spent, and I am sure that we will be able to assist them. Thank you. The honourable member for Cumberland South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. The Federal Minister of Health suggested just last Sunday night that Nova Scotia has over 80, 83,000 doses sitting in the province. People are trying to book appointments both electronically and by phone, only to find out that no appointments are available, even after a CNS release on April 1st, indicating appointments would be available starting April 6th. However, if you qualify by age and you live with a family member that may be a long-haul trucker who is traveling outside the province, the system will not allow you to book the appointment. The system asks you if you've been in contact with anyone outside of the area. And of course, the answer is yes for these long-haul truckers. My question for the minister is why are people living with long-haul truckers who travel outside the province refused access to vaccinations during booking online? The Honourable Minister of Health. I'd like to thank the member very much for the question. Um, when people aren't able to get their bookings online, it's because those appointments uh, have been have been booked and those needles are getting in arms. So as we're getting supply uh, into this province, uh, those vaccines are getting into people's arms. We vaccinated 27,000 last week, uh, 40,000 this week are estimated to be vaccinated, 50,000 next week. Uh, we're currently at around 130,000 vaccinations that have been administered uh, in Nova Scotia. Uh, we're one of the only provinces that do have a central uh, intake system that is allowing us to facilitate this booking uh, process. We appreciate people's patience. Uh, we know that the demand is high for, for vaccinations, um, but we're also encouraged by the fact that the appointments are being booked uh, so quickly because that shows that Nova Scotians are eager and willing to get this, uh, this life-saving vaccination. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And just a couple points to the minister on his response. It was announced that appointments would be available on April 6th. Many of the constituents went on on April 5th and 6th and still no appointments coming available. Long haul truckers have been working diligently bringing essential goods to our province. Without them, we wouldn't have uh, have anything to eat. We wouldn't be heating our homes. We wouldn't buy, be not buying new clothing. And, and Mr. Speaker, to, in response to the minister, some of these people actually had appointments booked. And when they found out that the, the long haul trucker has actually been outside, their appointments were cancelled because they've been in contact with somebody. However, now when truckers and families need the same protection everyone else is getting, they're being refused, even if they meet that age requirement. So I guess I'll ask the minister again, when are long haul truckers and their families going to be eligible to receive the life saving vaccine when they book an appointment that is not cancelled, even though they're in that age qualification? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, listen, very happy to take uh, take this issue and discuss it with our public health and, and vaccination teams to get some clarity on it. Uh, if that information uh, is is accurate from the uh, from the member, that's certainly something that uh, I do want to dig into and, and get an answer to. 
The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, a question for the Minister of Health. Uh, we have many rotational workers living in the constituency of Inverness. At any given time, there have been different rules for rotational workers depending on where they live within the Atlantic bubble. When we have asked for clarity around the, how these decisions are being made, we have been accused of undermining Nova Scotia's confidence in public health measures. I would encourage the Minister to see these questions as an opportunity to bolster Nova Scotia's confidence in decisions that are being made. My question, most of our recent cases are travel related. What is the reason why traveling rotational workers have not been prioritized to receive a vaccine? The Honourable Minister of Health. I'd like to thank the member very much for the question. I believe our rotational workers are, um, are prioritized in phase two, uh, vaccine rollout. Uh, right now we are utilizing the quarantine measures uh, to uh, protect Nova Scotians uh, for those folks that are traveling to and uh, from the province on, on rotation uh, for work. Uh, but I, I believe we're gonna confirm that uh, those folks are prioritized for phase two of the vaccine rollout. The honorable member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, all of our Atlantic Bubble partners recognize the sacrifices made by our rotational workers by prioritizing them in their vaccination plans. I think particularly about truck drivers, uh, who I know my colleague has just mentioned as well. Uh, like Dr. Strang, the respective Chief Medical Health Officers of New Brunswick, PEI and Newfoundland have all been doing tremendous work keeping Atlantic Canadians safe over the last year. They have all recommended vaccines be prioritized now for rotational workers. Can the minister explain at, at what point, uh, in terms of a date, an estimate date of, of when phase two is going to happen and when our rotational workers are going to get the same prioritization as rotational workers in our Atlantic bubble partner provinces? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank, thank the member very much for the question. Uh, phase two uh, does begin in May. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Mr. Speaker, seniors in my constituency are struggling to get vaccinated despite their best efforts to do so. Those who are above 70 years of age do not qualify for the AstraZeneca clinic that's in Liverpool, and many are forced to travel to either Yarmouth, Halifax, or the Valley to be vaccinated. Nova Scotians all over the province have done the hard work to squash the COVID curve by staying home. But now our seniors are being forced to travel great distance to get their vaccinations. Uh, my question for the Minister of Health and Wellness is, with nearly 30% of Queen's County residents being seniors, why is a local vaccination clinic not a priority for this government? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, I'd like to thank the member very, uh, very much. Of course, uh, vaccination for our seniors is the priority. That's why we're focused on an uh, age-based prioritization. Uh, as supply ramps up in the province, we do have a distribution network that's established through primarily through uh, pharmacies uh, and uh, local doctor's office. So what the member will see is as supply ramps up in the province, more and more locations will be offering uh, uh, vaccinations. And uh, that has been happening uh, every single week. Every single week we've seen more um, uh, locations uh, opened up for vaccine delivery and we've seen more vaccines uh, getting to arms. We have uh, vaccinated uh, approximately 130,000 Nova Scotians and that number is going to increase every single week. The Honourable Member for Queens, Shelburne. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm fully aware because I follow the site looking for when Queens County will actually get a vaccination site for people that are 70 years of over, and they have been neglected. We have sites on both sides, and it, it's just simply not fair, Minister. Um, I know that seniors can travel to Bridgewater or they can travel to Shelburne from Queens County, but it's difficult for them to, number one, get a driver or to incur the cost to go. Um, sadly, we've seen some hesitancy in this demographic already of our most vulnerable people who says, I'm just giving up in complete frustration. Um, so my question to the minister is, will uh, the minister be able to offer my constituents in Queens County the commitment today that when they will be able to get vaccinated, they'll be able to do it within their own community of Queens County? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Um, we're expecting all the clinics to be operational uh, by May, and that will include a uh, uh, clinic in uh, Queens County. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. 30 to 40 percent of Nova Scotians don't have private drug coverage. This means that among the many essential prescriptions that aren't covered is birth control, IUDs, the birth control pill, hormonal implants, and others. But the province's MSI program does cover hysterectomies, vasectomies, tubal ligation, surgical abortion, and the abortion pill. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier admit that covering some forms of birth control but not others is illogical and unfair? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's uh, certainly an important point to, to bring up. I, I know our colleague brought it to, to the attention of the House, and it's something that's uh, under review at the Department of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Premier for that answer. I, we wouldn't have to be having the conversation at all if we were having a conversation about a universal pharmacare program. So recently, in budget estimates, the Minister of Health and Wellness was not able to point specifically to actions or policies that this government is taking together with its federal counterpart in support of a national universal pharmacare program. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier clarify, does he support a national universal pharmacare program, and if so, what specific actions is he taking to pursue this goal? The Honourable Premier. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I support uh, leveraging uh, any federal commitment to, to that universal program. I, I know that it's been uh, underway, the planning, uh, the striking committees uh, and such. So we uh, continue to, to have those conversations with the national government, uh, ensuring that we're ready to go. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians are desperate for a return to a sense of normalcy. And the only way we are getting this back is by receiving a vaccine. Without a vaccine, we will continue to remain in a fog of uncertainty while witnessing COVID-related negative impacts such as increases in domestic violence, stress and anxiety, alcohol and drug abuse, and sadly, loneliness and depression. The Premier can claim otherwise, but the data clearly shows that Nova Scotia is behind all other provinces when it comes to getting vaccines. So I will ask the Premier, does he have a plan to deal with the continued aftermath of these issues resulting from being the slowest province in Canada to roll out vaccines? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I couldn't be prouder of the women and men working on the front line delivering our vaccine uh, rollout plan. It's a quality program that's been worked on uh, for some time, looking at the infrastructure, having one of, one of the few provinces with a central booking system, uh, one of the provinces that does not have to cancel uh, appointments, which we've seen this week, two other provinces uh, doing when we have our second doses committed uh, to, other prov to other people. We need to make sure uh, that we make that commitment, but I'm proud of the way that it's rolling out uh, regionally fair and equitably fair. Fair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pico West. Mr. Speaker, all due respect, that is not what I asked. I asked if there's a plan for the aftermath. So the Premier can sadly continue using this moldy messaging that he's been using for weeks now. We're all proud of our frontline workers, but the questions are not getting answered. We're frustrated, we're scared, disappointed. People need to get vaccinated. The anxiety we all feel about rising case numbers elsewhere in the country as well is even worse. If you happen to be one of the many Nova Scotians living with a pre-existing condition that the Liberal government alone has chosen not to pri prioritize them, Mr. Speaker. So I don't get it. With less than 85 days until the end of June, can the Premier please explain how he will ever live up to his commitment of every Nova Scotian being vaccinated by then? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's comments from my, my friend opposite that actually is contributing to people being worried and scared. We're well on track uh, to delivering that first dose by the end of June. We're actually ahead of schedule in planning for our age descending cohorts, and those now over the age of 70 are getting out to book their vaccine, Mr. Speaker. It's not uh, what's happening in other provinces, Mr. Speaker. When you get your second dose uh, booked, uh, we make sure that we have the guaranteed supply so that you have your, your commitment there, Mr. Speaker. We see a 
uh, reports in other provinces where it's not as equitably uh, delivered across the board and income levels, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of the work uh, that our staff are doing to work alongside African Nova Scotian communities, Mi'kmaq communities, allowing the community to lead that process. Very proud to see the African Nova Scotian Clinic open this week and delivering to, to those people as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my job is to represent the people of Cumberland North. And one week ago today, this government lowered the age for vaccines to 70. And at the same time, someone, I haven't figured out who yet, but someone made a decision to take vaccine, Pfizer vaccine that was allocated for Cumberland and remove it and reallocate it to, to Halifax. My question to the, the Premier or the Minister of Health is who made the decision to take vaccine planned for Cumberland and reallocate it to Halifax? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, I certainly haven't heard uh, that, that that has happened. We'll look into that uh, situation right away for the member. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you to the Minister of Health. I would appreciate that because I am not happy and neither are the people here uh, at all. It's time that they are prioritized, same as everyone else around the province. Also, uh, I will share the AstraZeneca vaccine for Northern Zone, what has been planned for Truro and for Picto, and none of it has been planned for clinics in Cumberland. So again, I'm not happy, and the people of this area are not happy, because again, they have not been prioritized. So my question to the Minister of Health is, his, can he assure me that that will be fixed and that some of the AstraZeneca vaccine will be planned to be administered in Cumberland. The Honourable Minister of Health. I'd like to thank the member very much for the question. Uh, when we first uh, received the first doses of AstraZeneca, uh, we did receive those late. They were unexpected. Uh, they did have a tight timeline for uh, expiry as well. We reached out to Doctors Nova Scotia and the Pharmacy Association, who immediately sought uh, partners on the front lines, pharmacists and docs who could deliver these uh, vaccines. And we did ensure that those uh, that supply was available for all the um, folks who were willing to do that. So we didn't have any uh, providers for that first round. And I know in Yarmouth that were able to do it on such a short timeline. And that may have been the situation in Cumberland as well. Uh, mm -hmm. However, I have the map here, and this was provided to the, to the Conservative Caucus that shows uh, a, high, a high number of, uh, of clinics that uh, are and will continue to be open in, in Cumberland County to deliver vaccinations. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question uh, through you is to the Minister of Energy and Mines. Nova Scotia is a national leader in fighting climate change and we have some of the most ambitious greenhouse gas emission reduction goals in the country. To the great astonishment and concern of most Canadians, a national conservative party, a party to which members of the conservative faction of this house belong, recently voted against, against recognizing climate change as a real and present danger. My question to the minister is, can the minister confirm that this government recognizes the reality of the threat that climate change represents? And can he assure the House that this government recognizes the importance of climate change, to government policy and decision making? The Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member uh, Chester St. Mary for the question. I think it's quite obvious uh, how serious the government of Nova Scotia takes uh, climate change, certainly by way of our investments, our budget this year. Uh, certainly speaks volumes to that $3 million provincial uh, investment in low carbon economy fund, uh, Mr. Speaker, $8 million provincial housing uh, being invested in the green infrastructure projects, the, uh, the electric vehicle uh, program that we just announced, $9.5 million investment, uh, encouraging more Nova Scotians to uh, look toward the, uh, these options, Mr. Speaker, I think we're uh, uh, an obvious yes, to be quite honest, uh, in, uh, for this question. So uh, thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that uh, answer. Uh, my supplementary question also through you, uh, Mr. Speaker, is for the Minister of Energy and Mines. Energy poverty is a significant challenge for many individuals and organizations in Nova Scotia. My question for the Minister is, 
Can the minister provide the House with some indication that this government recognizes and is addressing energy poverty, particularly for individuals, municipalities, and non-for-profits? The Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question. The uh, program we just announced the other day, the Shared Solar uh, Program, will be a big part of that. That will be an investment, an opportunity for individuals, for communities, uh, not-for-profits, etc. Mr. Speaker, that's one example. The other, of course, uh, 10 million and more uh, invested in the low income energy efficiency programs that we've been doing and uh, over $30 million in the recoverable uh, from the federal government and budget uh, towards low carbon fund, as I said. So there's a lot of uh, uh, movement in this area. Certainly uh, we're investing heavily uh, in the energy uh, poverty uh, file, Mr. Speaker, uh, the green infrastructure programs I talked about, the reduction in green uh, the GHGs, uh, we're certainly a leader, as the member spoke to earlier in his first question, uh, in this area. So uh, thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. And I have permission from the family uh, to ask this question. Mr. Speaker, before Christmas, Nova Scotians heard of the tragic news that the scallop dragger the Chief William Solace and all her crew were lost in the Bay of Funding. Among those lost was Aaron Cogswell, a young man with autism spectrum disorder. Although the families of the other members of the crews would have received a $15,000 death benefit from Workers' Compensation Board, Aaron's family received nothing, only because he had no dependents. My question for the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education is, can the minister explain why WCB, the Workers' Compensation Board, values some lives more than others when it comes to workplace tragedies? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for bringing uh, this uh, forward uh, on the floor. Just, I want to say first and foremost that my thoughts are with the mom and with all families and communities that have been impacted by this tragedy, as well as the first responders. Uh, we are aware of this matter, and I can tell the honorable member and everyone uh, that is listening that I have instructed my staff to look into this issue. The honorable member for Kings North. <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to thank the minister for that answer, and uh, I do express my sincere sympathies to the families as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Aaron's mother, Lori Phillips, is of course devastated at the loss of her son. Her grief is compounded by the death. We seem to have lost the connection with the member for Kings North. We'll move on to the honorable member for Cole Harbor Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last spring, just as the pandemic was locking down the province, a very small ad was placed in the Chronicle Herald advertising an application for an asphalt storage plant in South Woodside, Shearwater area of my community. It's my understanding from the environmental report that due to COVID-19, the normal cons consultative process was circumvented. Given that there was no notification other, other than the Herald Arrow ad and two emails, I requested that the company or the government send a letter to all of the constituents living in the area to give them notice of the proposed project and the sufficient time to respond in writing. The minister refused to do that. Can the Minister of Environment tell me how many people participated in the consultative process and how many of them were in favour of the asphalt storage plant? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on projects, projects like this, uh, consultation is always a big part of the uh, process. Uh, I don't have uh, the results of that consultation uh, in front of me, but I can certainly look into that and uh, get back to the member. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It may always be a big part, except when it came to my community. Um, for the Minister's awareness, there were approximately 50 people, to my knowledge, that wrote in. 49 of them were against the project, and yet the department approved the application anyway. 
And in fact, I had hand delivered the notice to 1,000 constituents myself over four days to make sure that they knew what was possibly going into their community, especially as the plant was already under construction before the application process was even submitted to the community. My constituents are rightly concerned about their health, and every time they smell that asphalt coming across the street to their homes, they are concerned. And one constituent, and I'll quote him with permission, says, I feel very insulted and betrayed by this province and their wishes to keep polluting our neighbourhood instead of creating parks and cyclovia. My question to the minister, can he admit that his government circumvented the normal consultative process of my constituents and will he agree with me now to meet with their constituents to talk about the issues that they're still concerned about? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, all of uh, these projects uh, go through a rigorous review that includes consultation. That's one element of, uh, of the process. Uh, but our uh, uh, folks at Environment uh, look at all the science, the uh, proposed uh, plan for the project, and match that up and look at it with respect to uh, our regulations. So if the project uh, meets uh, the regulations and that we can be assured that public safety uh, and safety of the environment can be uh, upheld by a project, uh, then that is all taken into consideration uh, before de decisions are made. Thank you very much. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Pictou West. Mr. Speaker, it is not a debate or up for question that a cancer patient is at increased risk of severe cases of infection leading to hospitalization or death compared to the general population. This includes COVID-19, yet we prioritize strictly by age. This means that a 16-year-old will watch their 40-year-old healthy parents get a vaccination before them or their 25-year-old sibling. This is not right, Mr. Speaker. We should not be leaving our most vulnerable children to be literally the last people to get a vaccination. There is no plan for people with underlying conditions, and this is unacceptable. So my question for the Minister of Health is, why are we leaving 16-year-olds with cancer to be literally the last people to get vaccinated? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank, I'd like to thank the member very much for the question. Uh, listen, we appreciate the concern out there from those with underlying health conditions. Uh, our, our goal is to get to herd immunity in the quickest manner possible. Going by an age-based approach, which allows us to focus on the single greatest risk factor, age, um, but that also allows us to move as quickly as we can uh, through the vaccination uh, process. Nova Scotia still does remain one of the safest places to be in North America, uh, if not the world. And I know that the member, uh, for whatever her criticisms are, can't name a jurisdiction that she would rather live in than here right now. Um, we've been very focused on protecting uh, those vulnerable citizens in our province and getting to herd immunity is the best way for us to protect every single Nova Scotian, including those with underlying health conditions. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. We haven't been protecting our most vulnerable. If we were, we wouldn't be hearing from them as, a, as MLAs. Of course I love Nova Scotia, of course I'm happy to be here, but the numbers that are low has nothing to do with people being vaccinated. We have a, had a full year to plan for this moment. No government business was being conducted, no debates were being held, no transparency was given to Nova Scotians regarding the plan. And all along, we were led to believe that the government's focus is on COVID, that we are fully prepared to roll out these vaccinations. Many in this province disagree, and we are not prepared. My question for the Minister of Health is, does the minister stand by the plan to vaccinate healthy 20 to 45 year olds before 16 year olds battling cancer? Is this the plan for these children to simply wait in line? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member knows that some of the information she just, uh, some of the comments she made is not true. Uh, Dr. Strang and the Premier gave a technical briefing on our vaccine rollout plan that was available to media, the public. Uh, they actually provided the same briefing to every single uh, caucus. So the member's been given that information and to say that there's been no transparency on this um, is not accurate at all. Uh, we've been very focused on people's health here in Nova Scotia. We've prioritized firm 
uh, public health policy to protect everybody, uh, particularly those with, uh, with underlying health conditions. Uh, that is why we remain uh, one of the safest places to be uh, right now. Um, and we're going to keep that status if people keep following the, the health directives and if we get to herd immunity in the quickest manner possible. And that is through an age-based approach. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we can appreciate, our essential workers have a vital role to play in our province and uh, their work does not stop, not even during a worldwide pandemic. One of my constituents is a pilot. And although he has been exempt from many of the restrictions regarding travel in and out of the province, he has been denied access to medical services such as his yearly EKG and medical that are required order, by his please. company in order for him. The time allotted for oral questions put by members has expired. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just on a, on a point of order, it's, it's really important that we, we are truthful in this House. The facts do matter, especially around uh, the vaccination rollout. Um, Nova Scotians know, everyone knows, every, anyone who can go on a website knows that Nova Scotia is last in the per capita vaccination. Um, the, the Minister of Health uh, is uh, kind of juicing up the numbers as he tries to, um, as he tries to improve the stature from, from last to something else. And the Minister intentionally uh, misled this House in a response to the member from Queen's Shelburne. The Minister said that 130,000 Nova Scotians have been vaccinated. The Minister knows full well that that is untrue. There is somewhere in the range of 130,000 doses that have been administered, but those are about 90,000 uh, with the first dose, and some of those have received their second. The Minister knows that there's nowhere in the range of 130,000 Nova Scotians that have been vaccinated. I'd like the minister to withdraw those, withdraw or clarify his comments uh, that that is uh, that that is the number of doses, not the number of people. It's really important to Nova Scotians. The honourable premier. I know the member opposite is not arguing against those health care workers and long-term care uh, residents that receive the second dose, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, the minister spoke about how many doses have gone out, which is 130,000. 130,000 doses have gone to Nova Scotians, 100,000 of which was the first dose. We continue to ramp up our supply, and he wants to continue Order, to talk please. about... The Honourable Premier has the floor. The Honourable Premier. It's obvious this isn't a point of order, it's a disagreement of facts, but we continue uh, to talk about the positive things that are happening in this province as we manage the pandemic. We made commitments for second doses. We actually do lead the country in terms of how many healthcare workers are, have received their first dose. Over 90% of healthcare workers in this province received their first dose. More, more healthcare workers in this province received their second doses than other provinces. We're going to continue uh, to commend those people that are working on the front line during this pandemic while the member opposite continues to tear them down. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Speaker. And th this, type of, uh, this type of kind of rhetoric from the Premier is really hurtful to you know, it, it's going to lead to vaccine fearness is what's going to lead to. Uh, the reality is, is that um, I asked for a simple clarification from the minister. <clears throat> the premier can rule on the point of order, but I'll leave that to you, Mr. Speaker. In fact, the premier in his comments confirmed exactly what I'm saying. My point is the minister misled the House by saying 130,000 people have received vaccinations. The Premier confirmed that that's not true. He confirmed it's in the range of 100,000 people, some of which have got. So I'd like the Minister of Health to confirm that he's using the number of, the, the number of doses to mislead the House and pretend that that's Nova Scotians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. I'd like to uh, just bring this matter to a close right at the moment. Uh, it, it is not a point of order. It's a disagreement of facts. If the member is alleging that another member of the House has intentionally misled the House, that's a point of privilege, and that can be dealt with uh, under that topic. So uh, the House will now recess for its mandated 15-minute COVID reset.
Order, please. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that you do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a committee of the whole House on supply. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly, it brings me a great pleasure to speak to, to you on behalf of the people of Cumberland North with regards to the provincial budget for 2021 and 2022. As I reviewed the budget over the last week, I asked the questions, will this budget address the problems facing the people that I represent in Cumberland North? And will this budget empower, even more importantly, will it empower the people of Cumberland North and grow our area of the province to lead, to lead our province into greater prosperity? Is this a budget that addresses a pandemic and a post-pandemic Cumberland North and Nova Scotia? Is this a budget that will help Nova Scotians to recover from the pandemic? Is this a budget that will address the weaknesses that have been exposed by this pandemic? Weak points such as supply chains, lack of sick days, lack of private health care coverage, lack of maritime cooperation, lack of mental health supports for people that are suffering, lack of supports for our health care workers that we may be seeing uh, suffer with PTSD and burnout in months to come. The provincial budget itself was really quite unremarkable. Uh, there was a significant budget deficit, which we all predicted there would be as a result of the pandemic. Revenues, for the most part, have remained unchanged from pre-pandemic times. Revenues from personal income tax, corporate income tax, harmonized sale tax are actually fairly similar to pre-pandemic pre pre times here in Nova Scotia, which makes me assume that government uh, is making likely an inaccurate assumption that personal and corporate incomes will be unchanged from the pandemic. I do believe the budget has potential, and that is because of the people, people that work in our government departments who I've gotten to know, who I think are amazing. I know that they can make magic if given the opportunity. And most importantly, this budget has potential because of the people of Nova Scotia, for it's the people that make any budget come alive to create the positive change that we need. But leadership is needed, and we will need to bring that leadership from each one of our constituencies, constituencies and our communities. So I asked the Minister of Finance, who tabled this budget, if he will allow the freedom and ingenuity within our public sector, within public service, when executing the funds of this budget. I believe we have significant, significant potential that is waiting to be unleashed here in Cumberland North and throughout all of Nova Scotia. Pre-pandemic, over the last decade, Cumberland North, Northern Nova Scotia, and in large part, all of rural Nova Scotia has seen a decline in both population and prosperity. But it has not killed the spirit of our people. And over the last eight years, there has definitely been a shift to centralization of power and decision-making often alienating and disempowering much of rural Nova Scotia. But it hasn't taken out our fight, and in fact, may have just fueled it. And I think it, we saw that recently with the original version of the Biodiversity Act, and it showed the collective power of the people across this province. Our political culture, unfortunately, has lacked collaboration. It's lacked a positive spirit. And it seems that along, not just here in Nova Scotia, throughout much of Canada and even our neighbors in the States, um, there's a, been a real erosion of trust amongst, uh, from between the people and political leadership. But I have seen it has not taken away people's desire for hope and for a better future. What I'm hearing from the people I represent, Mr. Speaker, is that people don't really want to just hear what other people are doing wrong. They want to hear new ideas. They want to see people working together collaboratively for the greater good, 
working together across party lines, party lines, debating, yes, but debating policy and issues, not one another. So Mr. Speaker, I believe we need to move forward. We need to get through this pandemic. We need to keep our COVID numbers low. We need to work to rebuild and transform our province. And we want to lead from right here in Cumberland North because after all, Nova Scotia does start here. Nova Scotia starts in Cumberland North. And the people of Cumberland North want to lead. They want to lead this province. The fact is we have been healthy, we've been strong. We've had almost no COVID in the last year here in Cumberland North. And we can use our strengths and our assets to lead this province through recovery from the pandemic. We are the heart of the Atlantic Gateway and Trade Corridor, connecting the Maritimes with the rest of the nation. Here in Cumberland North, we have land to grow food, trees. We have the Northumberland Strait to our, to our east to fish, to use for tourism, and to use for our own enjoyment and pleasure and to attract others to our area. We have significant strong mining, manufacturing, as well as experts in fishing, forestry, and agriculture. This pandemic has taught us all many things, such as the importance of self-reliance, such as the importance of family and relationships. And here in Cumberland North, You've all heard me talk about the many challenges that the people I represent have faced. And we know that we are not through the challenges yet. I would like to see some dedicated financial investment from this provincial budget, specifically targeted to our border community. Our businesses have suffered due to the break in the functional economic zone with Southern New Brunswick. Businesses are losing between 20 to 80% of their revenues and customer base, closed now for over one year. This is an exit that only the year before had had 550,000 vehicles leave the Trans-Canada Highway and take exit one to zero. And although some areas of the province have seen some financial supports in the form of small business, impact grants for restaurants in HRM and Hans County, Cumberland and our border community have not seen any support. I am hopeful that a recent request to the Department of Inclusive Economic Growth that came from our Cumberland Business Connector will be granted, which will bring welcome economic investment to our border businesses. Mr. Speaker, the pandemic has taught us that relationships matter. And during times of stress, you will either see relationships grow stronger or you will see the cracks. And those cracks can create deep fissures and even more division. And Mr. Speaker, we have had a long history of maritime collaboration and Atlantic collaboration. But unfortunately, this pandemic, we have seen each maritime province working in isolation, not with each other. And this has negatively impacted our border community and continues to do so each and every day. We have also suffered due to the lack of support from our federal leaders. They literally have been uh, AWOL. In the past, we've relied on federal legislation to ensure mobility between our provinces through our charter. In the past, we've relied on federal legislation to ensure that we could receive healthcare services in our neighboring provinces through the Canada Health Act. But there's been no, there's been no federal legislation upheld. So what has this pandemic taught us here? It's taught us that unless there is a renewed commitment of collaboration and a spirit of cooperation, which is what I would want and prefer, then there is, this is a time to build self-reliance. It's a time to focus on building a safe, sustainable food supply. It's a time to focus on rebuilding our own businesses. Our provincial budget should reflect these realities that we are living in currently and what we've experienced over the last year. We need to learn from it. This is the time where we need a provincial budget that addresses our weak points and start building an infrastructure to make sure we can take care of ourselves so that we are in a position of power to negotiate to benefit our people. 
Cumberland North needs a provincial lens on healthcare needs of our people. The fact is the pandemic has exposed our weak points and we need a budget to reflect this and work towards strength. So will this budget allow transformation post pandemic? Will this budget give deputies and department managers the leeway to address the specific needs post pandemic? I do have to say I've had incredible experiences with some of the people working in provincial departments. Over the last four years, I've received help in many areas for the people of Cumberland North. And I just wanna mention a few of them. Related to a nurses, nursing crisis that led, down, led to a shutdown of our acute care beds in a, both our ICU step down unit as well as maternal child. I received help related to making sure that our emergency room at our regional hospital is renovated. Received help bringing a much needed dialysis unit to Amherst, ensuring that a new hospital is being built in Pugwash. On the day of the opening of the Atlantic bubble, I had help from one of our deputy ministers. We received the new wooden bridge in the, across the Napan River, now called the Roger Bacon Bridge that my colleague from Cumberland South also worked tirelessly to ensure. Received a lot of incredible support for the Wallace Museum. Currently receiving some provincial support for In the Works, a social enterprise, which is a recovery center for those recovering from addictions and mental illness that some moms here, moms with a purpose, are building through provincial and federal support. All of these things are made possible because people in the, our government departments are willing to work with me and people in our area for the greater good and not just focused on partisan politics. But there are issues that we will need more provincial support for post-pandemic, issues that we will need to make sure there's room for in this provincial budget. Issues like recruitment of more nurses. It's, we're actually desperate for more nurses, both in BON, community care, long-term care, as well as in our acute care uh, facility. Recruitment of family physicians, recruitment of psychiatrists. And I'll mention that we need to change the remuneration of psychiatrists so that psychiatrists that work in HRM are not being paid disproportionately more than psychiatrists that are paid outside of HRM. We need equity between rural and urban. We need support for designated palliative care beds. There are no designated palliative care beds at our regional hospital. And our community has been asking for operational funding for a hospice for years. We need funding for a cancer center where our people can receive chemotherapy at our regional hospital so that they don't have to drive to Moncton or Halifax. We need provincial support for accessibility supports for safe walking access to our hospital that this province built outside of town limits on the other side of the Trans-Canada Highway. We need provincial supports for repairs of provincial structures that like the Tidnish pedestrian walking bridge that connects the Shignecto ship railway. We need provincial supports to build a NSCC campus downtown like the province is doing currently in Sydney. We need expansion of our industrial park to build capacity for economic growth. And we need investment for a production of safe, healthy food supply here in Nova Scotia, which can start right here in Cumberland North. And I will say this again, we need the Cobbequid Pass tolls removed. We feel separated from the rest of the province. I hear that again and again. We feel separated for many reasons, and one of them is the Cobbequid Pass tolls. The fact is, the road has been paid for 10 times over. If those in charge like the tolls, then take them to your area. We've had enough of them in Cumberland. We don't want them anymore. We've paid our dues and then some. The fact is that it creates a division of Cumberland from the rest of Nova Scotia. And pre-pandemic, we at least felt connected with New Brunswick. But now we're disconnected from both sides, north and south. And our own government, we are residents and citizens of Nova Scotia, our own government does have the power at least to change what's happening to our South. So we ask for the Cobbwood tolls pass for the tolls to be removed again. Mr. Speaker, one of the best outcomes of the pandemic 
is being reminded of the importance of family. Okay, I'll wrap it up. I'll finish off here. I just ask our government to lead, um, start in our border community, working together as a maritime Atlantic region. And that alone will take any provincial budget and make it work exponentially, not only for Cumberland North, but for all of Nova Scotia and the entire maritime region. It's time for Eastern Canada to show our strength. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's uh, not only an honour, but a privilege to be speaking and to supply uh, this afternoon. Um, before I, I provide a few comments in, in the time allotted this afternoon, I do want to begin by recognizing the work of all the staff of the legislature who have ensured a, a relatively smooth functioning of this hybrid legislative session. And in fact, it has been overwhelmingly uh, been demonstrated that just like in many other jurisdictions across our country, that we could have been conducting our legislative business many months ago and avoided the government imposed democratic shutdown. You know, Mr. Speaker, I also want to uh, highlight and recognize the work of our caucus staff, the PC caucus staff, for their immense support and, and assistance over the uh, past uh, year. Uh, it's been certainly very much appreciated in helping us as MLAs uh, fulfill our jobs. And I would be remiss if I, if I didn't mention my constituency assistant, uh, Jeanette Dondremont, who uh, joined my, my office uh, staff uh, just a few short months before the pandemic, and it happened to be when we were in uh, going into the legislature. So it was a, a relatively quick um, transition uh, for her, and she's been doing an amazing job serving the constituents of Argyle Barrington and supporting me in, in my role as, as MLA. So to her, thank you. Mr. Speaker, I, I've spoken about it before, but what makes our province and, and all our communities um, a great place to live, it's the people. Um, it's the people that make it, uh, that make Nova Scotia what it is. Um, and in fact, right now, the, the envy for many across the country and around the world, but again, it's Nova Scotians themselves. Uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, it's the collective efforts of, of Nova Scotians from here in my constituency to, to uh, the most northern parts of our province uh, that have you know, truly gone above and beyond uh, in a year that's been very difficult and have sacrificed so much, um, have been faced with so much heartache, struggles and challenges. And, and I recognize it certainly hasn't been easy, but I do want to, uh, to recognize that and uh, a heartfelt thank you to our, our essential workers. Mr. Speaker, it's honestly a privilege to be a member of this House, uh, and I take great pride in representing my constituency. And I've learned that the job of an MLA is quite open-ended, and you, you never know what's going to come through uh, through the door and what phone call, what a phone call might bring or what question you might be asked when you're doing groceries. But uh, it, it's truly a, a, a humbling opportunity to, to represent our communities. And whether we're, we have job or our roles in our constituencies, we also have roles here in this legislature. Um, and as I've noted earlier on, it's great that government decided that it's time to do its legislative business. And as, uh, as an opposition, it allows us to, in this chamber, continue to do our job. Mr. Speaker, government's job uh, is, you know, includes to put forward good legislation, propose a budget, uh, government uh, govern appropriately, and it's our job as opposition uh, to to ensure that government's being held to account, uh, to maintain some sort of transparency, which is uh, difficult at times, and it's too bad that we weren't here for um, pretty much a year to do that. And Mr. Speaker, uh, that's the least that's, ex that's expected from Nova Scotians when almost $12 billion of their taxpayer dollars are being spent on the governance of this province. Government has its job, so do opposition parties. We point out the obvious, and sometimes we point out the not so obvious, Mr. Speaker. We debate legislation, we review, we uh, and dissect plans, budgets, policies. We, uh, you know, we ask questions. Sometimes they're tough. We offer input, insight on issues that impact Nova Scotians in every corner of our province. 
Mr. Speaker, I couldn't be proud or be part uh, of, a, of a caucus team that works tirelessly for Nova Scotians uh, in our various capacities. Um, and despite what's been said before, we haven't been hiding behind Iraq. In fact, we've been leading, um, leading from opposition, Mr. Speaker, uh, demonstrated through passion, drive and tenacity um, to not only offer criticism, but also comprehensive and well thought out plans. Mr. Speaker, hope for health, dignity for, dignity for seniors, universal mental health. These are more than just titles, Mr. Speaker, more than just catchphrases, as alluded to members from the opposite party. In fact, you don't need a title to, in fact, actually understand the contents. You can read, a, you can read the title of the book or a cover of a book. doesn't mean you're going to understand the book, Mr. Speaker. So it's more than just ideas. These plans are actually thought out and costed out. And again, you know, if, if it's if the biggest thing about our plans that we've put forward over the last number of months, Mr. Speaker, if the biggest thing that's being criticized is the title, I think we're doing pretty good. Frankly, Mr. Speaker, I do not know what the government was expecting when we returned after their 364 day hiatus. However, over the past couple of days, there have been uh, comments and statements from members of the government who were, quite frankly, very critical of the role of opposition MLAs. And maybe they don't realize what the role of an opposition MLA is. But government was quite defensive, and I'd add, you know, confrontational in some regard, offering some sort of long-winded, aspirational, lamentating lectures and criticism, only adding insult to the injury Mr. Speaker, adding injury to the problems that our Nova Scotians face day in, day out. Seems that there's a little bit of opposition coming from the government side. Mr. Speaker, the fact is, whether the Liberal MLAs like it or not, we are simply fulfilling our legislative duties. And I hope that our, I hope that it was not hope that we'd return to the legislature and say, hey, it's been a while, long time no see, hope you're keeping well, and everything would be hunky-dory and that maybe very few questions would be asked, maybe, maybe very few tough questions would be asked, no accountability, and maybe it would be some sort of a love-in, but you know, that's a very hopeful ask, Mr. Speaker. This, that is not democracy. That does not stand for our democratic processes. There's other countries that exist out there that that's what they that's what they do, Mr. Speaker. You know, there's obviously going to be differences in policy and legislation and and in opinions. Um, but you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, despite how challenging the times are, uh, you know, we should recognize that democracy we're very fortunate to have, and that it's because of the sacrifices of many before our time that that has been made that we have democracy here in Nova Scotia and in our beautiful country, and that we should do what we can to bolster our democratic process. Mr. Speaker, onto the budget with the few moments that I uh, have remaining. Last year, before COVID-19 arrived on our doorsteps, we were talking about good debt, and it sounds like the government's good debt is on the rise. And it's sad to know that we've had budgets over the last, uh, let's say, eight years, seven, eight years, that have been balanced on the backs of Nova Scotians, with a failure to address by this government the acute and chronic issues of the system that Nova Scotians have felt and continue to feel the burden. What's included in this budget, Mr. Speaker? Well, it's, it's a mile long and an inch deep, like, uh, like our leader, the member for Pictoisa said. And if it was a swimming pool, Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't be jumping off the deep end. Mr. Speaker, you could uh, you know, certainly get your feet wet, but you couldn't go swimming in this budget. There's something for everybody, not enough for anybody. And there's lots of you know, sound bites and maybe the sound bites help politicians at a podium. But how much do these sound bites actually help Nova Scotians? Mr. Speaker, there's very much uh, lacking in this budget, lacking in plan. I think if you look at the construction plans for a house of cards, you'll find more detail. I do recognize, Mr. Speaker, that these issues did not happen overnight, nor will they be fixed overnight. But at the hand of the current government, these issues have worsened and progressed in, in certain ways. What we see here, Mr. Speaker, is a government with its eyes on an election, rather than its eyes on Nova Scotians. There are various elements of, of broken culture, Mr. Speaker, between Nova Scotians and the current Liberal government. Broken trust with government, 
I would like to see a little bit more emphasis on, on, on highway plans and on how the Department of Transportation is going to be uh, you know, addressing coastal roads that are impacted by flooding and, and erosion due to rising waters and, and more susceptible flooding. You know, it's been said that safety is number one priority for this department. You know, when it comes to cancer care, dialysis seats access, uh, you know, grants for home renovations, emergency health services, doctor numbers that are growing, um, our, our human health resources, uh, emergency room closures, long-term care. I could go on, Mr. Speaker. And speaking of long-term care, government must realize that their pre-election sprinkling of funds is only but a start and will require ongoing investment. Let's break down long-term care, Mr. Speaker. 230 so uh, beds for long-term care when there's 1,000 to 1,500 people in Nova Scotia who are waiting, waiting for a long-term care bed, Mr. Speaker. At that rate, I think uh, we'll still be building beds when it's my time to end up in long-term care, Mr. Speaker. Why now? That's what Nova Scotians have to ask themselves. Why now is this government presenting this type of budget? Well, eight years into this government, is it better late than never? Is that the reason that we should accept? Do we accept that it's a different government with a new leader, really? Is it the beginning of a new era? I think not. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians should ask themselves whether the problems that they are experiencing today that they have been experiencing for years now, have they gotten any better? Do they believe that they will be getting better anytime soon? Maybe, we'll see. But how much more can Nova Scotians physically, mentally, socially, um, financially continue to wait and see? Look at just at the unheard response from this government on various files, including the EHS file. This government has had years to deliver to Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, and it is very unfortunate that with a looming election kickoff, that's, that they finally realize that there are some issues that need some attention, and for them that it's time again to make promises. We got to wonder if they'll be kept, in fact, Mr. Speaker. Look at where a 2013 promise, a doctor for every Nova Scotian has got us. There's more than 60,000 Nova Scotians that very well remember that promise, and it certainly hasn't been forgotten. Eight years later, Mr. Speaker, and what we are experiencing today is due to this Liberal government's failure to anticipate, its failure to plan, its failure to react when appropriate. And how much more, Mr. Speaker, can Nova Scotians afford of this? A provincial budget, Mr. Speaker, is more than nickels and dimes when I guess we're speaking millions or rather billions. It's probably $100 bills. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, it comes down to one thing and one thing only. It's the people, the people of Nova Scotia, the 55 constituencies that myself and my colleagues of all political stripes are elected to serve. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm very proud of, of my constituency, the communities of Argyle, Barrington, and the significant potential that exists in our communities, uh, and, and the people, the residents of Argyle, Barrington, that demonstrate through their, their love for each other and their amazing hospitality, their empathy, their compassion for their friends, family, and neighbours, their engagement to support one another and organizations in times of need. For me, Mr. Speaker, being a member of this House is about not only making Argyle Barrington a better place to live and in, in southwestern Nova Scotia as well, but also making Nova Scotia a, a better place to live, work and, and play and thrive in all aspects. I've said that many times before. And it, this job, the job of an MLA, is one that I take very seriously and, and I recognize that it is a significant privilege and honour to serve my constituents. Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, I take great pride in being a member of the Progressive Conserv Conservative Caucus, uh, members of a dedicated caucus team with various backgrounds that bring a wealth of knowledge around our caucus table, that share their experiences and, and their enthusiasm um, to, to put forward better ideas uh, to make Nova Scotia a better place to live. And we will continue to lead, for, to, uh, lead from opposition. We will continue to strive um, to become government. 
and, and focus uh, our efforts uh, to be a government that's fiscally, fiscally responsible, socially progressive, that listens to its people, that embraces technology, that learns from its past, that preserves the best and unique heritage and our diverse cultures, that listens to its people. I could go on, Mr. Speaker. These are all progressive conservative values and that I will continue to do what's right and stand up with my MLA colleagues from the PC caucus, stand up for Nova Scotians and stand up for our beautiful province, a province that I am very much proud to call home. And with those few words, Mr. Speaker, I thank you very much. Motion carried. The House will now recess for 15 minutes while it resolves itself into the Committee of the Whole on Supply.
Okay. The Committee of the Whole House on Supply will come to order. I recognize the Honourable Government Host Leader. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, uh, would you please call the estimates for the Minister of Health and Wellness, Resolution Number E-10. Resolved that a sum not exceeding $5,332,752 be granted to the Lieutenant Governor to defray expenses in respect of the Department of Health and Wellness pursuant to the estimate. I recognize the Honourable Member from Dartmouth North. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, and good day to uh, the Minister. Um, I, uh, when we last uh, spoke, I had asked a question and then uh, gave the rest of my time up to another member, so I'm back at that question. So to remind the Minister of my question, I'm wondering, uh, it was about the Back to Balance plan and I'm in, uh, referring to the $96 million less that will be in health funding next year. Um, uh, uh, so I'm wondering, the first thing is, can the Minister please commit to providing a list of where the reductions in the health budget will come from? The Honourable Minister of Health. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health. I'd like to uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank the member for the question. So uh, I can confirm that there will be no uh, reduction. There's no planned reduction currently for uh, uh, mental health and, and health uh, services or, or programming. Uh, where we do anticipate some savings to occur, uh, currently there's uh, well over $200 million that we invest in COVID-related initiatives, um, including PPE, uh, vaccines would be included in that uh, that figure as well. Uh, so obviously, as we we get to uh, herd immunity and start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel here for COVID, uh, we expect those costs uh, associated with COVID measures uh, to be reduced. So that is where uh, the member will see uh, savings. It's not from the the core uh, programming. Uh, budget from the healthcare department specifically related to COVID measure spending. 
The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, so I get that, and that makes sense to me, except that experts are signaling that COVID-19 is not going away anytime soon. Uh, we may need booster vaccines for, for years to come. Uh, presumably, PPE needs to be maintained into the future. I think, you know, one thing, there, there's been many lessons learned, as everyone keeps saying, uh, you know, with this pandemic, and one of those things is, is the, um, you know, the, the massive need for um, attention to uh, disease control and um, infection infection control and so uh, you know more investment in PPE is probably a, a really good uh, idea so um, can the minister explain how or where he sees we will spend less health care dollars related to COVID-19 I mean he you, you the minister has said uh, vaccines PPE but those things may need to continue so I guess my question is are there other things that the minister could be more um, specific about um, and if, if really what he's saying is vaccines and PPE, then if there is a need for them next year, where will the reductions come from? Or will, the, you know, will those reductions be pushed to farther, further years? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much. So again, th these are estimates and there still uh, will be millions of dollars that are allocated in the budget for COVID-19 uh, measures where we are expecting there to be some um, lowering of, of operational pressure related to COVID-19 specifically uh, around the, uh, the testing centers. We are expecting to require that um, uh, less. And again, if, if, if the epidemiology changes or the, the situation with the virus changes will, of course, uh, adapt our forecasting to that. Um, other areas are, would be the uh, ICU beds that we're holding for potential COVID-19 uh, patients, as well as the, um, the regional, the, uh, the RCUs that are in place for, uh, to remove uh, active uh, COVID-19 positive cases from from our uh, long-term care facilities. So there are some operational pressures that we are anticipating will reduce uh, as we, we get to herd immunity and, and hopefully uh, what will be the, the end of the pandemic. But that's, you know, there's $275 million that we're expensing right now for, for COVID-19 measures. And so the reduction, if it's accurate, I don't even know if that, if that calculation's accurate that the member uh, uh, presented, but there's that that's that's not even half of of the money that we have uh, allocated here but we are expecting some operational uh reduction of, of of pressure the honorable member from dartworth north thank you madam chair and I, I i think the minister can probably count on my excellent math skills to know that that number is pretty accurate i mean he saw what i did with some algebra uh, a few days ago, so I think we can just we can we can count on that 96 million. Um, but I'm also wondering if the minister can explain whether or not there will be any reduction in cost to implement IPAC measures in long-term care with with that with with that reduction in in budget numbers. The Honourable Minister of Health.
So the, the, I mean, the majority of the IPAC measures will still be in place, particularly the human resource capacity that we've infused into the system, that won't change. Where you might not see reoccurring costs would be on the one-time capital expenditures um, to uh, uh, create dividers and spaces in our, in our facilities. So uh, there, there are some costs associated with, with IPAC recommendations that would be one-time costs, so you wouldn't see those reoccurring. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And before I move on from this, I just want to ask the Minister once again, if, if possible, um, could the Minister provide uh, the House with a, a list of those, of, the, of those reductions, potential reductions that he has uh, mentioned just now, not just now, but the, in the answer before, um, with perhaps some numbers attached to them. So um, the other, the last thing I would like to ask in this line of questions is, uh, can the minister confirm that there will not be any layoffs uh, in next year's um, health and wellness uh, staffing budgets? And, you know, Nova Scotia Health Authority, et cetera, staffing budgets. The Honourable Minister of Health. We, we can confirm that there will be no reduction in, in permanent staffing. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. The other night uh, in estimates, uh, the Minister um, listed for the member from Argyle Barrington four recommendations uh, that are not being implemented from the Fitch Report on EHS services. The Minister did not list increasing ambulance fees as one of the recommendations they will not be implementing. So can the Minister confirm whether or not the Minister will be charging, just pardon me, changing the ambulance fee structure? The Honourable Minister of Health. There is no plan at this time to change the ambulance fee uh, structure or amount. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, also, uh, one more question on this. What is the total amount collected in ambulance fees each year? The Honourable Minister of Health. The, um, the, the total uh, annually for 21, uh, 22, or sorry, for 2021 20, um, would be just over 13 uh, and a half uh, million. And that would include uh, use of ambulances for uh, non uh, residents um, and non, non Nova Scotians and uh, as well. 
The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank the Minister for that answer. I understand that the priority in VAX, sorry, just, just so you know, uh, the Minister knows I'm going to just, I'm asking some short snappers here with all, all kinds of different subjects. So um, I understand that the priority in vaccine rollout in long-term care was given to licensed, that is publicly funded, uh, sorry, licensed and publicly funded long-term care facilities. I'm wondering what is the timeline for completing vaccinations in privately run long-term care facilities? and um, what was the public health rationale for doing uh, those sites later than the licensed facilities? The Honourable Minister of Health. I'd like to thank the member for the question. So to answer the first part of her question in terms of timing, the uh, unlicensed uh, assisted living uh, homes would uh, are scheduled to have their first dose uh, by the end of April and their second dose by the end of May. The rationale for prioritizing the, the licensed uh, facilities uh, would be because that's where the, the more vulnerable uh, uh, people live. So in the you know, private unlicensed uh, facilities, those are assisted living facilities. So the residents there tend to be uh, more, more mobile and require less um, uh, support. Uh, the folks that are in the licensed facilities um, uh, are, 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 are not as healthy, uh, generally speaking, as, as those in the assisted uh, living facilities. So the priority was to, uh, to focus on the most vulnerable uh, people first. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we were glad to see the government extend provision of virtual billing codes uh, to primary care providers through, you know, during uh, the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, virtual appointments can make a great difference to people. What information or evaluation specifically is this government looking for in order to be able to make this service available permanently to Nova Scotians? The Honourable Minister of Health.
I'd like to thank the member for the question. So uh, virtual care is here to stay. Uh, it did exist before COVID-19. In fact, uh, there have been, it has been around since uh, I believe the early 90s, but of course during the last year it was expanded uh, pretty significantly. And, um, uh, and, and we believe that uh, well, there's no going back uh, from that, um, but we are gonna take a year to evaluate um, several metrics um, related to this. One would be access. Uh, is it enhancing access uh, to Nova Scotians? Um, it's safety. Are there any safety concerns related to virtual care? Um, uh, it's comprehensiveness. It's integration with uh, the rest of our system and how smooth that's operating. Uh, we want to evaluate which specialties will benefit the most from this uh, tool. And of course, we want to evaluate the, uh, the patient and provider uh, experience uh, as well as the cost associated with, uh, with, with virtual care expansion. So that would be a high level list of categories uh, under which we'll be evaluating uh, the service. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, that um, uh, makes sense to me. Um, from what we understand, the virtual billing codes are not available for use by physicians who are working in walk-in clinics uh, or for unattached patients. Um, first of all, is that correct? And secondly, if it is correct, what is the rationale behind that policy? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, that would not be correct. So we, we are treating all physicians the same uh, with, the, uh, with, with this, th these billing codes. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. So I can call a walk-in clinic in Nova Scotia and get a virtual appointment as a walk-in, like with a, as an unattached patient. The Honourable Minister of Health. That, that would be subject to the judgment of the, uh, the physician or the, the health care provider. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Uh, okay, so um, did, that, did that change recently, I guess, is my question? Because our, our understanding was that, the, that uh, f doctors who worked in um, walk-in clinics were not able to bill for virtual appointments. So just want to get clarification on when that changed. Um, yeah, great, and I have another question. Thanks. The Honourable Minister of Health. Um, so this has, this, this option has been available to physicians working in uh, walk-in clinics since April, 2020. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Okay. Um, great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Speaking of walk-in clinics, Madam Chair, I'm wondering, uh, the other night, uh, the minister, um, I think it was when um, he was talking with the uh, member from Argyle Barrington as well, uh, mentioned that in Nova Scotia, none of the walk-in clinics are um, publicly run. They're, they're all private, private clinics. But my understanding is that there is a clinic now opened or about to open in Kearney Lake, which is specifically uh, for people who are on the 811 registry but are not yet attached to a family doctor. So I'm wondering if the minister can confirm that that is the case. That's my first question about that. The Honourable Minister of Health.
So there's a, a just to clarify. So walk-in clinics are uh, physician run. So they're they're not run by the NSHA. Uh, we're not familiar with any uh, walk-in clinics that are run by the NSHA. Uh, however, the NSHA uh, can provide funding to support the docs uh, with those walk-in clinics, and they can support funding for the electronic um, medical records, for nursing, for supplies to uh, help subsidize rent. These would be some examples of the supports that the NSHA does provide to these uh, physician-run uh, clinics. Um, however, there's also primary care clinics, uh, which Kearney Lake would, would fit under, um, which are designed to support uh, those individuals that are on the 811 uh, registry uh, who are unattached from a family physician. And so there are a number of these across the province. I know we have one in, in the Yarmouth Regional uh, Kentville, Bridgewater. I, I listed a, a list of uh, Sydney. I listed some of the locations uh, last night. Uh, Kearney Lake would be one of these as well. So these are not uh, these are not walk-in clinics. They would be they would be clinics that are available to unattached patients on the registry uh, through uh, through appointment. So this one in Kearney Lake would be a, a health authority primary care clinic, um, but. Uh, but not a walk-in clinic based on the way the program's been explained to me. That's my understanding. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. And yeah, that was gonna be my next question actually. Uh, you know, are there other models around uh, the province um, or other, you know, examples of that kind of model around the province? And it's, I mean, I, I think it's great because I, for sure I have a lot of constituents who are unattached to um, primary care and, uh, I've been able to say, well, there's this place opening in Kearney Lake, but if if there are a number of clinics all over the province that are, you know, for people who are unattached to primary care, then why don't we just make them permanent and then those people would be attached to primary care? Um, but maybe I'm missing something in there. So I will just leave that in the, you know, in the ether to for people to ruminate on. Um, Moving on for a moment, I have heard through the grapevine many very positive accounts about the services that are available at mental health and addictions drop-in programs at Lunenburg and Yarmouth hospitals. There's no wait time for these services and people can access immediate mental health and nursing support. So I'm wondering, is there consideration in this budget of expanding this particular model to other parts of the province, which is drop-in medical, mental health and addiction support? And I understand, you know, all of the we've 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 gone over the the you know the e mental health, the hubs, the single sessions, and all of that stuff. But I'm referring so so I understand all those, and I don't need the minister to re, to re outline those ones. But I'm what I'm asking about is the specific programs that take place at Lunenburg and Yarmouth hospitals um, uh, that may be you know emulated in other uh, in other places. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health. So on, on the issue of the primary care clinics and why they are uh, stopgap measures as opposed to clinics that patients will be continuously attached to uh, is because uh, the, the physicians that um, volunteer, I guess, to, to work at these clinics 
uh, it's, it's fluid. So these would actually mostly be family docs that have their own uh, panel of patients uh, who are also working with the NSHA to provide these other access points for primary care for unattached patients. Uh, but individuals going to those clinics wouldn't necessarily always see the same uh, physician. And there's also nurse practitioners there that they may be seeing uh, with, with physician oversight. So that would be the reason why they're not uh, the model is not to attach those patients. It's a stopgap to support patients that are unattached uh, because of the reason that I, I referenced. Um, we're not aware of the walk-in uh, mental health uh, spaces that the member's talking about. Uh, I'm wondering if she's referring to community-based uh, supports that um, we provide funding to or, or if she's, she's uh, speaking of... Um, uh, supports available directly in the hospital. So if I could get a bit more information on uh, the programmings that the program that the programs that she's referencing, uh, I, I'll uh, be able to do a better job getting a re an answer for her. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Sure, I'll get that information to the Minister. Um, uh, it in due time. Um, so I'm going to move on from that for a moment. Um, why is the CCA registry, the new CCA registry being hosted? Oh, no, no, I already asked that question. Sorry, pardon me. Um, we, the other day we were talking with the CCA registry and I, we had a back and forth, as uh, the um, minister may remember, about the difference between a privacy commissioner and a review officer. Um, everyone agreed that it was semantics. In any case, I never really got an answer to my question, which was what the privacy review officer said about the arrangement of the CCA registry. Um, so I'm wondering if the minister could share what the privacy review officer said about the arrangement and what measures are being taken to ensure confidentiality. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, I'd like to thank the member for the question. So it was, uh, yeah, very much enjoyed that back and forth last night uh, on the on the language of the um, Privacy Officer Act. Um, it would it would have been the Director of Privacy and the uh, legal folks in house here at the Department of Health uh, that would have uh, conducted the uh, the review and assessment of of, of the registry. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. This is getting ridiculous, Madam Chair. It doesn't matter who it was. I'm just wondering what they said about it. So how can the Minister confirm uh, that there are measures being taken, or how can the Minister assure us that there are measures being taken to ensure confidentiality of the folks that go on the CCA registry? The Honourable Minister of Health.
I can I can tell the member I can tell the member uh, specifically uh, what the director of privacy and our legal team's conclusion was, and um, it was that the proposed CCA registry honors and protects the personal information of registrants. So that was the determination of that. Order. The time allotted for the NDP party has expired. We will now move on to the P PC party of Nova Scotia. The honourable member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very nice to see you uh, in that chair. Um, through you, Madam Chair, uh, good afternoon, Minister, and good afternoon, staff. Uh, uh, Minister, you may recall uh, a few weeks ago uh, in question period, I had asked a question uh, with respect to um, MSI supports for breast cancer patients. And I have a few follow-up questions, uh, and I'm hoping we can engage in a, in a discussion uh, on uh, on breast cancer supports. Uh, first of all, uh, I wanna thank the department for, for getting back to me uh, with respect to what is currently provided as, uh, as supports. And um, it was pointed out to me uh, through the department that MSI provides support for breast prosthesis. MSI provides up to $150 every two years for a breast prosthesis per mastectomy and additional financial assistance of $150, $300 uh, for a double mastectomy and $40 towards a mastectomy bra. And this is available once every two years uh, for residents who have a total gross income less than 30,000 as indicated by line 150 of the individual's income tax notice of assessment or reassessment issued by the Canada Revenue Agency. And then also, uh, Minister, it was pointed out, uh, obviously, the generosity uh, of donors uh, via the Canadian Cancer Society, which I know all of us will say, I mean, they are the gold standard uh, of, uh, of supports uh, for, for, uh, for uh, cancer patients. Um, so my first question, uh, Minister, is, you know, I guess, you know, what is the criteria used to determine uh, these supports, specifically breast cancer supports? What's the criteria that's used? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Um, we're going to get the uh, specific language for that criteria uh, to provide to the member. Make sure it's accurate. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, no, I appreciate that, Minister. Thank you. Um, my my concern um, is based on, uh, I, you know, there may be an inequality that may prevail here, and I'll just sort of lay out the scenario uh, to the Minister, Madam Chair. Uh, MSI gives all mastectomy patients two options, uh, reconstructive surgery or breast prosthesis. Uh, reconstructive surgery, my understanding, is covered by MSI, uh, 100%, uh, which is to the, the cost of about 10000 to 50000 uh, my understanding is income plays no role in that op option. There's no charge to the, to the patient. However, patients that have chosen not to avail themselves uh, to that option um, and have opted for non-surgical choice, uh, like my late wife, for example, minister, that's what she chose. Um, my understanding is they're offered, I mean, as I just outlined in the response the department gave, 150 every two years, and if the income is under 30,000, more financial aid is available uh, and there's a process that, that, that needs to be applied. 
So uh, the bottom line question is this, will MSI, will the department uh, consider increasing financial assistance uh, for the breast forms um, and the necessary mastectomy bras required uh, by, by patients? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness.
Uh, thank you very much for the for the patience um, of the uh, of the house and, and the member. Um, we're, we're just again getting the the, uh, the specific criteria up. That's what we've been searching for to go through that with the member. But the member was fairly uh, accurate on the criteria that he outlined, and uh, uh, appreciate the how close this is to the members. Uh, uh, the members hard in life as well. And again, my, my condolences uh, to you and the family. Um, we can only imagine the, uh, you know, the pain that comes with the loss of a, uh, uh, a partner and, and the member I know has, has done her legacy, great, uh, great service in, in the chamber. Uh, and speaking about, uh, I remember your speech about her being your, your, her, uh, her being your rock of Gibraltar. And I don't think I'll ever forget that, uh, that speech, uh, in the chamber. There wasn't too many, there weren't too many dry eyes in the chamber at that time. Uh, in terms of the uh, scope of coverage, uh, there is good news on that front. In fact, there is a review that is underway right now, and we do expect recommendations to be coming forward uh, within the next year uh, around um, expansion of the scope uh, of coverage uh, for these, uh, these critical services uh, for, uh, uh, for women in our province. And uh, do we have the specific criteria ready to go? Okay. And we do have the criteria up that we'll go through as well. And again, thanks for the patience. This is our program. This is our program. Uh, so, I mean, uh, according to the, the documents we have, the regulations state a resident as defined and the regulations respecting medical services insurance made pursuant to the Health and Services and Insurance Act who has undergone a mastectomy or a lumpectomy, lumpectomy and in the opinion of a physician requires the use of a conventional uh, mastectomy prosthesis uh, will receive financial assistance up to a maximum of uh, $150 per prosthesis once a year or once every two years, sorry. There's also additional low income program uh, for individuals uh, who are under $30,000 of income a year, and that's funded by Cancer Care Canada that offers an additional payment of up to a maximum of $300 per year. Uh, three, sorry, $300 per pro prosthesis and up to a maximum of $40 for the purchase of, of the supporting bra. So that is the, I mean, the member is dead on with his, uh, his description of the criteria. Um, and again, this is under review with the, uh, the expectation that recommendations are coming forward in the not too distant future for uh, expansion of coverage. So I'd like to thank the member uh, very much for the question. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth East. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I'd like to thank the minister for his, for his very kind and, and generous uh, remarks. Uh, greatly appreciated. Um, in all honesty, uh, the questions here, I. I probably couldn't have asked a few years ago, but uh, but I feel I'm at a point now where I, I can I can safely ask these, um, you know, keeping a, some dry eyes here. But thank you very much for your kind remarks. Thank you for outlining the criteria, uh, and and at the end of the day, to, to hear that there'll be uh, a, a review of, of how these uh, uh, decisions are made. Uh, I know this will be of great comfort to uh, a lot of families uh, and a lot of uh, um, you know individuals that are battling uh, this disease. Uh, as my, my colleague from uh, Argyle Barrington pointed out uh, in his speech on supply, I mean, part of our role as opposition is to, to point out areas uh, we think the government needs to shine some light on. And uh, just one final question before I, I hand, uh, hand this over to my colleague from Northside Westmount, um, and it's with respect to cranial hair prosthesis. Um, uh, while facing a major health crisis such as breast cancer, uh, the total loss of hair, uh, this, this adds uh, to another layer of, of, of emotional devastation. Um, and this, this many respect, in many respects is not the private hell of breast cancer uh, patients. Uh, it's, a, it's a very public uh, announcement of the diagnosis and, and, and the struggle that the patient and, and the family is, is going through. Um, so, so my final question uh, to, to the minister, um, in the scope of that review, uh, will MSI look at expanding, I guess, the finance, financial, uh, I guess, boundaries um, that include the cranial hair prosthesis? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness.
I'd like to thank the member uh, for the question and the suggestion. So uh, that currently is not part uh, of the ongoing review that's been taking place, but uh, I've asked staff in the room to include a recommendation in that regard uh, as part of uh, as part of that review. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth East. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd like to thank the minister and staff uh, for their time. Uh, I believe um, you know, in this short conversation, uh, I think you know, the very fact that we have government that's looking into it, that's um, you know constantly, you know, I hope always constantly reviewing policies, um, specifically this. It, I think it will be of great comfort to to a lot of uh, Nova Scotians. Um, that being said, I, I pass this on to my colleague from Northside Westmount. I recognize the honourable member for Northside Westmount. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to thank the Minister for granting me a few moments of his time this afternoon. My questions are around Northside Westmount area, obviously. And I'm, specifically, I'm interested in the re healthcare redevelopment um, plan that's going on down here. And currently with Northside General, the hospital has 45 acute care beds. And those are currently occupied by short-term acute care patients that are in for you know variety of illnesses, what have you. They're, none of them are there on a long-term basis. Uh, so as part of the redevelopment plan, those um, we will have 12 acute care beds. So that's a decrease of about 33. And if I look over in New Waterford, uh, they will be going from 21 down to 12, and then at the regional hospital, they're going, they're adding 72 beds. So, for the region as a whole, there's a net increase of 30 beds. But I'm wondering a couple of things related to this. You know, the these 12 beds that are going here in the new facility have been designated as 72-hour beds, and I'm just wondering. I'm looking for, I've been looking for some informa information and I'm just trying to figure out how do you determine who is a 72 hour patient? Like, you know, how do you set that parameter? I recognize the Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, so there's a uh, um, 
I guess, two primary factors that uh, would uh, dictate uh, uh, a patient's longevity of stay. And it can be anticipated that a patient's stay would be between one and three days uh, based on uh, the disease um, entity that they're, they're dealing with. So, uh, you know, docs determine that based on, on this disease or this, this health challenge, you require, um, you know, one to three days. Uh, it's also available for patients who have been treated and who will be uh, recovering and need uh, monitoring. Um, um, also, this program was designed to utilize the residents uh, that are in uh, training in Cape Breton as well. Uh, the number 12 is the number that was decided. And this was also built by the physicians at Northside and, and New Waterford. Uh, so they were the ones advising on, on uh, this model. And uh, the 12 beds uh, was deemed to be from the, from the clinicians, the, uh, basically the, the number that allowed them to most effectively manage uh, you know, those the, the, the manage the staff uh, and, and, and the ratio with those uh, with those beds. I recognize the honorable member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think the man, thank the minister for that answer, and uh, it's very much appreciated that the local physicians clinicians are listened to. Uh, I know in the initial um, iteration of this redevelopment plan, there were no acute care beds. And it was through the hard work of some local um, physicians in the area, working with the Department of Health, uh, lobbying with them and making their case that these 12 beds um, were identified and are going to, were added to this facility. So that's always a good thing. What's been lacking, if you will, is from a communication standpoint. And I get constituents coming into my office asking questions about this whole redevelopment and the whole thing, you know, is a very, um, what's the word, hot topic, if you will, or it can be. So tied into that, in relation to Northside General currently has 45 acute care beds. And I've had personal experience going in there to um, visit with family members, my parents, what have you. And for family families and caregivers, they can visit their fam ill family members much more easily having them in their own home community. So my, my second question to the minister is, while I was really definitely relieved to see the 12 beds added to the initial redevelopment plan, but I'm wondering what was the reasoning in the overall plan, um, and I know this predates the minister, uh, but what was the overall planning and thinking behind the residents on the north side, because north side general, we're going to be down 33 acute care beds. And as part of this overall plan, we're also, the ER is going to be um, moved over to relocate it to Sydney. So I'm just wondering what was the thinking behind that lot, like reassigning 33 of our long term care beds? Thank you. Order, please. We're going to take our 15 minute uh, break. So the minister will be able to address this question uh, after the break. So we will break now and come back at 3.30. Thank you.
Order, please. We will resume our um, questioning of the health, of the Minister of Health and Wellness. Um, and I recognize the Minister, the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the member uh, for the question. Um, so this is a, you know, once in a generation uh, project to reshape the uh, health delivery in, in Cape Breton. It's one that uh, did actually re receive or was, was uh, did include, sorry, a lot of uh, consultation. Uh, in fact, the current deputy minister of our department was the um, uh, chief medical or the senior medical director at the time um, in industrial Cape Breton. Uh, was a big part of, uh, of this, um, as well as doctors, nurses, uh, allied healthcare professionals, the municipal uh, government and uh, community services groups uh, also were consulted. Uh, there was public uh, communication that was fairly regular, uh, which didn't include uh, information set up at the ball. There's of course the uh, public announcement uh, and follow up um, information that was, was provided fairly uh, consistently to the community. Um, so there was, while there is a, a reduction in the acute care beds, um, the reason for that was based on a clinical assessment. And uh, the fact was, is that the, uh, a lot of the beds, 24 in uh, New Waterford and 22 on the north side were actually being used for what's referred to as alternative level of care beds. Uh, which would es essentially be folks that are waiting to get into long-term care. Um, so the new complement of acute care beds would be more in line with uh, what the acute care needs would be based on clinical assessment of, of uh, docs and, and, uh, and others uh, in that community. Uh, but what actually is happening is a, is a net increase of beds uh, for uh, long-term care. Um, which will accommodate the ALC uh, patients that were in those beds waiting to get into long-term care facilities and the increase, some of the increased demand uh, that they're seeing in that area. So um, the area is going from having, uh, I'll make sure my math is right here, but there was uh, going from the um, 24 in, in New Waterford and 22 beds, which were being used for alternative level of care. So folks waiting to get into long-term care. Uh, and they're actually getting 60 new long-term care beds uh, in both communities. So 120 uh, beds uh, that will be there. And that would represent a, a net increase of uh, 74 uh, new beds uh, in that facility. So it would have been clinical assessments uh, that made the determination on the, the allocation of, uh, of beds. And there is a net increase uh, where the greatest pressure was, which was on the, uh, the long-term care side. I recognize the honorable member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I thank the minister. Uh, yes, currently there are 45 acute care beds and then there's a 22 um, bed long-term care wing at the Northside General. And then there's 12 um, short-term um, or, you know, that interim transitional long-term care beds. So my, my information was that the, those were separate from the 45 and the 45 were actually acute, but anyway. Uh, my final question to the minister, it relates to um, the discussion that we were having yesterday in question period, but also more specifically, it came out of some questioning from my colleague at Cape Breton Center. And she was asking you some questions during supply related to um, the New Waterford Hospital the ER. And I'm assuming that when the minister was answering um, the MLA from Cape Breton Center that he was I, that I can make the assumption that when he was talking about New, Water, New Waterford ER, that I could use the same logic for the Northside General ER. And the minister was stated that the ER could reopen if they could get staff to, uh, doctors to work the ER, but doctors aren't willing to staff the ERs. Uh, since, you know, prior to March of 2020, there were doctors willing to staff the ER at Northside General, and there had been dating back to 1954. So I'm just wondering, like prior to the COVID-19, when, ER, when there were ER room closures, 
Well, it was communicated to the um, residents was that that was due to doctor shortages. And now based on what the minister said yesterday, we're hearing that the issue is that it's not that they can't find doc. The issue is that they can't find doctors to willing to work in the ER, not that there's actual doctor shortages per se. So I was wondering if the minister could clarify that. Is it a matter of there's shortages or they're not willing to work? Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Okay, I'd like to thank the uh, the member very much for the question. So uh, what I'm being told was at the time there was a uh, decision made by the physicians that were staffing the north side uh, to withdraw services for the um, emergency department. Um, I'm not certain on, on what the reasons uh, were for that, uh, but I do have an update for the member uh, on north side uh, is that the health authority has recently had uh, meetings uh, looking at what would be necessary from a staffing perspective and what would be possible to uh, reestablish uh, ED services at that hospital. I recognize the honorable member for Northside Westmount. The honorable member is on mute. So I am. I had a good run for about three days where I was not missing that. I want to thank the minister for the answer. Uh, if he could keep me apprised of those developments, um, that would be greatly appreciated. I'd now like to, that finishes my questioning, um, Madam Chair, and I'd like to hand off to my colleague from Cumberland North. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member for Cumberland North. Thank you to my colleague and thank you, Madam Chair. 
So thank you, Minister. I'm looking forward to asking you some questions on behalf of the people here in Cumberland North. Uh, my first question is regarding its financial question. Um, historically, pre-pandemic, we've enjoyed uh, shared healthcare services with our neighboring province. They come here, we go there. Traditionally, our people have gone to New Brunswick for MRIs, CAT scans, uh, oncology, uh, a lot of dialysis, um, some surgery, and they've traditionally come to our area for obstetrics, ENT, and surgery. I'm wondering what kind of cost savings our province would have experienced in the last 12 months, knowing that many of our constituents here have had their surgeries and diagnostic tests canceled by the neighboring province simply because of uh, their living here in Nova Scotia. The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. services out of province so that we don't have that specific just to New Brunswick that would be for um, you know the folks that go to Ontario for specialized uh, treatment as well so there would be a savings in that particular budget line of approximately 7.6 million however what's unknown is how many of those procedures were then um, conducted here uh, in Nova Scotia and we do not have any we, there's no easy way to calculate uh, that so um, while there will while in our in our budget there'll be a reduction in that 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 number that that budget line number um, there very well may could have been an additional cost associated with any procedures that could have been done 
uh, here in the province and that, that were done. Uh, also, I do have an update on the member with the vaccine uh, question she asked in, in QP if she's okay with me providing her that update. So there were no, uh, there were no vaccines taken out of uh, the Cumberland area. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that was, uh, we clarified that. We did check with our, our vaccination folks and uh, that wasn't the case. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we've got two issues going on right now. So um, I'm going to finish off with the New Brunswick issue and then I'll address your last comment that was made. Um, so with New Brunswick, what I would ask your department is uh, would the department be willing to look at the cost savings that they've experienced and look at, uh, you know, what are we going to do for the future here? We don't know how long this pandemic is going to last. Uh, we certainly haven't seen our federal counterparts stand up for people here. They're not ensuring the Canada Health Act is, is being upheld. And uh, if the pandemic continues and New Brunswick sticks to uh, their guns like they've done, um, I can't continue to sit back and listen to people who have had their surgeries canceled and not rescheduled. Most uh, minister have not been rescheduled. So I have cataract surgery, hip surgery, um, and it's it's continuous. It's continuing to happen. I had a call on the weekend from somebody who, as soon as he was scheduled this week, and as soon as they found out while they were doing their pre-questions, as soon as they found out that he's crossed the Nova Scotia border, they canceled him. So the fact is we can't continue this. Either we need to take that cost savings and start making those services available to the people in this area in Nova Scotia, or we need to come to some sort of an agreement that will hold um, the Canadian provinces all accountable to make sure people are not going without healthcare services. So I would be really interested to know what sort of money savings has been experienced and helping the government to come up with some sort of a plan to make sure all Nova Scotians have access, the same access to healthcare services. Uh, with regards to the vaccine, I can assure you that vaccine was reallocated. Um, it was um, allocated originally to the Amherst Pharmacy. They were supposed to be uh, administering the vaccine. It was supposed to be given on April the 5th, which was Monday. And I was told last night by the um, person from Pharmacy Nova Scotia that a decision was made to reallocate that vaccine from the Amherst Pharmacy, Pharmacy Clinic to HRM. So I can assure you I was told that by two different people, both the, the pharmacy clinic that were supposed to receive the vaccine and that was canceled and by the pharmacy association that now they, they did not tell me who made the decision. I don't know if it was the pharmacy association that made the decision or if somebody from Department of Health told them to make the decision, but I can assure you that Pfizer vaccine that was allocated to come to Cumberland for April the 5th was reallocated to HRM. And the second part of that, that vaccine was um, AstraZeneca vaccine that was allocated to Northern Zone, none is being brought to Cumberland. So only, and, in your last response and question period, you you won you you did ask the question: Is it because there's nobody to administer it? And again, I will tell you, uh, we have people that are willing to administer the vaccine. We have pharmacy clinics that actually hired staff that they have no work for them because they were told they were getting vaccine, and they have staff waiting for the vaccine supply and no work. So we have we have healthcare professionals to administer it. So I want to assure you of that. We just don't have the supply. So I'm not sure where you got your information, but that's the information I was given. Um, I would like to remind all members uh, to go through the chair when uh, speaking with ministers and vice versa. Um, try to avoid using you and um, speaking through the chair, referring to people in the third person. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness.
Uh, I, I can confirm with a member that there's been no reallocation of vaccines uh, from yes. Cumberland uh, to anywhere else in the province. So that information would not be accurate. Uh, I'm not certain what information uh, the member might be getting from PANS. We are uh, relying on our partnership with PANS and their network of pharmacists. We work through them uh, for them to uh, work with uh, their network of of, of um pharmacies to deliver this and they will be delivering the vast majority of our, our vaccines uh, but from a department standpoint there's absolutely no uh, reallocation of uh, vaccines uh, from uh, from Amherst to anywhere else in the province so I want to confirm that with the member uh, if she's got documentation uh, from PANS that she'd like me to take a look at for us to try to understand where the um, miscommunication is on this. Uh, very, very happy to do that. But we've confirmed with our vaccine folks that that uh, that did not happen um, from from our from our perspective. Um, on the uh, on the cataract, hip and knee uh, replacement surgeries. So we um, there. So there's two sides to that coin. So one, there was an item. Uh, the budget line savings was about seven point six million dollars. Uh, but many of those surgeries would have been, particularly the ones that happen in New Brunswick, can happen here in Nova Scotia. So they would have been um, or can be conducted here. So there would be an additional cost on this side. Uh, furthermore, it's actually been a net loss because more people come from out of province to uh, get surgeries here uh, than vice versa. So there was actually a loss to the department of $12.5 million dollars. Um, because we we didn't bill for surgeries that folks uh, usually in Atlantic Canada are coming into uh, the province for. So there's um, there's actually a net loss on that. And furthermore, the any surgeries that can be provided here in Nova Scotia, um, and I'm I'm told that a lot of the ones that are done in New Brunswick can be uh, would be and can be reassigned uh, here uh, here in the province. And we are working through that uh, that wait list that has. And those wait times that have built up over COVID and 95% of, uh, we have hit 95%. I don't know if that number has changed in the last couple of weeks, but 95% of those surgeries, that, the elective surgeries um, that were uh, uh, canceled over COVID uh, have either been rebooked or have, have happened. And during COVID, all of the uh, essential uh, surgeries, the urgent ones, uh, like cancer treatment and 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 those those critical uh, critical ones did uh, did take place i recognize the honorable member for cumberland north thank you madam chair i don't really understand why you're trying to discredit what i'm saying so i'm going to just order please i'm going to remind the honorable member to uh, to speak through the chair to the minister thank you I'm speaking through you, Madam Chair. But and you're not allowed to refer to the minister. Uh, you're not allowed to speak to the minister uh, directly. So using the word you, you need to refer to the minister in the third person through me. Yes. So Madam Chair, thank you for that reminder. So I'll just say to Madam Chair that uh, the minister can check his references and resources. So we have a pharmacy. I will say this again for the third time. We have a pharmacy that was allocated Pfizer vaccine for April the 5th. And I was told by the pharmacy association last night that the decision was made to reallocate that Pfizer vaccine from Cumberland to Halifax. Now, I'm not sure who gave them the direction to do that, but I can assure you this is what I was told, both by a pharmacy here, as well as the pharmacy association. And I think, Madam Chair, you know what we're what we're listening to right now is maybe why we see such a disarray of this pharmacy, uh, this vaccine implementation plan, when nobody seems to know what the right hand is doing. You know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So the fact that we've got Doctors Nova Scotia, Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia, Department of Health public health, and nobody seems to know who's uh, real, real lauding and moving vaccine around the province, uh, maybe is why we're seeing uh, so many problems. So um, I'm going to leave that with the minister. 
to discuss with his department, uh, Madam Chair. But I can assure you that I've been told this, uh, not by just one person. With regards to the uh, medical health services that have been canceled by our neighboring province, this has been going on for a year, and many of the people here have not had their surgeries rescheduled. So if the province of Nova Scotia is not billing the other provinces for surgeries done here, I would say the province, our province may need to look at their accounting services and who's taking care of that. Um, if you have, if the province has a net loss of 12.5 million, uh, that's a problem. And maybe the province needs to look at um, doing a little better job with financial management within the department. I'm concerned about the people here in Cumberland North who have had surgeries canceled and diagnostic tests canceled due to the pandemic. And what I'm asking the minister is, is the department willing to look at a plan for the future? Because if this pandemic continues and no one is going to hold, uphold the Canada Health Act to ensure people can receive healthcare services in different provinces, then our province has a responsibility to ensure all people in Nova Scotia, including those that live in a border community, have timely access to healthcare services. And right now, they don't. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, and of course, the, the pandemic has had um, created challenges in our healthcare system. Um, we've had borders shut down for the first time uh, that in, in living memory uh, between provinces to protect each other from the spread of this virus. Um, we have had to delay elective surgeries to create capacity in our hospitals to respond to uh, what could have been the potential impacts. And I know that the member uh, is, is very well educated on this pandemic. She's a medical professional. She sees what's happening in other provinces uh, where hospitals uh, have been overrun, are currently being overrun in Ontario. Uh, where they are in the midst of another lockdown. Um, so it was prudent to make these decisions. Um, we've been fortunate here because of strong public health policy and uh, of an incredible amount of uh, compliance uh, with the population uh, to prioritize the health and safety uh, of everybody. But um, I mean, for the member to suggest that uh, we had control over the impacts of this pandemic um, and that we shouldn't have responded as prudently as we did to create capacity in our hospitals, I don't think is fair. Uh, and we're trying very hard right now to catch up with those elective uh, surgery uh, wait lists, and we've had some success on that. Uh, folks who were scheduled to go in another uh, province would have to be re-referred to a specialist here um, and looked at by and assessed by a specialist here to receive that surgery in Nova Scotia or whatever the procedure may be. Um, and that, 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 that would be funded. Um, so that process is, is ongoing, uh, but I know the member can appreciate the reasons why these uh, challenges have occurred and why these wait lists um, have been exacerbated uh, because the threat of COVID-19 is, is real and still hanging over our shoulders. Um, and we don't, need to, we don't need to look too far uh, to see what, the, uh, the consequences uh, could be uh, if we do uh, not remain vigilant and cautious and if we fail to follow public uh, health uh, protocols. Um, and, and listen, I, I, I'm not questioning the member's credibility on this, on the vaccine issue. Uh, what I can tell her is it's been confirmed by the staff here in the department. Again, I haven't seen any documentation uh, from the member from the Pharmacy Association. And as I mentioned, I'm, I'm happy to take a look at that to try and get to the bottom of this. Um, but to suggest that uh, from a department standpoint, to suggest that there's been a, a reallocation from Cumberland with vaccines, um, nobody here understands why that assertion would be made. Because from our perspective, that's that's not true. Um, and there, oh my there's, there's, there's nothing that would have happened uh, for that. So if the member, and again, I'll offer to the member uh, to provide documentation to substantiate this, 
um, and we can help get to the bottom of where uh, this information is coming from. Um, but I've been assured by our staff here that, that deal with the vaccines every day that oversee this program, uh, that that information is not accurate, that the member uh, has shared. And um, I know that the, the opposition has been very focused on the vaccine rollout. I, I think that's a good thing. Uh, we want to make sure that our, our vaccine rollout is going as smooth as possible. Um, but the way that the, the opposition is trying to paint this as, um, you know, being a disaster uh, is not accurate. Um, we held back second doses, which was a prudent decision at the time based on the federal guidelines for when second doses should happen. Uh, that has impacted how many first doses got in people's arms because we held those back. Um, but we've hit 100,000 people in Nova Scotia with first doses. We've got 30,000 with second doses. We're leading the country in um, vaccinations of our long-term care facilities. Uh, and we're, we're going to look at having uh, doses in everybody's arms if supply stays up uh, by the end of June. I, let's, go, let's go back a year ago. And, and think about the fact that we're at where we're at right now. I know everyone can remember the fear in our, in our minds and in our communities a year ago. People were saying it might be three, five years before we had a vaccine available. Nobody knew how to manage this. Uh, lockdowns were happening. Um, everyone was doing their very best to stay up to speed on the developing science uh, around uh, this virus. And here we are. Uh, a little over a year later, and we're administering uh, vaccines and getting them in people's arms in an orderly way, utilizing our healthcare professionals in Nova Scotia. And uh, there's not disorganization because we're working with partners like the member suggested. We're lucky to have incredible partners like Doctors Nova Scotia and the Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia who will be distributing the vast majority of our, of our vaccines in their clinics. And the uh, amount of clinics have expanded as supply has increased. Um, and um, we're having very serious growth in the amount of vaccines that are being administered uh, every week. We had 27,000 administered last week doses, 40,000 administered this week. We're anticipating 50,000 the week after, 60,000 the week after that. So we are starting to see uh, particularly with supply increasing from the federal government because it's all contingent on supply. We're not producing vaccines here. The federal government is procuring these vaccines from the global marketplace and distributing them. Um, but we are seeing growth in the amount of vaccines that we are distributing um, every single week. And I, I do think that we do all have a responsibility to uh, support the public in being, being confident about this process, about the science behind the vaccines themselves, uh, and also support them in getting the necessary information that they need. I know people are frustrated with some, some elements of Order. this. You know, Order. Time has lapsed. We'll now turn it over to the NDP. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, and I'd like to continue asking sort of a variety of questions uh, of the minister. My first question for this section is um, the sexual or sexual health Nova Scotia gets only $275,000 to cover the entire province with their work. In contrast, women's centers get over 200,000 per center. And uh, uh, listen, let me say that they probably need a lot more than that. But I understand that it's difficult for the organization that is Sexual Health uh, Nova Scotia to fulfill its mandate within this budget. Was it considered to increase the budget of Sexual Health Nova Scotia? I recognize the Honorable Minister for Health and Wellness.
I'd like to thank the, the member uh, for her uh, for her patience on that. So the uh, I believe the member asked about the sexual the grant to Sexual Health Nova Scotia. Uh, it's an organization that does um, a proactive education on uh, um, you know positive positive sexual health in our community. So that grant is uh, two hundred seventy five thousand uh, annually that they receive. And the uh, what's budgeted in this budget is uh, is the same amount, so we're staying consistent with the grant that's provided at this time. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Great. Can uh, the minister explain, Madam Chair, what is in the budget uh, that is being earmarked for greater access to health care services in the province's prisons? Uh, if he could point to increases and what lines they are reflected in, and if he could explain what program improvements are being implemented or considered. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Uh, I'd like to thank the member uh, for the question. So that would not be reflected in the department's budget. Uh, there would be a carry through with the Nova Scotia Health Authority's uh, budget. Um, so we are going to uh, uh, see if we can find that that information uh, from the health authority for the member. Uh, I do know that there are, uh, were enhanced, uh, you know, COVID protocols and, and measures that took place in our uh, in our provincial uh, correctional facilities. Again, to, to be separated from the federal correction facilities where the, the federal government pays for the health care uh, of individuals uh, there. So we can uh, see if we can get some more detailed uh, budgetary information for the member from the health authority who would oversee the delivery of those uh, health services. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and uh, yeah, thank you uh, to the Minister. I look forward to getting that information. I just wanted to go back on uh, something that I was asking the Minister about before in my last hour, and that was um, so, uh, mental health and addictions programs at um, in the Western Zone, and, uh, and the Minister had said that he hadn't heard of this particular program, and so I just wanted to read, this is from um, the Nova Scotia Health website, but it's... Um, so the, it's called the Wellness Clinic. The Wellness Clinic is an ongoing client-focused program that is based on what the client or group of clients want to work on that day. There is no wait list or referral process. The client simply walks in, meets with staff to form a care plan with them and gets started. And it's a mental health and addictions wellness program. So, and it's in the Western Zone uh, at... Um, 
uh, two of the hospitals. And so when I was, I, so I just, the, the minister hadn't heard of the program. I wanted to clarify the, the name of the program and what the, what the description of the program is. And I guess I want to reiterate uh, if, if or the question which was, uh, you know, it, could this type of program, is this type of program being looked at for other places in the province? Because um, through the grapevine, I've heard lots of really excellent things about this program. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Yeah, thanks. Uh, no, thanks for the member for the question. Yes, we are. I am familiar with these uh, uh, these uh, these wellness hubs that focus on mental health and addictions. Um, so, thanks for thanks for clarifying which facilities you were uh, you were referencing. Uh, so, we do now in the west have three locations: uh, one at Yarmouth uh, Regional in Lunenburg, as the member said, and also in Middleton at so Soldiers Memorial. Uh, so these are actually the models of, of, of uh, hubs that we are expanding uh, into other zones and expanding in, uh, uh, across the province. So the new uh, mental health, uh, sorry, the new addictions and, and uh, withdrawal hubs that are in this budget are modeled, on, uh, modeled off of uh, these examples. So there is an expansion happening uh, here, uh, based on uh, these programs, and every zone will have uh, have access to at least one hub. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you to the Minister. Thank the Minister for that answer. Um, great to hear. Uh, our office received an FOI recently that explained that in the entirety of time since the department started collecting complaints about home care in 2017, uh, which uh, it was also when the... Um, the uh, department ceased auditing complaints. There have been a number of, uh, fi uh, sorry, a total of 58 complaints collected. So this change took place after the Auditor General expressed concerns about accountability processes in home care. So my first question is, does this number, so from 2017 to th 2020, not, to, pardon me, 2021, uh, of 58 complaints in those four years, does that seem low to the minister? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure how to assess whether that's, that's high or low. I think it's considering the volume of patients we see and, and site visits that happen. Uh, that does seem to be proportionally uh, a, a decent number, uh, which would be an indication uh, to me that we've got high quality services that people are genuinely, uh, are generally uh, and genuinely uh, satisfied with. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I feel like <laughs> It is low. I feel like that doesn't seem, that that doesn't seem like a reasonable a number to me. And I mean, you know, even in my office alone, we we get complaints about home care. Uh, I don't know how many we've had since I've been elected, but quite a few. Uh, and so I can't imagine there are all of the complaints are happening in Dartmouth North, but yet only 58 have been uh, have been you know documented since 2017. So I'm wondering if. Um, if the minister can sort of speak to, in what is now a compl complaint-based system, considering that this year there were over 15,000 home care clients across the province, 58 complaints in the span of four years means that complaints must be getting missed. Would the minister 
agree with that. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. So um, these are the these are the complaints. Uh, these are the only complaints that we do have in the department. Um, excuse me. It is possible uh, that there's complaints that are going directly to the agencies, which wouldn't be coming uh, to us, and presumably those would be handled uh, at the agency uh, at the agency level. So. Um, uh, the member's point is, is taken, you know, perhaps people are finding other outlets, you know, except the Department of Health to voice their concerns. Maybe it's, you know, MLA offices. Um, I certainly haven't had any complaints that I can remember about home care in, uh, in, in my community uh, uh, from the VON or any of the other providers. Um, folks generally have, have been quite satisfied uh, with, with those services. Um, but but maybe their maybe their complaints are going somewhere else. But the official ones that we have on record in the department would be would be fifty eight. So I can only speak to those. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I agree, it's a tricky question because like, well, that's the number, that's the number. And, and it's hard to know what we don't know. Um, but I'm wondering um, I'm wondering what the department does to ensure, I mean, because just, just for, I, for sure I know the ones that have come to my office, families have already complained to the, um, to the home care providers, the agencies or whatever, and they're not getting anywhere with them, for instance. So then they come to the MLA as the next step. Um, so I'm wondering what the department uh, might do to ensure that clients and their families are aware of the accountability processes in home care. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness.
Uh, so a couple, uh, a number of things on this front. So there, there, through the Nova Scotia Health Authority, there are uh, care coordinators whose responsibility would be to communicate to the clients their uh, rights uh, and also to communicate to them processes they would go through to um, uh, deal with any any issues that they would have uh, you know with with uh, individuals or the agencies um, and uh, not often do those uh, get escalated uh, to the department. Um, so generally speaking, the feedback on the home care uh, support network uh, has been positive based on the information I'm given from staff. Uh, the health authority has just completed a satisfaction survey of which we do not have the, um, uh, the details of yet, but that should be available soon. So that's another um, uh, that, that's another, uh, I think, uh, tool that's being used to uh, assess people's satisfaction and, and uh, overall um, thoughts, concerns on the services that they're receiving. But there have been a lot of uh, enhancements to these services uh, in recent years um, and, and during COVID-19. Uh, we also do have... Uh, generally speaking, high-quality agencies that deliver uh, these services, uh, including the VON, uh, which you know has a really great reputation. Uh, I'd say the what we hear the biggest complaints are around scheduling, uh, usually, and I've heard complaints from from the actual CCAs on 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 that. But um, staff tell me that. Uh, those are the complaints that may come, or those are primarily the areas of complaints that come from um, the uh, the clients as well. So that's you know that's an ongoing challenge. But uh, generally speaking, there there seems to be a high level of satisfaction uh, with with the service. But we'll have more information when the NSA when we get the information from the Senate NSHA uh, satisfaction survey that's been conducted. Order. We'll take our COVID break now for 15 minutes, so we will return at 4.44.
Order. I call this meeting of estimates to order. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Centre for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, paid sick day, I want to go back to sick, paid sick days. So paid sick day po days policies have been proven to reduce the spread of diseases by increasing the rate at which workers stay at home when sick. In the United States, cities with paid sick days saw a 40% reduction in influenza rates during flu, flu waves compared to cities without. By enabling food services, for, uh, food service workers to stay at home when they have uh, the stomach flu or other infectious diseases, paid sick days are associated with 22% decline in rates of foodborne illnesses. And all from, this is all from the report uh, um, from Before It's Too Late, which I'll be happy to table. And it's from a network of health providers based in Ontario who advocate for better health by addressing employment conditions. My question, Madam Chair, is does the minister agree that this is a generally a public health issue outside, that the, agree that this is a general public health issue outside of COVID-19? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Uh, that would that would be an item uh, for discussion with the uh, Department of uh, Labor. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center. Somehow, Madam Chair, I knew that was going to be the answer. <laughs> I don't I don't know why, um, but with that, the the minister is in charge uh, is is responsible for the health and wellness of Nova Scotians. And so I think particularly that it would be um, prudent upon um, his department to be looking at policies such as um, sick days to, uh, with regards to public health. So again, I'd ask the minister, um, do they, do, doesn't he think that this is generally a good public health policy? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. I mean, our, our, our public health policy uh, around COVID is, uh, belongs to this department. Our, our health programming, our service delivery, um, our access to primary care, uh, all these things fall under the jurisdiction of uh, the Department of Health and, uh, and Wellness. Um, I mean, the member's asking questions that are uh, obviously related uh, to the Department uh, of Labor, which is, I'm sure, why uh, she would have anticipated uh, my answer to that question. Um, it is the, uh, that department which has jurisdiction uh, over those decisions. So I would suggest that if the member does have uh, questions in relation to uh, labor, labor policy, um, that she direct them appropriately. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, um, the only reason I could, thought I could anticipate is because I've heard this answer from the minister before with regards to labor relations. However, I would like to ask the minister, does he agree with his chief uh, medical officer, Dr. Strang, that this is a good policy, that uh, sick days is a good policy? I recognize the honorable minister for health and wellness. So the, the role that we have in this, so obviously during, uh, of course, during a pandemic, we wanted to support people to, uh, to stay home uh, who weren't able, uh, who we didn't want to go to their workplace if they were experiencing uh, symptoms. Um, so uh, of course I agree with, uh, with Dr. Strang and that's exactly why we brought in the uh, isolation pay that I referenced, I believe with another member, uh, 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 another member of the, of the NDP caucus. Uh, so that was a program that we uh, we brought in to assist those who were waiting for federal supports to come in to provide immediate, quick, 
uh, funding in the event that they needed to uh, stay home. So the department uh, did provide uh, funding uh, during the pandemic to, uh, to assist with that. Um, so, and, and you know, the, uh, Dr. Strang was consulted in that uh, as well. And uh, of course, I believe that that was um, good public policy, which is why we invested uh, those dollars there. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, uh, I, would, I would like to point out um, that Dr. Robert Strang said, and I quote, certainly from a public health perspective for not just, not just COVID-19, it is a long-standing challenge. Whether it's salmonella in a restaurant or influenza every year, there are a lot of reasons why people don't stay home or are unable to stay home. It is absolutely important that we work together to recognize the barriers that may limit people's ability to stay home and find ways to collectively reduce those barriers. Therefore, Madam Chair, and all, with all due respect to the minister, this is a public health issue. Therefore, it is the minister of, it is in the, I believe, truly believe that it is in the minister of health's purview to look at these potential guiding lights of public health policy, including paid sick days. Would the, does the minister of health agree with his chief medical officer that not just COVID-19, but in cases such as influenza, that this is a good public health measure. Yeah, of, of course. We, I recognize course. the honorable minister for health and wellness. Uh, of course, we agree in principle uh, with that. But in terms of how that program is administered, how compensation happens, uh, the framework of what paid sick leaves would, would, would look like in Nova Scotia, that does not fall under the purview of the Department uh, of Health and Wellness. And I, I believe uh, that the member uh, understands that. Um, so for these specific uh, questions related to um, that area, um, you know, they, they need to be directed to the appropriate minister uh, and department. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, um, I'll, 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 I'll move on a tad bit, not, not, too far from this, not too far from this line of questioning. And the other night, the minister referenced a number of programs that have been available throughout the pandemic to Nova Scotians who have to miss work. But none of them are permanent, automatic, legislated in the Labor Standards Code. And I know the minister is going to say that this is labor relations how, with regards to paid sick days. But can the minister confirm that he does not support permanent paid sick time? I recognize the honorable minister for health and wellness. Uh, the, the measures that the Department of Health and Wellness took were in response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, those measures were appropriate uh, from a department uh, standpoint. Uh, the member just referenced the, the labor code. Uh, the labor code does not fall under the legislation of the Department of uh, Health and Wellness. It's, it's overseen by another department. Uh, I'm not sure how more clear the uh, legislation can be on this matter um, or how more clear I can be uh, with the member on that. And, and the member does have opportunities to direct these questions to the appropriate minister who has the uh, legislative um, uh, authority um, uh, to speak on behalf of, of government uh, about these issues. There's 40 hours uh, of estimates. Um, we will be hitting the 20 hour mark here halfway through uh, in, in health alone. Uh, but the member does have the opportunity to direct those questions um, uh, appropriately. So I can speak to the measures that we took uh, on a temporary basis because that's we were responding to a public health uh, crisis uh, with the pandemic. I'm, I'm happy to talk about those measures and to speak directly to those. But I mean, the, the, the member is referencing legislation and, um, uh, and questions that um, do not fall under the purview uh, of uh, or authority uh, of, of, of this department. Um, I'm not sure what else I can, I can say on that. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center. You, Chair and Madam Chair, I, I do appreciate where the minister is coming from. I really do. Um, but my, I, I said this 
the other night, and I'm going to say it again. My hope is that when it comes to issues that also involve your department, you're going to dis have dis policy discussions with your counterparts in other departments on these issues, such as paid sick leave, which, again, I will say, influenza and other, other transmitted illnesses are public health issues. But I'll move on to another area where uh, uh, the minister hopefully will, um, will have some answers for me, and that is um, Nova Scotia is one of the last provinces to use controver the controversial practice known as birth alerts, which have been widely condemned for targeting indigenous and other racialized women. It is a child welfare practice, but, but and this is why I'm asking the minister, it does require hospitals to administer the practice. So my question is, is, is the Minister's uh, Minister of Health and his department engaged in conversations about ending this practice with the Department of Community Services? Just a reminder to address the chair and go through the chair rather than directly to the minister addressing. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. So that would fall under um, child and, and uh, youth protection, uh, which would be in the Department of, uh, of Community Services. So that um, those policies, those practices wouldn't uh, wouldn't involve the Department of Health. I recognize the honourable member for Cape Breton Centre. And thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, um, I'm just I just want to clarify, um, Madam Chair, if the minister is saying that the department. That, the, uh, that his department is not in conversations with community services. Am I correct in that assumption, Madam Chair? I recognize the Honorable Minister for Health and Wellness. Uh, we're not aware of, of any overtures from the Department of uh, Community Service or Child and Welfare uh, in relation to this, uh, this issue. I recognize the Honourable Member for Keep Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, great. Uh, thank you for that answer. I appreciate it, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm wondering if the Minister... Um, knows of or if his department is committing to further funding uh, prenatal and um, postnatal care and other programs to help expecting parents. I recognize the Honorable Minister for Health and Wellness.
Uh, I'd like to thank the member for the question. So uh, on top of the funding that we do provide to uh, the midwifery program, as well as the uh, IWK, there is an enhancement to what's called the Healthy Beginnings uh, Enhanced Home uh, Visiting Program. And uh, this is a perinatal program. So it's for uh, you know pre and postnatal support for uh, vulnerable families. And it focuses on supporting parents by promoting healthy and parent-child relationships fostering healthy childhood development and linking families with other community resources that are available. And it is uh, offered prenatally and for the first three years of a child's life. And it's offered through NS Health. So in the budget, um, the member will see an increased funding to public health. A portion of that uh, funding, increased funding will be going towards uh, this program. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to, uh, through you to the minister, I'd like to thank him for that answer. I truly appreciate it. I would like to ask, um, let's, I, will, I would like to ask another question and I'm going to skip around here. And um, so for, the last many number of years, this government has uh, taken the approach of encouraging um, home care um, over long-term care. We know that there are significant resources, resourcing challenges to meet the home care demands, uh, Madam Chair. And at a recent health committee meeting, we heard from the department that compared to January of, la of last year, which is 2020, uh, Nova Scotians are waiting about 35% longer to receive home care services. Um, this was a um, this was uh, something that was uh, shared by um, our deputy minister Oral. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Madam Chair, can the can the department commit to providing this information on a more regular basis? I recognize the honourable minister for health and wellness. Could the member repeat the question, please? I I, I, I did miss the question. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth North. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And the question, uh, I'm not sure if you heard the, I'm not sure if the minister had heard the whole thing, Madam Chair, but I'm wondering if the, can the department commit to providing the information on the wait times for home care on a regular basis? I recognize the honorable minister for health and wellness. Uh, I'd like to thank the member very much for the question. Uh, so, so what is tracked uh, would be the wait list. So the people that are waiting to receive uh, home care, that is what we track. Um, it's not, what, what's not tracked is the uh, scheduling, uh, scheduling uh, uh, times for folks that are receiving uh, a, wide, a wide range of, of services, uh, sometimes partial services, sometimes full, uh, full services. Uh, so the wait list uh, uh, we do track, and we can we can provide that. Uh, we can provide the wait list uh, to the house. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I would say that um, 
That is greatly appreciated, and I look forward to seeing that on a more regular basis, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm wondering if the minister could uh, tell, tell us what the current wait times for home care services are, and when I say that, I'm talking about the ones that we are tracking at, the, at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you. So the, the wait lists are actually available through the um, um, the, uh, the online uh, open portal uh, through government. So those are available for public consumption at any time. Uh, if the member wants to check, check on those regularly, uh, we can send uh, the most updated uh, snapshot of that wait list uh, to the house if that would make it uh, uh, easier uh, for her. But that is available online through the open portal. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to clarify something, uh, just so I knew if I, I heard it correctly. Um, the minute, did the minister say um, that, did the minister state that they were, that they're not tracking scheduling, scheduled times as scheduling times being, um, how long so, somebody who is receiving home care is waiting for appointments or because what I'm talking about are the wait times to actually um, receive home care services. I'm not sure if we're talking about the different things, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honorable Minister for Health and Wellness. Um, I'm told times are not tracked. They have not been tracked in the province. Uh, the wait list is what's tracked. So the people, uh, the wait list would be the people waiting to get on the home care um, uh, service. So that, that would be what's tracked. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center. Great, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And I thank the minister. Um, I'm just wondering, Madam Chair, if the minister could tell us how long um, are people waiting? If, he, if, if, that, uh, if they're tracking that, they would know how long people are waiting. So that is what I'm asking, Madam Chair. Thank you. I recognize the Honorable Minister for Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much for the question, uh, member. So yes, what, what is tracked are the individuals uh, that are on the wait list. Um, what's not tracked is uh, the wait time. So I guess that's never been a practice in place uh, in Nova Scotia um, because of the, the complication uh, uh, supposedly associated with the 
um, with that because many people are waiting for partial services, some are waiting for full services. Also, there's programs in place uh, while people are waiting that do provide uh, alternative services uh, as well. And those include the home first services. Those are provided through the Nova Scotia Health Authority, uh, which is... Um, uh, covering alternative services outside of the, the home care provider to support uh, those individuals, as well as the department provides uh, direct funding uh, that allows people to, uh, um, and we've uh, we've increased that budget uh, pretty, uh, pretty substantially uh, by close to 20%. Uh, and that is uh, funding that they can self-direct for self-managed care, supportive care, the caregiver benefit. Um, personal alert and, and various programs. So uh, while people are on the wait list, they also have access to these other uh, financial supports to get them the supports uh, that, they, uh, that they need. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I, I understand the minister believes that pay is negotiated through labor relations. Uh, I, I understand that. But this only applies to the unionized settings. And there are a significant number of people who work in long-term care who don't fall into this category, Madam Chair. Moreover, both British Columbia and Quebec's government took the approach of intervening in the compensation dynamic of long-term care because of the unprecedented global health emergency that required they ensure safety and adequate staffing in their long-term care facilities. Does the minister believe that these governments took a wrong or irresponsible approach, Madam Chair? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Uh, my job certainly isn't to uh, lay judgment on our counterparts across the province and the decisions that they make. Uh, we're all elected on mandates and we're all uh, elected to make the best decisions we can on behalf of our constituents and uh, provinces uh, make, make various decisions. And it's not my place to assess the uh, success um, uh, or the priorities of those governments. That, that responsibility belongs uh, to the people that elect them. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, I am so happy that the Minister talked about those that, el that, um, that elected us all to this, this, uh, ch this hollow chamber. Um, because I would also, because I'd like to add that the Nursing Homes Association of Nova Scotia, in um, their paper, Enough Talk, and I'll table that, um, if the minister would like it, would like to have it, Madam Chair, and had they ha and in that the nurse, uh, the the Nursing Home Association of Nova Scotia has recommended that the Department of Health and Wellness conduct a full compensation review of all roles in long-term care. At a recent and at a recent committee meeting, the deputy minister expressed some openness to this idea. And although I know the minister um, does state that um, compensation does not fall under his purview. Um, the recruitment and retention of CCAs, my, I hopefully, hopefully, Madam Chair, that would fall under his purview, and he might want to be in discussion and in, de, in policy discussions about how we can recruit and retain. And this might be uh, uh, something that full compensation review might be something that's very important in his department. So I'm going to ask, Madam Chair, I'd love to. I'd like to ask, Minister, um, is this being undertaken? And if so, when will it be completed? I recognize the Honorable Minister for Health and Wellness.
Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the question from the member. Uh, so just to clarify, the vast majority of our long-term care uh, employees, CCAs, are represented by uh, by unions, and they uh, they function under the collective agreements, and, and uh, we do have a well-established process to negotiate those uh, here in the province. So uh, again, um, um, very few of our, our CCAs are non-unionized based on the information I've received from staff. So there is an established process for collective bargaining uh, that they do undergo for, uh, for compensation. Uh, of course, we have an interest um, in that compensation uh, being competitive. Uh, we have an interest in recruitment, uh, retention, and skills development of that workforce, uh, without question, those are priorities for the department, uh, which is why uh, we do invest significantly into uh, training incentive uh, programs. And I can run through some of those uh, programs that we do have available. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you. Uh, I, I, had, sorry, I, had, I hadn't, hadn't finished. Uh, I was going to oh, go through the... Uh, yeah. Pardon me, Minister. I recognize the honorable minister for health and wellness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so we do have a number of uh, bursaries, including the CCA bursary program. And this was one of the recommendations from the expert advisory panel. And uh, that is for CCAs who are looking to become or the people who are looking to become CCAs. So we do have a bursary program that we've enhanced um, as a result of that recommendation. Uh, we also have a recognizing prior learning assistance pilot uh, program uh, in which um, we recognize other professional experience that folks have had and we eliminate their uh, fees associated with becoming a CCA, which I believe is $800 and the bursaries uh, are up to uh, $4,000. So this is a very much an area of interest uh, for, for us at the department. Uh, workforce uh, management support is a, is a priority as well, uh, which is why we brought the uh, legislation in this week to create a mandatory registry. Uh, right now, one of the workforce planning challenges we have is that less than 10% of our CCAs are actually registered in the voluntary registry, which uh, which, which does create issues for, for recruitment, um, uh, for retention and for planning. Uh, so this is an area that we do take uh, absolutely very seriously. And uh, without um, uh, you know, intervening on uh, the, the collective bargaining process, uh, we do invest uh, pretty significantly in opportunities for people to become CCAs and to upgrade their skills. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, um, I, I do appreciate the, f uh, the fact that the Minister has stated that this is very important to him. Um, how, but Madam Chair, uh, the, the Minister is still just talking as if all, all those in long-term care are unionized, and they're not. Um, so let's go on with this. I would also like to clarify, the, and, I, and this was something, a clarification that was made earlier in the Committee of the House on Supply, where the minister said that there was a wage parity among CCAs. This may be true for unionized CCAs, but there are so many who aren't in this category, Madam Chair. The minister can, pers the minister can peruse the job postings, Madam Chair, to see that there are regular postings for non-unionized positions at 12.55 per hour. And I won't mention the employers or on the, in the particular instance I'm thinking of, but hopefully the minister can take my word that this is the case. Given this, and given that there's an incredible shortage of CCAs in the province, um, and these numbers obtained from the department's estimates, there were, there were about uh, 388 job openings for CCAs at nursing homes based on a survey taken last, uh, last September. That there are incredible recruitment and retention challenges in this sector and that understaffing in long-term care and home care create health and safety issues. Can the minister explain his position that policy that considers compensation in long-term care is not within his purview when it is about retention and recruitment? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. Uh, I believe I've, I've answered that question uh, sufficiently for the member. Um, out of the 90 uh, facilities that we do have, uh, five of them uh, do have, uh, are not unionized, so only five out of the 90. Uh, and um, it's incumbent upon those, those providers to provide competitive wages that 
Uh, oftentimes, I mean, the information I've Order. I've done, Time has last, lapsed for the new Democratic Party. We'll turn it over to the Progressive Conservative Party for one hour. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering if the Minister can provide information of how many psychiatrists are being recruited for Cumberland Regional Healthcare Centre. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness.
Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the uh, the chair and the member uh, for their patience. Uh, there's two FTEs currently being recruited uh, for uh, that region in psychiatry. I recognize the honorable member for Cumberland North. I recognize the honorable member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can the minister let us know if there's any plan to have uh, 24 hour, seven day a week on call service for psychiatry in Cumberland Regional Healthcare Center? I recognize the honorable minister for health and wellness. I uh, thank the member uh, for the question. So that uh, in terms of the local uh, hours of operation, uh, I'm told that would be determined by the physician group and, and that just wouldn't be the psychiatrist. It could also be the other mental health uh, and clinical support staff, including social workers and, and psychologists. Uh, so they would have to make determinations based on their uh, human resource capacity, what they're able to do. Um, but of course, there's other disciplines outside of psychiatry that uh, are utilized for mental health supports. And we do have 24 seven service available to all Nova Scotians uh, through, our, through our crisis line. So we do have uh, for every single person, no matter where they are in this province, they do have access to that 24 seven uh, crisis line where they can call and, and uh, uh, have an intervention with uh, a mental health um, clinician. I recognize the honorable member for Cumberland North. I recognize the honorable member for Cumberland North. I think you're muted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can the minister provide a report of staffing shortages and ambulances that are left parked in EHS garages in both uh, Pugwash and Amherst since January 2020? I recognize the Honorable Minister for Health and Wellness.
I thank the member uh, for the question. Uh, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to produce that number uh, immediately, um, but we are. Uh, we have reached out to uh, EMC uh, to get that uh, that data for the member. Uh, I'm not sure uh, when we'll receive that from them, but as soon as we do, uh, we will uh, forward it on. I recognize the honourable member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, some of our beds, uh, acute care beds, have been closed because of a nursing shortage, as well as many of our constituents have been denied nursing and housekeeping care due to lack of staffing with VON. And I'm looking to see if the minister has any plans to increase the um, human resource capacity for nursing as well as CCAs in Cumberland. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness.
I like to thank the member uh, and the chair for their patience and getting these uh, getting these answers. Uh, so, if there is a uh, for any shortages uh, vacancies that are unfilled uh, in any zone, the NSHA would uh, continually be working to uh, fill those positions and recruit. Uh, uh, nurses, in, 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 the, in the case of the member's question, uh, to fill those. Uh, we are also focused uh, on on training more nurses here in Nova Scotia. In this budget, there's funding to uh, increase the nursing seats at uh, at CBU and at Dalhousie uh, to train more nurses here in the province uh, as well. Uh, CCA, uh, we do have a shortage of CCAs, uh, so there's a number of things that are going on to assist with uh, recruitment and retention on the CCA front. Uh, one would be better workforce planning through a mandatory registry. Uh, that is a bill that's tabled before, uh, that's been introduced in the House and, and uh, um, will be working its way through the legislative process. Uh, right now, only 10% of our CCAs in the, on the voluntary registry, which is which exists, um, under 10% are actually registering. So that creates uh, challenges in, in terms of workforce uh, workforce planning. Um, we experienced uh, the value of this sort of registry when I was at education with early childhood educators. Uh, we really utilized that uh, resource to draw in people that were trained as early childhood educators who had practiced as early childhood educators to bring them back into uh, the system. And we utilized that uh, uh, very effectively. And uh, we actually have uh, uh, one of the, uh, the great uh, uh, folks that worked at the Department of Education on that recruitment is actually in the Department of Health uh, right now. Uh, helping us with uh, with the CCAs, uh, that's more of a you know mid to long term um, um, solution that comes from long term care uh, uh, panel expert panel recommendation as well. Uh, focused on uh, on CCA training to incentivize more uh, uh, people to be involved in that. A meaningful career. So we do have some very generous bursaries to get into that program up to $4,000 either at the NSCC or a private career college, as well as the uh, recognizing prior learning uh, program, which allows uh, folks with, with uh, prior uh, applicable experience to uh, transition easily into the CCA uh, sector. And we've eliminated the fees uh, associated um, with that as well. So these are uh, excuse me, priority areas uh, for the department uh, without question. I recognize the honorable member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to share the time with my colleague from Sackville Cobbequid. I recognize the honorable member for Sackville Cobbequid. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. It's, uh, it's uh, an honor to be here in this house virtually and ask some questions of the of the minister, and, you know, certainly I appreciate the scope and enormity of the minister's role and responsibilities, and I do thank him this evening for taking some of my questions. To help uh, your staff, uh, to help uh, Madam Chair, the minister's staff, uh, I'm going to be focusing around the Cobbequick Community Health Centre in Lower Sackville. I have a few questions around that, so this should give uh, staff some time to get oriented, I would believe. And uh, I'm going to have a few questions again around that. And then my last question will be around uh, doctor shortages and recruitment in my particular area, after which uh, I ask that question, I'll be turning it over to my colleague from Coal Harbor Eastern Passage. So first, a little bit of um, history, if I could, because uh, it was mentioned earlier, there's uh, differing views, uh, statement of facts, I suppose, on uh, the value of history, but I gotta tell you, the Cobbequid Community Health Centre used to be called the Cobbequid Multi Service Centre, and it came about in the 1980s. It came about in the 80s because of two registered nurses, Shirley Freer and Carol Crosby, and they were advocating for the Cobbequid Multi Service Centre with the couple of MLAs of the day, and they actually had uh, agreement in the in cabinet and of the government of the day to build on the former site of a liquor commission, uh, which is now the site of Quest here in Lower Sackville. Well, I was on the board of that uh, Cup Quit Multi Service Center way back when. And at that time, uh, the facilities had their own boards. 
And that's where I first got my feet wet, if you will, in, in healthcare. My uh, executive director of the day, uh, you may recognize the name of Kevin McNamara. So that's where Kevin started out and he became naturally the deputy minister of health at one point. So it came about when a time uh, when Shirley and Carol were looking for innovative ways to do things in a greatly growing community. And the community at that time would have comprised of Bedford, Sackville, Waverly Fall River, uh, Lucasville, uh, Beaverbank. And they established the first, the very first in Canada, I'm led to believe, freestanding emergency center. And with that, of course, all the things that you needed. You needed laboratory, you needed imaging, and, uh, and other services, multi-service side of it grew too. So we had things like IWK Mental Health, we had uh, rehab, we had physio, and uh, cancer care came later. But certainly it's grown as the needs of the community have grown. And uh, not too many years ago now, uh, the new Cobequid Multi Service Center, now called the Cobequid Community Health Center, was built on its current site at the end of the lane called uh, Freer Lane after Shirley Freer. So there, it's got a big history and the, the amount of services that have been in there has continuously grown. And the important thing to note is that it's grown with the needs of the community. It's grown to the point where um, we do need to see some additional services. So Cobequid doesn't have any hospital beds. And people are either discharged or transferred to the infirmary, IWK, or Dartmouth General. And now, naturally, we know that the offload problems with paramedics and the number of people waiting in hospitals for placement elsewhere, like long-term care, Order. are problems. That Order. We'll take our 15-minute COVID break. Um, I thought I'd be able to uh, <laughs> um, do that more um um, before the minister answered, but the question seems to be coming, taking some time to formulate. So we need to take this break. So I apologize for interrupting the member, um, but we will resume in 15 minutes, which will be five, uh, six oh two.
Order, please. Uh, just before we resume, questions to the Minister of Health. I have two things uh, Zoom related to uh, say. Number one is when you are speaking, please don't forget to take yourself off mute. Even if you haven't muted yourself, uh, it's possible that Ledge TV has muted you because uh, they need to preserve the quality of the audio for the, um, the video. <laughs> the audio for the video. Secondly, for those of you who are asking questions, it would be great for the chair if when you're finished your question, you actually do put yourself on mute so that it signifies to the chair that you're finished your question and then I will recognize the um, minister. Cool? All right. So uh, I will now recognize the honorable member for sackville Cobbequid. Chair, it's, it's good to be back. I just want to continue with my uh, my preamble before I get into the questions to the minister. And it is around the Cobquid uh, Community Health Center. Uh, that will be the line of my questioning. I will have one question following my last question before I turn it over to my colleague from Coal Harbor uh, Eastern Passage. And that will be on doctor recruitment in my area. So I want to finish off before I get into my first question by the Cobbequid Community Health Center is located in Lower Sackville. For those of you who don't know, just off of exit uh, four on the 102, and that's where the Burnside Bedford Sackville connector will terminate. And it's close to the Stanfield International Airport, and it serves the growing areas of Bedford, Sackville, Waverly, Fall River, and beyond. So I'm sure there is so much more that uh, Cobbequid can do to and be used for to help the healthcare system. However, I haven't seen anything in the budget. A couple of years ago, there was an expansion of medical day surgery clinics, and uh, it was to provide follow-up care from multiple disciplines that were previously, or maybe even still, delivered at the Q, uh, QE2 Health Science Center clinics. And now they're provided here in uh, Lower Sapple. So there is room for expansion, uh, physically up and out, if you will, and also to provide for more services. Uh, I'm sure more can be done. When the QE2 redevelopment uh, talks took place, it talked about the Dartmouth General, it talked about Halifax Infirmary, Hospice Halifax, QE2 Cancer Center, Community Outpatient Center in Bearsley, Hans Community Hospital, the Dartmouth General Hospital, and, and yet there's nothing for the Cobequid Community Health Center. So my questions are going to revolve around this. My first one will have to do with the emergency department. So when we talk about uh, the closures of emergent depart emergency departments, Sackville does not have a 24-hour emergency. It's open daily from 7 a.m. to midnight. And uh, after hours emergency, people go to the infirmary, the Dartmouth General or IWK. In my opinion, it's about uh, the best functioning emergency department in the province, notwithstanding the services from others around the province. My understanding is that before the doors open in the morning, the staff need to be on hand. Also after midnight, there have been patients still in the emergency department sometimes until opening the next day. Again, staff are required to be there until the patients are either discharged or transferred. So with no hospital beds, they're either discharged again or in the offload problems that we have are causing problems with people in the uh, waiting here in the hospital for placement elsewhere. Um, you've got long-term care problems where inpatients are just waiting there. So I guess my question, my question to the minister is this, what is the process and timing to re-examine the possibility of making Club of Quick Community Health Center an emergency center department and at a 24 hour operation? Thank you. I recognize the honorable minister of health and wellness.
Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, thank the member for the question. So there is quite a bit of history uh, here with uh, this facility, and I do want to take a moment to thank uh, the member for um, uh, sharing with me uh, some information that I certainly uh, wasn't aware of in relation to the history of the Cobbequid uh, uh, Health Clinic. Um, and uh, thank him for his previous work on the uh, on the board there. I didn't realize that was where the member began his. Uh, that I wonder if that's where the, the member began his career in public service was in the healthcare sector in that way. No, it goes far beyond far far earlier than that. Okay. Um, anyway, very much appreciate the question. So uh, staff have informed me that there has been a review uh, over the last eight years um, that included uh, looking at demographics, population looking at staffing uh, facility capacity, and it was determined, and of course clinicians would have been involved in, in this review, um, clinicians would have been involved in, in the review, um, that to extend uh, the uh, capacity of the, or extend the uh, model of uh, the ED delivery uh, wouldn't be possible. I know they even looked at um, bringing in a dialysis uh, unit there, but it was it was deemed that the facility didn't have uh, the capacity for that. So I do know that there has been a, uh, a review done uh, on that that involved clinicians, and it was determined to uh, maintain Cobquid as a uh, as a community uh, community uh, health center. But I, I do believe that the uh, you know these reviews are fairly uh, continuous, fluid. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure the uh, the assessments of that facility and what its future holds uh, is, is not a uh, has has not been concluded on on all fronts. I recognize the honourable member for Sackville Cobbequid. Oh, thank you, Miss. Uh, thank you, the chair, to the uh, to the minister for that response. And yes, absolutely, uh, through successive governments, the the looking at 24-hour care emergency delivery. Uh, has been noted, and it is quite expensive. And uh, what the minister referred to about eight years or so ago led an expansion from 10 p.m. to midnight at a cost of about $1.5 million. So if you take that as a benchmark, uh, that's give you an idea of the cost to increase uh, if you can get the physicians, if you can get everybody else to do that work. So that is important that uh, with the process continuously needs to be renewed. And uh, you know, when I go back to the QE2 redevelopment, uh, I question because I didn't see it and I, I, I may have missed it. And if somebody can point it out to me, that'd be great. What the, uh, the actual uh, implications of having 24 hour care at Cobbequit would have been to the overall redesign. So, I'm also wondering if uh, the uh, Madam Chair, if the Minister is aware of any expansion or increased uh, mental health services at Cobbequid uh, Community Health Centre, whether they be through um, the department, uh, NSH, uh, I was going to say, I was dating myself, NSAHO, <laughs> but uh, uh, either through IWK or through the, um, through the authority. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness.
Uh, thanks, thanks, member, for the patience. Uh, I mean, he's he's got history and understanding of this facility very specifically that uh, that I don't have, but I am benefiting from uh, some institutional knowledge that I have around me. So, uh, in terms of the review that happened and the determination that uh, it would not be advantageous to extend the emergency uh, department to 24/7. Uh, I mean, based on the the information I've been able to gather, you know, quickly during this conversation, uh, it mostly had to do with the physical capacity uh, of the facility, not having uh, inpatient uh, capacity in particular, uh, and therefore uh, creating a situation uh, that could uh, impact efficiency of, of the ED service services there and creating uh, overcapacity in the, in the emergency department. So uh, that seems to have been the conclusion uh, at the time. Uh, so there are, there have been, uh, I'm told, uh, uh, various um, expansions of services uh, for the Cobbequid uh, Health Center. Uh, including uh, mental health and addictions. So they do have a team there and that team is, uh, there's no plan to to, to remove uh, that team. They will remain there uh, as well as lab services, um, occupational therapy services and physiotherapy services. Uh, so I think over time there have been expansions there uh, based on, on uh, what I'm being told. And as the QE2 redevelopment happens, there will be continual evaluation of the uh, uh, spaces that we have, which would include uh, Cobbequid. Uh, so there very well might be um, adjustments, changes, uh, enhancements to the services uh, that are provided there that we might not uh, know about right now, depending on what uh, the future holds and, and what those future analysis analyses uh, tell us. I recognize the honorable member for Sackville Cobbequid. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I thank the minister for expanding a little bit on that. It never occurred to me that there would be a reduction in services even contemplated at Cobbequid. Um, however, the minister, uh, Madam Chair, did not answer my question about the mental health services, whether IWK. Uh, he indicated that the current uh, system will stay in place, <clears throat> excuse me, but did not uh, touch on the IWK mental health, but uh, I'm not gonna go there. I'm not, I'll pursue that another way at another time. My last question, and uh, before I get into my final question, but my 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 question now around again, Cobbequid, and the minister's touched on it a couple of times and actually unprompted, he mentioned dialysis. So you know, people who are um, at the Cobbequid Community Health Center have been asking about dialysis. And, and by the way, uh, I, just uh, for the information, I was not only the on the board and treasurer of the initial uh, Cobbequid Community Health Services, Multi-Services Center. <clears throat> In recent years, up until 2012, I was chair of the foundation there. So I have a little bit of institutional knowledge as well. But when it comes to dialysis, um, we were considered, uh, Cobbequid was considered for dialysis. The need was great, as uh, the minister would be well aware, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, what's been decided is that there will be 24 dialysis chairs at, um, at the new center at Bears Lake, and that will open up in around 2023. My, my question is, why is it uh, that the Cobbequid wasn't uh, seriously considered? And I'm hearing, and I'd like verification on this, it seems to be that the reason for the services not going back to Cobbequid or being increased is because of the physical size of the facility, that uh, they don't have the space. Well, that's a good thing because the space was meant to be utilized. The building was built, my understanding, with capacity to grow and to grow up and to grow out. There's plenty of room there to do that. So I wonder if the, uh, Madam Spear, if the uh, chair rather, if um, the minister would speak as to what really the, the procedure would be to take a look at any service that might be contemplated for the Cobbequid Community Health Center and what the decision-making criteria will be if the space is not available, how, what do we do to go about getting more space? Thank you, Madam Chair. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness.
Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Madam Chair, and for the member for his patience. Evidently, there's a, a lot of history on uh, on this building that I'm, I'm trying to learn about uh, very quickly in the room here to answer the member's questions. Uh, so in terms of the IWK and the expansion of mental health uh, services there, there, there has been an expansion of eight mental health uh, clinicians at the IWK. And of course, they uh, also provide um, uh, community support at at least three different uh, facilities in Halifax, in, including Cobquid. So there were eight additional mental health clinicians that uh, that have been hired uh, for that. Uh, in terms of the dialysis uh, question, uh, which is where the bulk of the conversation uh, here has been uh, in the room to bring me up to speed on this, um, it was determined that the uh, that more beds were were needed. Uh, in in central zone, uh, they looked at uh, multiple sites. Cobbaquid was looked at. Uh, it was determined after a um, architecture, engineering, and and uh, cost analysis uh, that that uh, Cobbaquid was not the uh, most cost effective site, and there was also some uh, uh, potential difficulty uh, related to. Um, to architecture and, and, and engineering. And I believe that's related to the, uh, uh, the geography uh, of that location. Uh, so it was determined uh, then that the, uh, the chairs would be uh, built at uh, an attachment to Dartmouth uh, General. And so that's, that's what impacted the, the, the decision to build that new facility at Dartmouth General, which is, a, which, uh, uh, is brand new and is, uh, service, is in service uh, right now. Uh, but uh, Cobblequid was considered, uh, as the member I think recognized, there was no space within the facility itself to, uh, to put those, those chairs. Uh, so it was uh, analyzed to see if uh, an, an expansion of that building uh, was possible. Uh, but for various reasons, it was determined that that was a more uh, challenging site to uh, uh, to build um, those uh, uh, those chair spaces on. The honourable member for Sackville Cobblequid. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, through you, I thank the minister for that. Uh, that response. You know, I think uh, one of my objectives of asking the questions here this evening was to educate members on uh, just the, the the multitude, the multi-service aspect of this facility here in Sackville. And uh, it can be utilized much more and there's probably a, uh, uh, a case to be made for expanding services and expanding the footprint of that building either out or up. And just before I go on, I do want to, uh, in my former capacity as chair of of the board out there, um, I recognize former health minister whose name I cannot mention, and um, just uh, want to indicate that I had many um, meetings and occasions to be with him, and I always uh, welcomed him out in, in Cobbequid and Lower Sackville, and was uh, he was very well received and very gracious in his time to give to the to the board and to the facility itself. My last question before I pass it on to the uh, member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage is around doctor shortages and uh, recruitment and re uh, retainment and recruitment. In the, in the area of um, emergency services, for example, we were faced with a number of years ago on having more people coming into the facility that did not require as we would all recognize as true emergency service. And so we went into a whole big triage system. And also, too, just down the road next door, in fact, was built Cobbequid Center. And in there, we have a pharmacy and a walk-in clinic. And part of that was to take the load off the emergency. So that was done with private sector and, and done quite well. So just thinking about those things and how we can uh, reduce the number of people who are required to be serviced in the emergency center is, uh, is a good thing. But now we're seeing that reversal and because people don't have a family doctor. This time last year, my doctor of over 50 years who has been in the community, Dr. Tom Choi passed away. He was a family friend and uh, he was, as I say, my, my physician for close to 50 years, but he left thousands without, without uh, a physician. 
and his patients were suddenly left to look for another one. I looked at the stats in the waiting list as of February, just last month or the month before, in Sackville, it's 680. And uh, this time last year, it was 393. So we have an increase of 58%. And uh, that's probably, that may be understated because uh, people um, did not go to the waiting list and made some other arrangements are just not there. My question, Madam Chair, to the minister is, is he aware of any recruitment efforts uh, and what they might be out in the Cobbequit area at Lower Sackville, Bedford, Waverly Fall River, Lucasville, Beaverbank? Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness with a, just under three minutes left for the time for the PC caucus. We may not get an answer in those three minutes, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, we are going to run out of time here, so I'll provide the member with the information that I have. So they're currently, uh, the NSHA is currently um, actively recruiting for five uh, emergency department uh, positions uh, for which there's vacancy. So that is being actively recruited uh, right now. Um, we do have... Um, a list of also 17 new physicians that are coming to Nova Scotia from abroad, uh, who will be here for a number of areas, um, including uh, the Halifax area. So it, uh, they will have a say in terms of where they are uh, practicing in consultation with the with the health authority and physician services. Uh, and the majority of those will be. Uh, we do have a number of those that are actually coming this April. Uh, so we do have 17 uh family docs that uh are on the docket to get here uh very very soon i believe are these all from the uk are these all from the uk okay okay uh, sorry that includes that includes specialists as well there's some specialists in that number as well uh so we do have some new folks coming in including order specialists. please order please the time for the pc caucus has elapsed we will now move on to the NDP caucus and I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I wanna start off with um, a few, two clarifying questions. I wanna go, uh, I wanna go back to long-term care and CCAs, Madam Chair, to clarify the minister and the department are not entertaining the full compensation review of all long-term care roles, even though it is a vital, it is vital to retention and recruitment within the Department of Health. The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much. I, I feel I've answered this question sufficiently. So uh, out of our 90, out of our 90 facilities um, that are licensed, uh, there's only five that do not have unionized staff. So there is a collective bargaining process that is followed uh, with, with all of those uh, unionized staff. Um, and uh, we, will, we, will, we will follow that, uh, uh, that process. Um, 
um, I'm, I'm certain will be consulted uh, by the Department of uh, Labor Relations as we head into those processes. Uh, but uh, we will not be the department that uh, that leads that work for um, rationale that I've uh, previously uh, expressed to the member, but I, I will, I guess, reiterate uh, since she does keep asking the same questions. Um, so the reason we've established a Department of, of Labor Relations uh, is precisely so that the line departments whose responsibility it is to deliver services to Nova Scotians to uh, enhance uh, those services, um, adapt them to the changing needs of Nova Scotia so that our time is not spent in this continuous collective uh, bargaining cycle. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of bargaining units that we deal with in the, uh, with public sector unions. Uh, so that work is continuously happening uh, year over year. And uh, our previous premier uh, made a decision, um, particularly after we lived through, you know, a very real example in education where uh, the reform that we were the reform agenda that we were trying to bring to education was stalled because of collective bargaining, which impacted that service delivery to students in a, in a, in a real way. Um, you know, I think I, I would I would guess living through that experience and seeing uh, the distraction that happens from the core mandate of of these departments, which is on the service delivery and support uh, programming for people. Uh, it was determined to put another department uh, in charge of that. So that makes very good sense. Um, that was a, a wise decision. It allows uh, ministers like myself who are responsible for, you know, in, in the case of the health department, ha almost half or 40% of, of uh, provincial money uh, who oversees critical care for people uh, from when they're born to uh, when they're um, in our long-term care facilities and, and even on their deathbeds, it allows uh, me to focus on that, that service delivery um, and focus on the mandate letters that we have for, for change and adjustments uh, to these services. So uh, I, I realize that the member from, um, the member is very interested in, in labor-related questions. She's made that, that very clear. Um, I will say again, she's she is directing those questions uh, uh, in this case to, to not to the appropriate uh, minister. Um, and if the member does want to focus on uh, the uh, questions related to programming of the health department, um, service delivery uh, for health, mental health, long term care, uh, primary care. You know, that's where our, our time is uh, best spent. Um, this process was also made specifically to go over the budgets, uh, which is why this is called estimates, because we're, we're actually supposed to be talking about budget forecasts and, and budget line items. Um, and there's 40 hours in there in case people do want to go through line by line to give ample time for that. Um, so uh, I, I'm not sure what else I, I can explain uh, to the member on this, but uh, for very good reasons, for good rationale, um, there's another minister uh, responsible for the collective uh, bargaining process. Um, and uh, I think that's uh, a very good decision uh, that we made. Uh, that said, uh, recruitment and retention of our C CAs is absolutely a priority uh, for this department. And we're engaged in those initiatives uh, in, in very real and, and significant ways. Um, we have uh, financial support available through this department outside of the collective bargaining process to help those who are interested in training to become a CCA uh, do so uh, while reducing the financial uh, burdens to them. We have bursaries in place that uh, support our CCAs in the amount of $4,000. Uh, we have the recognizing prior to learning uh, uh, process, which uh, makes it easier for people that have applicable experience in this field to become uh, certified uh, as a CCA. Uh, and to practice. And we also waive the fees for that. Those are, it's an $800 fee. 
the workforce management uh, is important, uh, which is why we're bringing in a very important tool, uh, an effective tool that's going to help us uh, do this critical work for recruitment, retention, and and workforce planning through a man, uh, mandatory registry. Uh, that is going to be operated by a third party, the Nova Scotia uh, Health Association. And uh, there are the folks that, that currently oversee the voluntary uh, registry. Uh, we, uh, I know it was asked by the party about the privacy, so uh, I hope I've answered that question as well. The appropriate people in-house that uh, help us uh, ask and answer questions related to people's privacy, uh, including our legal team and our uh, privacy director uh, reviewed that legislation. And uh, these are the ways that the department uh, engages in uh, recruitment and retention and support uh, uh, for that workforce. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to assume the, then the answer is a no, Madam Chair. Um, I want to do another clarifying question um, with the Minister, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to, um, regarding home care, and it's because I, I still have not received a response from the Minister on this. So if the Deputy Minister, Dr. Oral, can tell us that Nova Scotians are waiting 35% longer to receive home care services, what are the current wait times that make up this 35%? Are, peop uh, are people waiting one month, six months, one year? That is what I'm asking, Madam Chair. What are the wait times for that 35%? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just to be clear, um, uh, the member put uh, words in my mouth that I that we do not care about uh, competitive compensation for staff that we're trying to recruit and retain. So I just want to clarify for the record that's that's not true. Um, and I certainly don't appreciate that uh, um, that um, characterization uh, of our. Uh, of our uh, discussion. Um, I'm simply pointing out the fact that we have a process uh, for collective bargaining um, and we, we, we follow that process. Uh, so of course, I believe that competitive uh, compensation is important. Um, I believe that financial support to uh, help on the training side and I believe that facilitating uh, the inclusion of people who have uh, applicable uh, lived and work experience uh, to the sector um, are, are all uh, are all good things. Um, uh, the member, I think, really does understand what my point is: is that she's directing uh, you know labor questions to uh, a minister that that uh, does not oversee uh, that process. But uh, I do not appreciate the characterization. Um, of uh, my stance on uh, compensation. So I wanted to clarify that uh, for the record. Uh, in relation to uh, Deputy Oral's uh, comments, uh, he was specifically uh, specifically speaking to the, uh, the wait list. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to ask if he was talking, if Dr. Oral was talking about the wait list, how long are people waiting? How long are people waiting on that list? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness.
Uh, so all of our uh, our uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the care coordinators of uh, of this system are in contact with uh, with clients uh, who are waiting for these services. Uh, again, the 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 wait times are not tracked. Uh, I'm told there's complexities with that because of the partial services and various factors that impact that. So those are not, uh, that's not something that has ever been tracked in the province uh, under, under, any, under any government. Um, but the uh, care um, workers uh, reach out to those clients directly to inform them uh, while they're waiting for services of the other uh, direct uh, funding uh, supports that are available for them to employ uh, their own uh, services or to provide the caregiver's benefit to a loved one that wants to uh, support that um, that individual uh, and also for supportive care uh, and other services as well as the home first services that are provided through the NSHA. So every um, uh, individual uh, in our home care uh, setting who is on the wait list uh, would have access to that information so that they can uh, uh, get that funding that's available through the NSHA and and uh, and through the department and or through the department. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'll move on. How many, I'd like to ask the Minister, Madam Chair, how many gynecologists are there currently in the province? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you uh, for the question, uh, Madam Chair. The answer is uh, 71 gynecologists currently employed in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, I would like to thank the Minister for that response. I would also like to ask the Minister, what is the current wait time to see a gynecologist outside of pregnancy? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. We, 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 we might not be able to produce that number uh, in the time that we have uh, left, so we'll make sure that we follow up with the member to provide her uh, with that information, because I do know we do require a few minutes to pass the resolution um, uh, at the end of this. So uh, that is something that if we do not produce in the next uh, couple of minutes for the member, we will ensure that she gets that info. Uh, just before I recognize the member from Cape Breton Centre, uh, Mr. Uh, Honourable Minister, we will not be reading the resolution tonight. More on that later, <laughs> just so you know. Um, the member for Cape Breton Centre, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, I'd appreciate um, that, that information when the minister is able to provide it. Um, so I would like to go on and ask the minister, um, Madam Chair, a few questions about uh, children, adolescent mental health care. The minister may know that there are wait times in the dozens and even hundreds of days for children seeking non-urgent care, Madam Chair. For example, at, at the Industrial Cape Breton Clinics, most people wait 66 days for the first appointment, and then 133 days for the second. At the IWK, the wait time website lists 37 days for the first appointment and 34 days for the second appointment. But antidotally, we have heard of, some, of someone who uh, was only able to get an appointment for their child three months from now. The minister might also know that there are virtually no private clinics that are taking on new children as patients, adding to another layer of complexity for those who are unfortunate enough, who are, I mean, I'm sorry, who are fortunate enough to have uh, coverage or ability to pay. All of this creates, of course, in incredible stress on families. My question for the minister is, what is being done to increase the capacity in our public clinics? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness.
I like to thank the member for the question. So there, there has been significant uh, improvements in the wait times um, for for the um, urgent and non-urgent uh, supports that are available for those with mental health issues. Um, the for the non-urgent, uh, the wait times did used to be uh, over a year uh, in the province. And we have brought that down to a medium, a median of uh, 26 days wait time for non-urgent cases, uh, and for urgent cases, the median wait is uh, is is two days. Um, I do have oh for Cape Breton. So comparing the wait times for 1920 to 2021 uh, for industrial Cape Breton, uh, the children and youth non-urgent median wait time was reduced by 73 percent. Uh, from 137 days to uh, 37 for non-urgent. And uh, that would be for child and youth. And for non-urgent adults in Cape Breton specific, the wait time was reduced. Uh, the median wait time was reduced by 86% from 209 days to 29 days. So there's been some demonstrable change um, uh, in this area on those wait times. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre with three minutes left. Okay, thank you, um, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the question, the answer from the Minister, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to go back a little bit and ask the Minister, um, what funding is allocated to the new endometriosis clinic at the IWK? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, we would we would have to uh, source that information uh, from the IWK, and we'll uh, endeavor to do that for the member. The Honourable Min uh, Member for Cape Breton Centre. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to ask the minister a question that our caucus uh, received. A constituent contacted us. To let, us, to let us know that according to this person, the Seniors PharmaCare phone line to pay this year's premium is perpetually busy. People want to be able to pay using their credit card, but no one is answering the phone and there is no on, uh, online way to do this and it would be very helpful to set this up. That was a, a, a direct quote, Madam Chair. Does the minister, I was wondering, Madam Chair, does the minister have any information about this? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness with one and a half minutes, please. I'm told that the uh, the mail out uh, does have a uh, spot on it where you can include the, uh, the credit card uh, information. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering if the minister has any information with regards to paying uh, by phone. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. We, we believe we, you can pay by phone, uh, but we can confirm that. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and to the Minister, and I'd like to ask, tell the Minister, that, uh, Madam Chair, through you, that you can pay by phone, but there, we're having issues, and are they doing anything to fix those issues, Madam Chair? Thank you. The Minister, Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Yeah, of, of course. Order, please. The time elapsed for questions for this evening has elapsed. I recognize the Honorable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that you, the committee do now rise and that you report progress and beg leave to sit again. The motion is carried. The committee will now rise and report its business to the House. After a 15-minute break.
Order, please. The chair of the committee of the whole on supply will now report. That the committee of the whole house on supply has met and made progress and begs leave to sit again. The honorable government house leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call public bills for second reading? We'll now call public bills for second reading. Mr. Speaker, would you please call bill number 95, the Parenting and Support Act? We'll now call bill number 95, the Parenting and Support Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I move that bill 95, an act to amend chapter 160 of the revised statutes 1989, the Parenting and Support Act, be now read a second time. The federal government has exclusive jurisdiction over marriage and divorce. The laws associated with these family matters are captured under the Federal Divorce Act. Provinces, on the other hand, have jurisdiction over family law matters involving parents who are not married or who are in common law relationship and are separating. Recent amendments to federal legislation have resulted in inconsistencies with the province's Parenting and Support Act as they relate to the same family law issues. Mr. Speaker, the changes we are introducing are about providing consistency to families regardless of their parental relationship. These will bring our law more in line with the federal law, which means that children and families will be treated similarly if the parents' relationships break down. Mr. Speaker, this is in the best interest of Nova Scotians and is part of our approach to improve access to justice. These amendments include removing the term custody from the act and replacing it with the terms decision-making responsibility and parenting time. This revised terminology describes parenting arrangements in more child-focused terms and will bring our act more in line with the Federal Divorce Act. We also believe that this is a step towards positive parenting arrangements. And Mr. Speaker, using the same parenting terms in both the Divorce Act and the Parenting and Support Act should make reading a court order easier for those who need to understand them, such as uh, administrators at schools, caregivers, and physicians. We'll make it clear that day-to-day -day decision making responsibility rests with the person who is exercising parenting time, unless a court otherwise orders. Nova Scotia's current parenting law says that the day-to-day -day decisions of the person with parenting time must agree with those of the person who has custody. What we're proposing is to change the wording regarding day-to-day -day parenting decisions in the updated Parenting and Support Act to better align with the new Federal Divorce Act. Mr. Speaker, the new wording will still let the court set out different day-to-day decision-making arrangements, if that is what is in the best interest for the child. For example, a judge could still order that certain day-to-day -day decisions be made by one parent and that the other parent must follow those decisions. Next, we're also proposing changes to relocation processes to better align with Canada's Divorce Act. Unfortunately, conflict can arise when one parent wants to move with their child. And these kinds of cases often end up in court. Mr. Speaker, our proposed changes will require the court to determine whether the move is in the child's best interest. We're also making changes to how parenting arrangements are decided in the child's best interest. When deciding which parenting arrangements are in the best interest of the child, our proposed changes will require courts to consider any civil or criminal proceeding, order, condition, or measure that is relevant to the safety, security, and well being of the child. This will help our courts deal with family violence issues more clearly and better protect the child. Finally, to protect children from the harmful effects of conflict, we're setting out the duties of parents and guardians when they're dealing with a family law issue. Under the act, the parent or guardian must act in the child's best interest and protect the children from conflict. They must try to resolve conflict through a dispute resolution process when appropriate, must give full current and accurate information to the court and tell the court about any civil or criminal matter that may relate to their family law issue, 
and obviously must follow court orders until they are no longer in effect. Mr. Speaker, these arrangements will help ensure families are able to more easily navigate family legal matters and not be burdened with the added stress of potential confusion of dealing with inconsistent laws. The changes will also work to better protect children with their best interests as a top priority. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to hearing from my colleagues as this bill moves through the legislative process. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour, no, pardon me, Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm pleased to offer a few remarks uh, to this bill this evening and act to amend Chapter 160 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Parenting and Support Act. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I understand that this legislation is intended to bring the Parenting and Support Act more in line with the Federal Divorce Act. The most substantive practical change is how proposed relocations of a child are considered depending on whether or if they are an existing court order in Clause 4 and A. The remaining will simply update languages to support positive parenting arrangements, such as changing uh, references to custody, to terms as parenting time or decision-making responsibility. Uh, it will make clear that day-to-day -day decision-making responsibility rests with the person who is exercising parenting time, unless a court otherwise orders. Uh, it will ensure courts have the information needed to make decisions about parenting arrangements to ensure the child's safety and best interests are the main considerations at all time. And it changes words and phrases such as maintenance to support, single woman to person, all changes that I certainly appreciate being made. Mr. Speaker, it is my understanding that the government consulted with Nova Scotians last spring, and we've been told that the feedback was uniformly supportive through consultation, um, and the, the few changes that was requested to be made were made. Um, as legislators, I believe it is our responsibility to ensure legislation always supports the best interests of children, and I look forward to listening to my colleagues and those who will have their voices uh, heard at law amendments. And in closing, Mr. Speaker, I will add, uh, as a single parent for many years um, who experienced much conflict in going through the process, um, I'm very, very pleased to see uh, this act and the wording of this act. So thank you so much. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm pleased to rise in support of this act um, and to, to follow on the words of my colleague from Queen Shelburne um, as we were listening um, to the minister uh, open debate on second reading. We were just having a little side conversation here and saying, um, it's difficult to even listen to the contents of this um, because we know that divorce is such a difficult time, um, even in the best case scenario, if, if there is such a thing. And so the easier that you can make these parenting and support um, arrangements, uh, the better it is um, for, for everyone. And so we are really pleased to see the consultation that went into this, um, to see the changes um, in this legislation, in any legislation, um, you know, when it can be updated to reflect changing family structures um, and to center the needs of children. We talk a lot about changing family structures um, and, and we know um, often in this chamber we're playing catch up and, and here is a place where we're doing that um, and, and we're trying to do it um, and, and the government has done it. We, we, we would say in this bill, really with uh, attention to the needs of the child, which of course um, is as it should be and, and is as it is in family law. Um, it also brings our act into alignment with changes made by the federal government. Um, and notwithstanding the consultation that was done, we certainly look forward to hearing from stakeholders at law amendments and anything uh, further they may have to say. Thank you very much. Time to recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice. It will be to close second reading on Bill Number 95, the Parenting and Support Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, my colleagues for uh, sharing uh, uh, 
perspectives and uh, certainly appreciate their support uh, for this uh, bill as it moves through the legislative process uh, and uh, very much appreciate uh, their acknowledgement and recognition of the consultation that took place. So I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, recognize the work of the staff uh, within the department uh, who uh, led that work uh, as well. Uh, so with that uh, and those few words, Mr. Speaker, I move to close a debate on second reading of Bill 95, the Parenting Support Act. The motion is for second reading of Bill number 95, the Parenting and Support Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please indicate aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill 95, an act to amend chapter 160 of the revised statutes 1989, the Parenting and Support Act. Ordered that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honorable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call bill number 97, the Electricity Act. We'll now call bill number 97, the Electricity Act. The Honorable Minister of Mines and Energy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I move that bill 97, an act to amend chapter 25 of the Acts 2004, the Electricity Act, now be read for a second time. Mr. Speaker, on Wednesday, I introduced amendments to the Electricity Act. These changes build on Nova Scotia's position as a national leader in the fight against climate change, creating more ways businesses and communities can adopt renewable energy sources. Our government has set one of the most ambitious greenhouse gas emission reduction goals in the country. By 2030, our emissions will be 53% below 2005 levels. By 2050, our emissions will be net zero. Mr. Speaker, more and more people and organizations want to be part of our cleaner energy future. That is why we have introduced amendments that will increase renewable energy use in our communities. These amendments will create new pathways to grow clean renewable energy sources. They will help grow the solar industry in Nova Scotia, creating more jobs in the green sector, and give communities and businesses more options to use renewable energy sources like solar. And all of this will be done while keeping rates stable for ratepayers. The amendments we've put forward will allow us to create a new solar program we're calling Community Solar. Community solar work program will reduce barriers to solar adoption for individuals, communities, and businesses in the province. The details of the new program are not yet final, though, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to consulting with communities and stakeholders to better understand their local concerns and their ideas. The details of the program will be finalized once the consultation process is complete. The general idea, however, is that under the new program, municipalities, First Nation communities, co-ops, not-for-profits can create community solar gardens, which will help reduce energy poverty and provide direct benefits to communities. <clears throat> These developments can make productive use of contaminated lands or existing buildings as the location for new solar firms. We want to reduce barriers to the adoption of solar electricity by removing requirements such as home ownership and access to capital. This means that those renting an apartment can adopt solar through a shared ownership model. This will build on the work we have already done, including the Solar Homes Program, to expand the use of renewable energy and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And there's more, Mr. Speaker. These amendments will also increase the current cap of 100 kilowatts per hour for non-residential customers using solar energy. It will allow these users to scale up their solar installations while still benefiting from the program. The new cap will be determined through the stakeholder engagement. The amendments we're introducing today will continue to expand the options for renewable energy and by creating an avenue for community-driven renewable energy projects. These amendments will not affect power rates for non-participants of these programs. That is something we are committed to. Last year, Mr. Speaker, the federal government and the province entered into a memorandum of understanding to help the federal government reach its goal of using 100% clean electricity in all federally owned facilities by 2022. As a result of the NMOU, the Green Choice Program was created and will help the province procure new renewable sources for electricity to meet the needs of federal government and other interests at large scale power customers. Earlier this year, we announced that the provincial government would also participate in the Green Choice Program. Our aim is to source 100% of our electricity needs from renewable sources by 2025, helping us achieve our ambitious climate change objectives. These amendments we're introducing today will continue to expand the options for renewable energy. Mr. Speaker, these amendments will translate into more jobs across the province. It will grow our clean energy economy. It will lead to more inclusive and equitable participation in clean energy. Most importantly, Mr. Speaker, it will build a cleaner energy future for every Nova Scotian. These changes will ensure Nova Scotia remains at the forefront 
the fight against climate change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to hearing comments from my colleagues opposite. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Good evening, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to speak on this bill this evening. Uh, Mr. Speaker, much remains to be determined with this bill. Um, I know the Minister had indicated uh, what he can this evening here, uh, but in terms of, of limits on the amount of energy, uh, the price is paid for it, and even the practical ability for people to take part in it. Uh, much of that has yet to be determined. So we don't know exactly what we are being asked uh, to support or what uh, this is going to look like in the end. Um, there's little said about economics. Um, I hope people are given a choice that is environmentally sound, but also sensible from a financial perspective. Uh, so that uh, anything that's aimed to be achieved here is viable. Um, I do think back to the COMFIT program. I know it's a program that this government ended. And um, I know that with the COMFIT program, um, we could have put more renewable energy on the grid for the same price if, if the goal was to really to add more renewable energy into our energy mix. Um, a lot of the fees under the COMFIT program were much higher than they needed to be because they were designed uh, more to support uh, community participation than they were designed to put the most green energy on the grid for the least price. So um, we, uh, we look forward to hearing more um, from uh, the public and uh, certainly uh, we presume this bill will be passing and uh, we look forward to seeing what the consultations uh, will show when, uh, when the time is taken for people to have their say and uh, what the government decides based on those consultations. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I can uh, agree with my colleague on one thing, which is um, that there's a lot that's not in this bill. Uh, I'm happy to speak uh, to uh, the amendments to the Electricity Act, um, and I will start by saying it sounds great. Um, it definitely responds to many requests from the solar industry, from communities that we've heard uh, directly in our caucus, that we've heard at committee over the years. Virtual net metering, lifting the cap for commercial installations, those are direct recommendations from CANSIA's Nova Scotia Solar Roadmap from January 2020, which they did present to the Natural Resources and Economic Development Committee. The ability for renters to access solar energy, which the minister spoke of, um, reducing energy costs significantly is absolutely a potential step forward in addressing energy poverty. Uh, but with that being said, we would like to see a more detailed strategy on eliminating energy poverty. Uh, we have tabled legislation many times in this House that would require a genuinely coordinated response to inequality and the need to transition to a green economy. One concern that prevails when speaking about policies that promise green jobs is whether the policies are designed to actually build the capacity of local industry. Will there be procurement policies that favor local companies? who may not be in the same place and almost certainly are not in the same place as companies from Ontario who have more ability uh, to access that market, who may have more experience, um, or will they find it a significant challenge to meet other bidding requirements like e-bonding? Program design is a particular concern after the failure of the Renewable to Retail program, which we discussed just the other day in this chamber, which promised to break up the power monopoly uh, and allow independent renewable retailers uh, uh, greater market access, but in fact didn't have a single subscriber. Um, in the case of another flagship renewable energy program, um, which the minister referred to, the Nova Scotia Green Choice Program, the government has actually appointed an American company, Customer First Renewables, to administer procurement. Uh, Mr. Speaker, was there a search for a procurement company in Nova Scotia or even in Canada that could have administered this program? If we really want to address the climate crisis, if we want to green the province, um, we need to do that all the way through the system, um, not just with programs, but with workforce, uh, capacity, procurement, uh, the whole nine yards. Um, and, and I will disagree with my colleague on consultation. Um, I have spent lots of time um, in this chamber arguing, uh, calling for more consultation. And, and on this, I actually don't think we need it. 
I think that uh, we would, of course, like to see the regulations. We would like to know what's in them. But I think it's long past time that we need to consult on whether we respond to the climate crisis. Um, there, what we have seen with uh, environmental legislation that comes into this house is that it sends good signals, it sounds really good, and it establishes a consultation period which either doesn't happen or never ends. Um, that's been the case with the Sustainable Development Goals Act, um, and it, it looks like it might be the case here, and, and that, that causes us concern. Um, when the Sustainable Development Goals Act passed in 2019, after hearing from dozens and dozens and dozens of presenters at a marathon law amendment session, uh, we spoke against the decision to put targets and regulations precisely because we would be going forward without goals in place in critical areas like this, like renewable energy, waste, local food, and land protection. We made every effort to amend the bill. Uh, to include that, uh, we were turned down, and nearly two and a half years later, we still don't have that, those targets, Mr. Speaker. Public consultation has not happened, and we have seen no timeline from this government. Um, so you can't blame us for being a bit skeptical. But one timeline we do have, Mr. Speaker, is from the IPCC. In 2018, we were all put on notice that we have a decade to radically curb emissions. This government has not responded with anything approaching urgency. This bill gestures in the right direction, but with the promise of consultation and no timeline before regulations are set, uh, we are concerned about what will actually come of it. I, I sincerely look forward to hearing from stakeholders at law amendments um, and from my colleagues going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Time to recognize the Honourable Minister of Mines and Energy. It will be the close second reading of Bill Number 97, the Electricity Act. The Honourable Minister of Mines and Energy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate comments from both of my honourable colleagues across the way, and uh, we take the, take them uh, into consideration and certainly seriously. I also look forward to uh, uh, what law amendments will bring uh, the presentations that will come from there and who we will hear from as we move forward. A lot has changed in the energy sector over the years. Certainly, uh, my uh, colleague from Inverness mentioned uh, the CONFIT program that was in place some years ago. Uh, much has changed uh, over the years in uh, pricing and building and how this whole new energy market works. It's quite amazing, actually. The more you learn about it, uh, the more interesting it becomes. I think there's a great future in renewables in Nova Scotia, and I look forward to being uh, part of that. So I'm excited about this, and I'm excited about hearing from those uh, who are stakeholders. I hope Law Amendments is, uh, is filled right up with folks who want to talk about this. So, Mr. Speaker, with those few words, I will move to close. Uh, second reading on Bill Number 97, an act to amend Chapter 25 of the Act 2004, the Electricity Act. The motion is for second reading of Bill Number 97, the Electricity Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please indicate aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill 97, an act to amend Chapter 25 of the Acts of 2004, the Electricity Act. Ordered that the bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honorable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 92, the Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act. We'll now call Bill Number 92, the Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act. The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. Uh, happy to move uh, second reading of this bill. Uh, as we discussed in estimates and as we discussed uh, previously, this bill will help us with workforce planning for our continuing care assistance. Uh, this will make having a uh, registry mandatory and registering with that registry uh, mandatory. Um, uh, right now, that registry for our CCAs is voluntary, and we do have less than 10% uh, of our staff that are registering, which does create uh, workforce management, recruitment and retention uh, challenges. So we, uh, this was a, a recommendation that came from the uh, long-term care expert uh, panel, and we're very pleased uh, to move forward uh, with this uh, in this session. And uh, we believe this will uh, go a long way in helping us uh, uh, better manage, recruit and retain uh, that critical workforce here in the province of Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour, Eastern Passage. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I am very pleased to have the opportunity to rise to speak on Bill 92, the Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the PC Party of Nova Scotia will be voting in favour of this act. Uh, as a matter of fact, we think it's such a good idea that we actually put it in our Dignity for Seniors plan that we released uh, almost a year, in, well, almost a year ago. Uh, we also raised this issue several times in the House, and uh, so we're very happy that it's coming forward. Although, in the words of somebody who texted me, and I want to get it right, um, this was literally the least amount of effort put forward into doing something from the long-term care expert panel that one could think of, but it's a step in the right direction. I hope I quoted them correctly. Anyway, um, what I do want to draw um, the, the House's attention to is the fact that the expert long-term care panel report was published December 21st, 2018. This is April 2021. It is almost embarrassing to have to talk to the people who wrote this expert panel report, Janice Keefe, Cheryl Smith, and Dr. Archibald, to say that it took almost three years to respond to a simple request to collect data. This is not going to bring more CCAs to the province. This isn't talking about additional pay. CCAs are the backbone of continuing care, home care. It is almost a billion dollar budget out of an 11 and a half and change budget. Almost 10% of our budget is, is, is dependent on having a sufficient workforce to look after the frail, the disabled. And this government took two and a half years to decide we're going to count how many we have, which is around 7,000 funded FTEs. The fact that we need approximately 4,000 more uh, is an estimate. We don't know because the government did not collect the statistics. Why does it matter? Well, Mr. Speaker, it matters because we have over 30,000 home care clients. We have over 9,000 long-term care clients. And because of the changes in the rules to home care, you have to be much sicker to get home care, and you, in fact, have been getting fewer hours of care each year over the last four years. It's down from approximately 104 hours per year per client down to approximately 95 hours per year. And for those who aren't aware, each Nova Scotian who is eligible for home care can get up to 100 per month. And I know, because I used to run a home care physiotherapy and OT company, and I worked with these amazing continuing care assistants on a daily basis, that the level of frailty of seniors in this province has steadily increased because they're having to wait longer to get their home care, longer to get into long-term care because we've changed the rules because of the wait lists. So we are having over 30,000 people getting, according to the NSHA's by the numbers, 2,933,955 hours of care. That takes a lot of CCAs. These are people who have a back-breaking job. Bathing, dressing, toileting, feeding, transferring. And that's just the very basic of care. Brushing their teeth. Those are the very basics. Making sure that this person is getting the nutrition and the change in position that they need to reduce pressure sores, to make sure that their mental well-being is looked after. And Mr. Speaker, given COVID-19 and the impact that it has had on the profession of CCAs, normally under this government for the last eight years, approximately 600 CCAs were trained each year. Last year, less than 300. Kudos to the NDP government. They brought in the CCA grant program, and under their, their watch, over 1,000 CCAs were trained every year. Right at the moment, and I, and I will applaud them, right at the moment, 
We have undertrained every year by a minimum of 400 CCAs at the same time as the senior tsunami has been increasing to where in 20 years we'll have twice as many seniors. So if right now we have approximately 1,500 people waiting for a long-term care bed and this government built zero long-term care beds during their past two terms, we are never going to have enough long-term care beds for the people who need it. We are not going to have the staff that we need if we don't even know how many we have. One of the things that came out in the long-term care report, the Minister of Health at the time asked the expert panel to indicate a recommended staffing level for long-term care. The one thing that everyone was waiting for at that press conference was that number. And I was there that day. And I was there when Janice, who I have the utmost respect for, said, we don't have enough data to make that determination. We cannot base it off of other provinces because they have a different level of frailty going into their home care, going into their long-term care, which is why I introduced the Frailty uh, Act in this legislature so that we could make sure that we have the information and the data that is needed. One of the other things that we learned during public accounts, because we didn't get the information during health committee when we were talking about long-term care, is the deputy minister sent us a letter dated April 1st, 2021, on a request to answer how many people were waiting for home care. So try to imagine we have over 30,000 frail seniors needing to be bathed, dressed, given their medication, fed, toileted, transferred, moved, so that they don't develop pressure sores. Well, right at the moment, according to the week ending March 19th, 2021, we have a total of 1,396 people in Nova Scotia waiting for home care. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, one of the reasons I ran for this position here now is that over the years that I've been a physiotherapist, I saw every time I would go to a home that home care staff were showing up less and less often. They leave my mother's after 20 minutes. They get her in, get her a shower, get out. They're gone in 20 minutes. They bill my mother for an hour and they're on to the next person. And I can't blame them. They are so short staffed that, that so much of the time on evenings, weekends, holidays, there is no one to show up. The other day, a home care worker left a 100 year old woman who had already broken one hip and another hip and a fractured wrist, left her home by herself and left 20 minutes early to go on to the next appointment, leaving the door unlocked. There are two patients in my constituency where the CCAs left on a Friday, they canceled on Saturday, they canceled on Sunday, they showed up on Monday morning and they were on the floor from Friday. I could go on for hours about the stories of home care canceling because there is no one. And I know because I call all of the home care agencies to talk about the issues because I'm getting those calls from around the province on a regular basis, but I worked with these staff and they're frustrated. There isn't enough of them and many of them don't have a car, so they're relying on public transportation and you can imagine what a nightmare that was during COVID-19. So Mr. Speaker, while I applaud the Registry Act as a baby step towards just counting how many people we need. It doesn't talk about regulating the profession. I did ask during the bill briefing if CCAs themselves were consulted, they weren't. The employers were, Department of Health and Wellness was consulted, but the CCAs themselves weren't consulted. And having worked at Ocean View Manor for six months during the pandemic, where nobody took a break, everyone was run off their feet, these staff deserved to be consulted. The PC Party of Nova Scotia, given that we have four health professionals, knows 
that the people who have the answers are the people providing the care. The long-term care expert panel tried to be their voice. It took two and a half years just to decide to count the number of CCAs that we have, just to count them. Right now, there are a whole lot of other recommendations from the long-term care panel that have not been done. Important things that are actually checked off when they have not been done. So I asked the Deputy Minister of Health during Health Committee on long-term care. Where is the long-term care strategy that was promised in 2015? If you go to the government website from 2015, it says we will have a plan. In 2017, it'll be a five-year long-term care plan. There is no plan. In healthcare language, we use S-O-A-P, subjective. What are people saying? Objective, what are the measures that you're looking at? Analysis, how much do we need? Is it working what we're doing? P is plan. In 2015, six years ago, this government said they would have a plan. Deputy Minister at the Health Committee said there is no plan. When I asked the Minister of Health, where's the plan? He said, oh yeah, we have a plan. I said, no, I think you should talk to the Deputy Minister because he said on camera, there is no plan. The Deputy Minister did say that he was relying on the expert panel's recommendations, and I agree with that. Every single recommendation in here, if you had talked to any health professional providing home care, providing long-term care, any family member looking after a senior who's trying to figure out how to get their family member around the corner into a bathroom where the doorway isn't big enough for the wheelchair and they can't get a government grant to make renovations because they earn uh, $50 over the limit, knows that you need a plan. This isn't a plan. This is, we're gonna count how many bodies we have. There's no indication as to why people were not filling out the registry. We know it was voluntary. You would have thought that there would have been an effort to increase those numbers. It was free, with the exception of one time. Why did people not fill out that registry? You must need to ask that. Mr. Speaker, one of the things that we know is that there was a Nova Scotia Continuing Care Assistant Program Advisory Committee CCAPAC, Terms of Reference, published February 2016. The committee shall establish an annual slate of meetings in sufficient frequency or action of responsibilities. One of the things on there that this role of this committee was providing governance for the CCA registry. If you Google this now, it takes you to nowhere. There is no reference to this committee or what they accomplished. This was five years ago. Mr. Speaker, every healthcare professional out there knows exactly what happens when you can't get off the toilet by yourself. We have a saying in physiotherapy, you can no longer live by yourself when you can no longer stand up by yourself. CCAs, are the ones who are most often at the end of that buzzer when someone presses the button. Right now, the Homes for Special Care Act says that in the regulations there is a specified staffing level that must be maintained. This would apply to CCAs. We need to know how many you have, because if you're gonna mandate how many should be there, you need to know how many you've got and how many you need and how many you can actually supply. We have no idea how many of these CCAs are full-time, part-time, but I can tell you that a majority of them, or perhaps not a majority, but a huge number, are working two part-time jobs for two different owners, not having any benefits, haven't had a pay raise in years. It's insufficient to keep them in the workforce. The recidivism rate, before they've even graduated, 
is far too high. The CCA grant program that should have been brought back to match what the NDP had done eight years ago should have been brought back to make sure that all CCAs got that grant until such time as we had enough people to make sure that my mother wasn't getting a shower in 10 minutes and then leaving before they could do the other things that they were supposed to be there for. And trust me, when I call the owners of those continuing care assistant companies, I've worked with every one of them. They all have tremendous respect for their clients. But when I call and say, you know, can you explain to me why it's a different CCA every time they show up? Meaning that the family member now has to go through the entire care plan and say, this is how Marjorie gets her medication. This is when she gets her meal. This is how you transfer her. I even joined the VOM board of directors to try to help with a staffing issue because we had a situation where one nursing home, where there was a private home, had one VON come in to see one person in the morning and a different VON come in in the afternoon. We do not have a continuity of care in the CCA system. We have thousands too few of the CCAs. The injury rate in long-term care is higher than construction it's higher than any other profession. And I know because I treated them as a physiotherapist as well. And when you get injured and can't do a standing pivot transfer or safely do a two-person transfer from bed to wheelchair, you're out of a job. During COVID-19 at Northwood, their staffing level dropped to 60% at one point. I know this for a fact. So in case anybody says that's not true, I know it for a fact. There was a crisis there that did not get responded to as quickly as it should have. But one thing did happen that gives us a glimmer of what is possible is the fact that when some people from Northwood recover from COVID-19, thank God, they were moved into a hotel. And I happened to speak to a CCA, and I said, tell me, you worked in that hotel, what was it like? They said it was fantastic. And I'm like, well, that's the first time I've heard that, tell me why. They said, one staff to every four residents. Physio and OTs were there, anytime they needed it, they got the equipment they needed. They didn't have to do what I did at Ocean View, which was to take a wheelchair, dunk chair from that person to give to this person because this person became more frail from a fall and now their need outdid the other person. Physicians were always there on site. Uh, a few years ago, I don't remember the exact date, it was Christmas, it was the same day as the Premier was making an announcement at Dartmouth General uh, on the grand opening of the orthopedic wing where two long-term care facilities in Truro area, DeBert, they lost their physician. And the long-term care facilities made the extraordinary decision to say, if you are living in our long-term care facility and go to the hospital, you can't come back because we don't have a physician who can readmit you. So not only are our CCAs struggling with overburdened workloads, they are also required to do the work without the same oversight from the physiotherapists, from the occupational therapists, from the social workers, from the psychologists, and from the physicians, because so much of the work is being done virtually. You'll call a physician who's never seen the client to make a life-altering decision to perhaps put somebody in a wheelchair for the rest of their lives. And trust me, the CCAs who have to bring that issue forward do so with the greatest of care and concern for the family member as well as the resident, knowing that many of the decisions that they have to make impact not only one's quality of life, but the duration of one's life. Our CCAs are there with our residents in long-term care until the day that they die. They are often there with them when they pass away. 
It is a very challenging profession. It is a specialty that has not been recognized by this government, by this province, but I can tell you from working with them that they are equal partners in the health care of our frailest members of society. Mr. Speaker, one of the things that they need from us is they need greater support to get through their training. We have far too many quitting the program. We had programs that were canceled because there weren't enough registrants. If the trend of only training 300 a year persists, we are going to not be able to fill the long-term care beds that we have. We are not going to have the home care that we have now. And the home care that we have now has got over 1,300 people waiting. So Mr. Speaker, we have a responsibility to the seniors and those who are disabled in our province because it isn't just seniors who get home care. There are a lot of people who are younger who need home care as well. And if you were following Facebook during the pandemic, there were younger people who were posting online the fact that they were being put to bed by their CCA at six o'clock at night because that's the only time they could get someone to show up. I have another constituent who literally has me on speed dial and when she calls, I'll get up and go down to her home who gets her breakfast from a CCA at 11.30 and then the next CCA shows up at 12 noon to give her her lunch and she's got to take her diabetic pills then and there. These stories are not one-offs. These staff deserve much better. One of the things that the unions asked for, in addition to the minister himself who said, I need a staffing ratio, tell me what you think, the unions happily stepped forward and during the long-term care committee meeting said 4.1 hours of care per resident per day in long-term care. The Progressive Conservative Party of Nova Scotia said deal. We're not going to discuss it anymore. We're not going to wait till this government counts the number of CCAs. Right now it's 2.6 hours of care per senior per day in long-term care or 3.1. And why would it be different? That's a very good question. Because if you think the amount of care that's offered in each nursing home is standardized across the province, guess again. There is a, a report coming forward to the MLAs showing the discrepancy in care of the number of physios and OTs and physio assistants and OT assistants around the province. There are some nursing homes that have a perfect ratio of rehab staff to residents. And then there are places that have almost nothing. There are those who have great access to air mattress beds to reduce pressure sores and those who don't. And there is a domino effect every time the government makes a decision. So I'll go back to when I referenced the fact that in Truro and DeBert, they lost their physician. And they weren't going to be allowed to come back to the long-term care facility because they didn't have a doctor to readmit them. The government's response was to make an announcement of an extra $1.3 million for the conversion of um, the residential care beds at a facility in Halifax into long-term care beds. So they were missing a doctor in Truro, DeBert, and so the announcement was, well, let's convert some beds from residential to long-term care. We needed to convert them because you're not allowed to get into long-term care until your frailty level is so much more advanced than it used to be, that now the level of acuity for our CCAs to look after people has dramatically increased, well above their training level, by the way, Mr. Speaker, because I have done training with the CCAs. I have taught the back care and lifting class to the CCA program. I'm well aware of what is in their training. Many of them and many of the, the programs were never designed for frailty levels 8, 9, and 10 exclusively. They were designed for frailty levels 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So you'd have some light acuity frailty level. 
to balance out the heavier lifted patients. Now you go into those long-term care facilities and the le level of frailty and transfer and the acuity needs of these clients has dramatically increased and these CCAs were not trained for that. And many of them are much younger now than they used to be and they don't have as much practical life experience as some of the older CCAs. And so we have to give them the staffing ratio that they need. So 4.1 hours of care per resident per day is the recommended by all of the unions, by the CCAs themselves, and the PC Party of Nova Scotia is committed to that, Mr. Speaker. One of the other things that we are committed to is that the CCAs deserve to be able to work in an environment that is safe. Right now, we have CCAs working in hotels. We've got long-term care patients work, living in hotels. I can't get over uh, the fact that we have reached that point. But we wanted to get them out of hospital beds. Well, CCAs work in the hospitals as well. And there is an insufficient number of them there as well. So one of the things that happened during COVID-19 that we don't talk about very much is that CCAs got diverted from home care to long-term care. So I'm the one who got those phone calls from around the province saying, Barbara, they're canceling my home care because they don't have any CCAs. Oh, well, you're on your own. That never got restored to the level that they were at before. So we can talk about wait lists and wait times, but what has happened, and people don't want to admit it, but the stats that NSHA by the numbers shows it, is that fewer Nova Scotians are getting home care, and that same number are getting less hours. That is not an expansion. That is not an investment in our seniors, in our CCAs, and at a billion dollar investment, the least this government could do is know how many staff they have for each of the professions. So Mr. Speaker, of course, the PC Party of Nova Scotia will be voting in favor of this bill. It was in our health care plan for the province. I hope the government will take a look at the rest of our plan and literally take all of it and implement it because there is an awful lot in there that subscribes to the planning, the long-term care strategy, the home care strategy that our Nova Scotian seniors deserve. And I'll look forward to hearing what they have to say at law amendments. And I would encourage any CCAs or anyone else who uh, has a vested interest in this bill to come forward and speak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I am uh, glad to say a few words uh, on Bill 92, an act to establish a registry for continuing care assistance. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I was very glad to learn today from the Minister that there will not be any fees associated with this registry that the CCAs will have to pay. I understand it's intended to support workforce planning and that it comes from a recommendation in the Minister's Expert Panel Review on Long-Term Care. CCAs providing, uh, who provide the bulk of personal care for older and disabled Nova Scotians are essential workers, Mr. Speaker. And I believe that Nova Scotians understood this before the pandemic and they understand it now. But CCAs face incredible workplace challenges, as do many of the workers in continuing care. Low wages, high injury rates, burnout, and more. And the system overall has many challenges with recruitment and retention. Experts agree that one of the key measures that would vastly improve working uh, and living conditions in long-term care is establishing standards of minimum care, specifically 4.1 hours per resident per day, as is outlined in the NDP's Care and Dignity Act. Yes, it is. <laughs> Our caucus... Uh, Absolutely would have welcomed changes that, that brought in 4.1, uh, min, uh, the minimum standards, standards of 4.1 hours uh, per day, per patient per day, per resident per day, I should say. Um, but it seems like that's not going to happen in this legislative session, and it's not a government priority, which we've heard uh, throughout the estimates process. Shame. 
But of all the things that it could, could have been done to attract and retain CCAs during this time, implementing those standards of care would be one of the best ideas. So, of course, this registry will track and, and count CCAs, and that is fine, and that is good, and it's important. But that does not get us at the key issue. There are simply not enough CCAs, and they aren't being compensated at a level that will attract enough people to that profession. The minister said that this, this, this bill will go a long way to uh, re, uh, retaining, to attracting and retaining, uh, recruiting, excuse me, and retaining new CCAs. Well, you know what else would go a long way? Paying CCAs what they're worth. <laughs> Paying them what they're worth making sure that there's enough of them so that they don't all have to be working overtime and on evenings and weekends and holidays, as my colleague suggested, and that they, would, that they won't have to endure physical injury for the stress of the job that they're, that they're doing. So pay them more, make sure that there's a way, uh, make sure that there's minimum standards so that, they, so that they are able to actually do their job and want to be doing their job and make sure that they're yeah compensated at a level that will make the the profession more attractive to more people so in any case i'm not that's all i'm going to say for t tonight uh, mr speaker it's a second reading and i really look forward to hearing from stakeholders at law amendments and discussing this legislation with them and with the, this house um, and also discussing what more we can do to support ccas in our province thank you very much the honorable member for cape breton center Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and here, here to my colleague. <laughs> I am, <I'm, laughs> Mr. Speaker, I am, I'm happy, I'm glad to speak to Bill 92. I, I think the idea of tracking our CCA uh, workforce for the purpose of planning is a fine idea, but it's certainly not the most pressing issue facing the workforce, as my two colleagues who've spoken before me have stated. Wages and, wages and recruitment and intention go hand in hand. They are completely intertwined, like peanut butter and jam, Bert and Ernie. They, they certainly make a pair. <laughs> I do have a two-year-old, yes. Not even yet two. But the ongoing wage for unionized CCAs is 16 to $17 an hour. And non-unionized CCAs make less than that. It is shameful, Mr. Speaker. These are the people who are at the very front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic, whom we called heroes, whom we applauded every night, Mr. Speaker, who provide so much of the critical care that Nova Scotians rely on, and yet we give them lip service. The Nursing Homes Association of Nova Scotia has asked the Department of Mental Health and Wellness to conduct a full compensation review of all roles in long-term care. And I would urge the government to consider this as well as they, as they go about their workforce planning. I look forward to hearing from Nova Scotians at law amendments. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I will take my seat. Thank you. Time to recognize the Honourable Minister of Health. It will be to close second reading on Bill Number 92, the Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I do want to thank uh, the parties in the House for all supporting this bill. Uh, I do want to correct a, a couple statements that were made. Uh, the member for Eastern pa Cole Harbour Eastern Pastors did mention that utilization of home care did drop uh, in 2020 during the pandemic year. Uh, that is true. Um, that did drop by approximately 15%, uh, one percent of which was related to agencies canceling because of staffing issues. Uh, Fourteen percent of that drop was related to the clients themselves actually canceling, uh, presumably because uh, they were taking additional safety measures to prevent people from coming into their house. Uh, so su to suggest that is because there has not been increased resources or increased support. Uh, in the home care sector uh, would be uh, completely inaccurate. In fact, we have uh, increased the budget in a, a lot of ways. We've gone over that in estimates, uh, particularly in the self-directed uh, funding. And we've seen utilization uh, improving uh, on these new programs uh, that we do have uh, in place. Um, uh, of course, uh, compensation is important for recruitment and retention, uh, as well as uh, data keeping. And uh, our wages are in parity with the rest of the country. So uh, there, is, there is wage parity here in Nova Scotia with other jurisdictions across 
uh, the country. And we do, of course, have a process uh, by which those contracts um, are, are negotiated. Uh, and at the end of the day, this is one of many steps that we're taking to improve our long-term care and home care uh, programming here in Nova Scotia, including the creation of new beds in our long-term care facility, replacement of, uh, of old beds, as well as enhancing uh, the options that are available to seniors who are able to stay uh, at home. And of course, uh, it would be remiss of me to not mention uh, the great work that our staff has done to prepare a long-term care facility to meet uh, waves two and three of COVID-19 and keeping that virus out of our long-term care facilities. And that's a direct result of following the IPAC recommendations and the Northwood recommendations, which undoubtedly have saved lives in our long-term care facility uh, over the course of the last year. So I wanna thank everybody for the great work they've done in doing that. Thank our CCAs for the great uh, challenging work that they take on on behalf of all of us. And I uh, really look forward to getting this registry in place because we know uh, long-term it is gonna help us with workforce management, recruitment and retention as these registries have done for other professions here in Nova Scotia. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, move to close the debate on second reading of this bill. Thank you. The motion is for a second reading of bill number 92, the Continuing Care Assistance Registry Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please indicate aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 92, an act to establish a registry for continuing care assistance. Ordered that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honorable Government House Leader. Uh, thank oh. you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call third readings? Actually, just before we do that, sorry, uh, it is time for our mandated 15 minute COVID break. The House will resume at 8. 
Order, please. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call public bills for third reading? I now call public bills for third reading. Mr. Speaker, would you please call bill number one, the Police Identity Management Act? I now call bill number one, the Police Identity Management Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that bill one, the Police Identity Management Act, be now read and do pass. Mr. Speaker, I would like to first recognize the families and survivors who continue to grapple with the events of last April. As I've said before, their pain and loss remain with me and I believe with all Nova Scotians. I'd like to thank my colleagues from all parties for their remarks and support of this bill thus far in the legislative process. I shared an overview of this bill in the second reading, so I'll try not to repeat all of those details here tonight. In short, the Police Identity Management Act further restricts someone from being able to access items that would facilitate the impersonation of a police officer. Mr. Speaker, limiting interactions and dealings with these items will further limit potential risk and improve public safety. I appreciate that there's no way to entirely eliminate all risk, but I do believe that these restrictions will mitigate against the most significant risks. When passed, Mr. Speaker, this legislation will be the first standalone comprehensive piece of legislation in the country restricting the use, sale, reproduction, and possession of police articles. Our ultimate priority is to make our streets and communities safer, an objective I believe all members in this legislature share. Thank you and look forward to hearing remarks from my colleagues. The Honourable Member for Queens, Shelburne. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to offer comments to third reading of Bill 1, an act uh, respecting the management of police identity to prevent unlawful activity. Mr. Speaker, as stated in my remarks at second reading, I and my progressive conservative colleagues are very pleased to see uh, this bill, a bill that uh, we have been calling for since the terrible senseless tragedies in, in Porta Peak that shook Nova Scotians to the very core last April. A tragedy that our province lost 22 beautiful, innocent souls, and we will forever be heartbroken. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the delay of this legislation being introduced um, was disturbing to me, and, and we are blessed that this delay has not resulted in more tragic incidents. And I mentioned at second reading what happened a few months ago in Antigonish when a man was arrested for impersonating a police officer, which again uh, involved the use of a vehicle that resembled those used by the police. So, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm, I'm very relieved that we're finally here today. Um, I also would like to thank the brave men and women who, with courage and compassion, put on a uniform every day, willing to sacrifice their lives for us. These officers make a huge difference in the communities in which they serve and make tremendous sacrifice each day. I cannot even begin to imagine the fear of our officers responding to a call that involves searching for a suspect impersonating their colleague with a fully functional vehicle. This bill will increase public confidence that when we seek out a police officer for help, it is actually a police officer. It is my hope that these steps, that this legislation will prevent such steps, or sense, uh, sorry, will prevent such events as what we endured as a province in April. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I too would like to acknowledge the grief and trauma suffered by those who lost loved ones in the events of last April. We are united in grief and our hearts continue to hurt with you. Wherever a beautiful soul has been, there's a trail of beautiful memories. And I pray that you find solace in those memories. Mr. Speaker, the Progressive Conservative Caucus will be supporting Bill 1. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to stand and speak very briefly on this bill. I think this is common sense legislation. Um, it's legislation that in retrospect we realize should always have been in place. Um, it's necessary, it's reasonable pr to protect public safety um, and we absolutely support it. Uh, and it's absolutely only the first step 
in starting to grapple with the events of a year ago that really have cast a pall over this session and and over our lives as we deal with COVID as well. Um, I, I do look forward um, to uh, being able to reconcile with, with some of what happened through the work of the Mass Casualty Commission um, and, and, and other processes uh, that are ongoing um, to, to really ensure um, that we find the, the roots of what happened uh, and ensure it never happens again and, and do justice for those families. Um, but to this bill, it makes sense. We're glad to see it come forward. We're happy to support it. I'm to recognize the Honorable Minister of Justice. It will be to close third reading of bill number one, the Police Identity Management Act. The Honorable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, in short, uh, I would like to uh, again uh, offer my, my thanks and appreciation for my colleagues in the legislature, uh, again, of all parties uh, for their uh, comments on this bill, in particular uh, their comments in support of the bill, uh, but also in uh, their recognition, uh, shared recognition in the um, work done by our, our frontline um, officers and other uh, people who respond in times of emergency, uh, as well as uh, the condolences shared uh, to those who have been most directly impacted uh, by the tragedy. Uh, so again, uh, I think this piece of legislation, uh, as my colleague uh, mentioned, was common sense legislation. Uh, I think uh, the approach and the response of uh, the members of the legislature showed that uh, common sense legislation can move through uh, the legislature um, with unanimous support. And I really appreciate that. And with that, uh, I do move to close debate on Bill 1. The motion is for third reading of bill number one, the Police Identity Management Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please indicate aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill one, an act respecting the management of police identity to prevent unlawful activity. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 23, the Adoption Records Act. We'll now call Bill Number 23, the Adoption Records Act. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, move, I move that Bill Number 23, an act to open adoption records in Nova Scotia, be now read a third time and do pass. Mr. Speaker, I'm so pleased to be here today before both virtual and in-person members of this House to talk about our legislation that will create more access to adoption records in Nova Scotia. Now, Mr. Speaker, I know this will disappoint you, but I'm not going to take us through all through the history of adoption records in Nova Scotia because I've already done that a couple of times, but I will just have a few remarks. I will remind my colleagues that an attempt was made previously in the early 2000s to amend the 1996 Adoption Information Act, but it was abandoned. And after that, no government was willing to open the issue. But we know that opinions and ideas about the circumstances surrounding adoptions have changed over time. We heard this through our consultations with Nova Scotians over the last couple of years. And in those consultations, we heard that people were not happy with the laws that stood. In fact, 82% of respondents indicated that they did not feel the Adoption Information Act, first passed in 1996, 25 years ago, they felt that the act did not provide them with enough access to identifying information. Mr. Speaker, in addition to public consultation, we partnered with the Association of Black Social Workers in the spring of 2020 to conduct targeted engagements with the African Nova Scotian community. We also received feedback from Mi'kmaq bands regarding open adoption legislation. Their impact on this bill was significant. And I'm grateful that Scott Pike and Monica Kennedy from the Nova Scotia Adoptee Advocacy Group have been such strong advocates on this issue. Their input was instrumental in the creation of this piece of legislation. And I was happy to receive feedback from the KMKNO as well as my colleagues here at the legislature as we worked to strike the appropriate balance within this act. We took all the comments seriously and I believe as a result the bill is stronger. 
Mr. Speaker, I want to again assure the members of this House and indeed all Nova Scotians that this legislation was created with the utmost consideration for those who will be affected. I know this is a deeply sensitive and personal matter for many people. Throughout this process, I've heard many people's stories, all heartfelt and some heartbreaking. I believe the new act strikes the right balance between meeting the needs of those who want open adoption records and those who want to maintain their privacy. And with this in mind, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to again outline key aspects of the act. What this bill does, Mr. Speaker, is flip the onus. Just as we did with the Organ Donation Act, consent will now be presumed, but parties to an adoption can opt out. And they can do this in a couple of ways. One method is a disclosure veto, and this is a document that a person will file with the government stating they do not want to share information that can identify them. Disclosure vetoes will be available to all adoption records in Nova Scotia. It doesn't matter when the adoption took place. And this is in line with what we heard in our consultations. 65% of survey respondents felt that all adoptions should be treated the same, no matter when they happened. Another method for opting out is through a contact notice. Now, there are several different ways to use one, but basically a contact notice allows an adult adopted person or birth parent to indicate they're willing to share identifying information, but they don't want to be contacted. Or a contact notice can indicate they're open to contact, but they wish to spell out how they want that contact to occur. And the registrant can choose to remove or change their contact notice at any time, and it expires upon their death. Mr. Speaker, anyone who does not want to share their identifying information can file a disclosure veto to confirm their design to maintain privacy. And this includes those who previously did not consent to their information being released. When they're filing the disclosure veto, the person will be encouraged to provide a statement detailing their reasons or re their reason or reasons uh, for wanting privacy. They'll be asked to update medical information and to provide such additional non-identifying details as they may wish to share with the other party to the adoption, for example, cultural, racial, linguistic, family history, or even personal interests. This information can have a significant impact on the person receiving the updates and their children. My department will also have supports in place so that Nova Scotians can access the help they may need to process the new information they receive. As I've mentioned before, Mr. Speaker, these changes will take full effect in the spring of 2022. And this will allow people the opportunity to learn about the new legislation and to file disclosure vetoes or contact notices if they so wish. It will also give us time to expand our programming so we can better support Nova Scotians through this process. Mr. Speaker, this is an important step forward for adoptees and their families. This legislation recognizes how attitudes toward adoptions have changed. It supports privacy for those who wish to keep their information confidential. It provides supports and services in a respectful, trauma-informed and culturally relevant manner and it reflects the views of the many Nova Scotians who participated in our consultations. I'd like to thank them one more time for their feedback, whether it came via a face-to-face -face meeting, a letter, or a survey. Their perspectives, experience, and thoughts have been instrumental in the creation of this bill. And I'd like to thank our community services staff and our and Ledge Council for their work on the bill. Their work will mean so much to so many. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour, Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am very honoured to have the opportunity at this historic moment to speak to Bill 23, an act to open adoption records. One of the very first memories I have as a new MLA was someone who came into my office and said, I need to get access to my adoption records, but I can't. And I have adopted cousins. Never thought of them that way, but I did know that they were. Had never worried or wondered about whether they had access to their records as a child. But this was someone coming to me saying, I need your help. And so when we did the due diligence and looked into it and discovered that we were one of the only provinces that hadn't taken this step yet, 
we did do the work. And on March 14th, 2019, I introduced Bill 117, the Adoption Information Act, because people like Scott Pike, Monica Kennedy, Mike Slater, my constituents, my family members, and so many others were willing to advocate for something that was deeply personal and desperately needed. An awful lot has been said about this legislation. There are those who are nervous about what it might mean for them personally or for their children or for a loved one. I want to commend the government because I believe that they have done the work that needed to be done. And I am grateful to them for doing so. This is excellent legislation. And I believe that all of the concerns that people brought forward were listened to. And I do believe it strikes the right balance. And I'm incredibly proud of the minister as well as the government for bringing this forward at this time. Finally, what I would like to do is to thank every single birth parent who chose the difficult and highly personal and often painful decision to place their child up for adoption. It is an incredibly selfless thing that they have done to put their child's needs at the forefront. I want to thank every single adoptive parent who welcomed their child into their home with open arms and an open heart. Everyone deserves to be part of a loving family, to know where they came from, and to feel a part of the community that we all value so much. So I'm grateful to the government. I am proud to stand here today to be part of this moment. And I thank everyone who participated in the process leading up to today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to speak in support of an act to open adoption records in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia is the last province in Canada to open adoption records, and that is why I'm so pleased today to support the passage of this bill that will finally allow adoptees and their families greater access to their own social, cultural, and medical history. I would like to thank the minister for accepting our changes to the gendered language included in the original bill. And as we bring forward new pieces of legislation, I think it is important to update the language to reflect our present understanding of gender identities. So thank you very much. I would like to thank the minister very much for that, uh, Mr. Speaker. I was pleased to see the to see that this act establishes a role for the department to provide trauma-informed support services for adoptees, their families, and birth families. It will be critical for the government to commit the resources, the funding, and the appropriate staff to successfully imp implement this act, but so very much needed, Mr. Speaker. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the Nova Scotia Adoptee Advocacy Group and the other advocates whose hard work was essential into getting us to this very exciting moment. Mr. Speaker, I thank you, and I will take my place. If I unrecognize the Honourable Minister of Community Services, it will be to close third reading of Bill Number 23, the Adoption Records Act. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank all members of the House for their comments on Bill 23 and for the comments last year when we discussed the concept of uh, changing the legislation, uh, or maybe it was the year, a year and a half before because uh, sometimes with COVID I'm sort of uh, a little, <laughs> um, sometimes I leave out a month or two. but. Uh, for the comments, uh, the day that we uh, discussed this in the House, I thought it was a really thoughtful exchange. Um, I thought it was a very heartfelt exchange. It was one of the days in the House uh, that I'll always remember. 
and uh, and I always remembered it too because it was mostly women who spoke on this on this bill, uh, and I thought that adoption was something that seemed awfully personal to us because um, all of us had a story. Uh, some of us have adopted children. Um, I have a weird thing where where my two of my kids are adopted, but I gave birth to them <laughs> uh, because when. My husband adopted them. Uh, if if I didn't adopt them too, then 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 I wouldn't have been their mom anymore. So it was just sort of one of those crazy things in the law. But but it was one of those days in the house that I will always remember uh, because it was it was heartfelt and it was clear to me it was time to change uh, this legislation. So I so appreciate uh, your suggestions and your support of this bill. I'd like to end third reading today with comments from Scott Pike and Monica Kennedy of the Nova Scotia Ad Adoption Advocacy Group. Monica said, this bill is the first step to allowing thousands of families to reunite with a chance of a positive reunion. And Scott said, this bill puts the decision making back in the hands of those involved instead of government making these very personal decisions. So with these comments, Mr. Speaker, I move to close third reading of Bill 23 an act to open adoption records in Nova Scotia. The motion is for third reading of bill number 23, the Adoption Records Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please indicate aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill 23, an act to open adoption records in Nova Scotia. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. <laughs> the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call bill number nine, the Crown Lands Act. We'll now call bill number nine, the Crown Lands Act. The Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I do move that... Uh... Third reading of Bill Number Nine, the Crown Lands Act. Thank you. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And on that short note, I am uh, very pleased to support the the minister's uh, move for the for this bill, and the BC Caucus is pleased to support this move, as recommended by uh, the Leahy Report. Thank you. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Um, sorry, folks, I have a speech. Um... Keep the trend going here, please. <laughs> I, am, I am going to speak. I am going to speak. Um, we welcome this amendment to the Crown Lands Act. It is indeed uh, something that was recommended uh, in the Leahy Review of Forestry Practices, um, and, and it is necessary. Um, at the same time, I'm, I'm going to take a bit of time about my, uh, I guess, my hopes and, and my trepidations around this act. Um, this, this was a recommendation of the Leahy Review I am concerned that it has been um, more than two years uh, since this government accepted the recommendations of the Leahy Review. And, and, and this change, which is a change to the purpose clause of the Crown Lands Act, uh, certainly could have been brought forward in an earlier legislative uh, session. And in fact, um, in the 1920-2020 uh, uh, departmental business plan of, um, I think it may have still been Department of Natural Resources at the time, though frankly I forget when that change happened, but, but in, a, in the 2019-2020 um, business plan, there was a, a stated commitment, intention to do a review of the Crown Lands Act the whole act, not just the purpose. Um, and, and so I am hopeful about that this change is coming forward and also 
I am, I am trepidatious, and I would suggest that I and, and my colleagues in the NDP caucus and many people across this province will be watching to see how that purpose translates into the change that many Nova Scotians want to see actually on the landscape of Nova Scotia. Um, we know, and, and I would say that it is not, you know, it's not unique to this government, but we, we know that um, the Department of, of Lands and Forestry and the previous Department of, of Natural Resources has not always um, done the work that is given to it by law. And in fact, it's quite, um, quite sobering reading, uh, reading the, the case um, where the department was found to have not uh, followed the Endangered Species Act. Um, in the words of um, Justice Brothers, and this is just from the very first paragraph of that decision, when government is entrusted through legislation with duties and responsibilities but fails to discharge, discharge them, there must be recourse. And, and so our effort in this caucus to, um, to, both to take good advice that came to us from uh, people who showed up at the Law Amendments Committee, uh, to actually use that committee for the purpose for which it is intended, um, and to add some additional language uh, to uh, the change to the purpose is all in an effort to, to make this change more robust, because we are actually trying to change um, change course in Nova Scotia, change course in, on our Crown lands in a significant way. Um, in fact, in, and, and I don't want to see the government in any way backslide um, on that commitment. In the, in the government response from 20, uh, 2019 to, um, to the Leahy report, the language was used that um, the key to Professor Leahy's report is the adoption of a new paradigm, ecological forestry. Uh, I remember the first time I heard the word paradigm used uh, and a, a paradigm shift. And I, I, I was um, attending a university uh, presentation where I was one of the people speaking. Um, but there were three of us, and it was, it was, um, it would have been 1992, 1993, around the time that uh, global warming and climate change were first being talked about at the level of the UN, and, and one of the other presenters used this term of a paradigm shift, and I went through the entire presentation not knowing what, like, going, where, where's my dictionary? It was before, before cell phones were in, invented, uh, kind of gleaning what it meant, but not actually having ever heard the word before. And, and it's a big change. It's a big change. Um, and, and we want to see uh, this government and the provincial government on behalf of all Nova Scotians I have the courage to, to actually make the change towards ecological forestry that is called for in the Leahy report and that it, it committed to in its response to the independent review of forest practices in Nova Scotia. Um, we have seen backsliding before. We have seen widespread calls for change before. We have seen commitments to change before and we have seen those abandoned. We saw um, the natural resources strategy which came out of the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act which engaged thousands of people which put out, you know, not under one, one party's banner, but under the, the province of Nova Scotia. It was the province of Nova Scotia's natural resources strategy with a plan for our resources for, from 2011 to 2020. And, and we saw significant parts of that just abandoned. The work just left, um, including a commitment to uh, a 50% reduction in clear cutting on Crown land. Um, it was the abandonment of that target and then forest practices that people could witness on the landscape that they are, they are traveling through and, and know well. Uh, 
that caused the outrage that resulted in the then premier in, in 2017 committing to the review of forestry practices. Um, and that was done in the budget address, which just came on maybe the eve or maybe two days before the writ drop. And, um, and so we, we've seen, this, we've seen this, this crest of concern and then the political reaction to the concern, but not always the follow through. And we need follow through. And, and I recognize from, gosh, talking to so many people that changes, I mean, you can witness it in, any, in, 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 in many dimensions of our lives and of our society that change is hard. Change is real hard. Um, but we are at a moment, um, I would suggest, on, in terms of Crown land management, in terms of that particular department, where change is required and it's overdue. It's been promised, and now it's time to deliver. Um, so one of the changes, um, yeah, as part of, of that paradigm shift to ecological forestry, um, that is that is difficult to to live up to is is actually re, um, leaving leaving forests standing while harvesting them, which is sort of the the beauty of ecological forestry. Um, one forester I've spoken a, a lot with says, you know, you can you can do an awful lot by providing a little bit of space and a little bit of light. Um, that's what that's what makes forests grow. So you can you know. Um, you can, you can harvest uh, selectively, even using significant machines, um, and, and create some space and create some light and, and encourage regeneration and never leave the soil exposed. Never leave, um, never leave uh, an expanse of, of destruction uh, on the landscape. Um, and, and so that is the kind of paradigm shift that is called for in uh, the, the recommendations of the Leahy Review. And again, we're, we are more than two years past the government accepting them. And so that's why this past fall, as we approached uh, that two-year anniversary, why I, as the NDP spokesperson on lands and forestry, called for a moratorium on even-aged harvesting practices on Crown lands until significant um, milestones were reached in terms of implementation of the Leahy Report, including adoption of the new civil culture guides. Um, and, and I'll share, like, I know I'm not. I know I'm not an expert. I know I'm not. And in fact, if I, if I wanted to be an expert, even after even after devoting myself for, for decades, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not by nature a person who, who is like 100% certain that I'm right or will project myself as more certain than I am. Um, it's just not, it's not some, a way of being that I'm, I'm all that comfortable with. And so I really um, hesitated and tried to double check and um, verify that we were at the point to call for that moratorium. But I, I, I did feel that we were, that, that people across the, the province were losing, um, losing confidence that the change that they knew was necessary was going to happen. And, and then just very, a very short time after we made that call, I, I realized um, that, in fact, you know, seven members of the minister's own advisory committee on forestry within, within weeks of us um, had made the same call. I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. And just to, to quote a little bit of their letter that they wrote to the minister, they said that they had learned that uh, mills in the West Fork Consortium in Southwest Nova Scotia currently have five years of harvest plan approvals in place. This means the practices that Leahy rejected will, main the, will remain the dominant treatments on forested crown lands for many years after the government accepted the recommendations of the independent review of forest practices in Nova Scotia. We have not been able to get a commitment 
from this government an absolute clarity that when they adopt the civil culture guides, that it will then apply to all cuts from that day forward. And so we are, like many Nova Scotians, watching the, well, I mean, I'm not, but countless citizens are, in, devoting so much time to watching the, the Harvest Map viewer, to looking at uh, the, sorts of, uh, the sorts of cuts that are approved. This is, this is a list of, of the cuts that are, you know, are open for comment right now in Annapolis County, in Halifax County, in Queens County. And the majority of them are variable retention cuts. Variable retention uh, cuts are the sorts of, uh, are, is the, the sort of clear cutting, to use a not very technical term, that um, is allowed to happen on Crown lands with the interim guidelines that were announced in December 2018. Um, interim guidelines. And so they, they, are, they are significant cuts where a portion of that, uh, of that, that plot uh, will not be cut. And, and that's better than it was. It is significantly better than it was. But if, if you've, you know, I don't know, picture a football field and 20% and of it is, is left forested and the rest of it is clear cut, we know that there are significant, there are gonna be real challenges to implementing ecological forestry on, on, that, on that whole football field. Um, because 70% of it, the soil is exposed. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, there isn't the, the, regeneration hasn't started to take hold by leaving that space and that light. Um, it's, the, the ecosystem is, is damaged. And so to then uh, say, okay, well now, I don't know, in 2022, we're now gonna do ecological forestry, it, it becomes, far less um, viable. Um, so the, you know, these are a couple of the reasons why, um, why we're concerned, where, why we are continuing to join our voices with many other people who are calling for a moratorium on even age harvesting until the, the civil culture guide is indeed um, guiding all, uh, all cuts on crown land. And it's also uh, why I, I hope my, my comments have given a sense as to, as to why we moved some amendments to the Crown Lands Act and why we are glad. And, and I'm personally gratified and, and, and grateful that the government was open to those, um, to those amendments. So one of those amendments um, adds consideration of climate change to the many different values and consideration uh, that the department will uh, will consider uh, for its management of crown lands, along with along with recreation, along with um, you know cultural values, along along with economic values, um, and and also why uh, we were able to add an, another sort of subclause to the purpose that says that the, that the department will will engage in land use planning in order to pursue all of, all of the other purposes, all of the, all of the different considerations. Um, and, and that goes back to, again, to Leahy, because the, the recommendation is that ecological forestry will be the, the dominant way of doing forestry going forward, but there will also be high production forestry on, on certain pieces of land, on certain parts of the landscape. But at this point, again, more than two years later, we don't know where those will be. And, and some people would argue that high production forestry is sort of what we've done up until now, assuming that we're always gonna be able to like move on to another piece of land that hasn't been touched in a long, long time. Um, and so we've kind of used up crown land for one time high production forestry instead of practicing ecological forestry where we are continually kind of coming back to the, to, uh, to some of the same landscape, but not ever leaving it um, barren. Uh, and so uh, including, um, yeah, including a reference to land use planning in the purpose clause 
I hope is significant and um, and adding consideration to clim of climate change to the Crown Lands Act, I certainly I certainly feel like could be significant. Um, and and for me, uh, yeah, you know, it's hopeful because we should actually be considering climate change in in pretty much every single aspect of the way that we govern uh, Nova Scotia at this juncture. Um, at this juncture. Um, a last thing I'll say about uh, about uh, climate change in regards to the Crown Lands Act is that I, you know I think we're we're at the point where we also have to be um, you know really looking hard and being honest uh, with ourselves and and with our trading partners uh, in in conversations around the use of biomass for energy. I, I asked some questions about this to a recent. Um, at a recent uh, committee meeting, you know, have we ever done a land use, um, a, a land use, uh, not sorry, not a land use, like a, a, a life cycle assessment of whether it is true that we can consider uh, biomass uh, for energy as a renewable energy source? Um, at, at, you know, we know. It's been written about quite widely in scientific journals that there was there was like a a, a calculation error um, initially when uh, when biomass was was designated uh, a renewable resource. Um, it was considered to be neutral if you if you uh, cut it down because if you cut down trees to use for biomass because the trees would grow back um, and. And it was also, and it, therefore, it was considered neutral when it went up the smokestack. But in fact, it, like there, there, there are greenhouse gas emissions um, that come out of those smokestacks when you're burning biomass uh, that are currently not calculated, uh, to the best of my knowledge. And and also, the point has now been made that that the the time frame during which we need to seriously address climate change is actually much shorter than the time frame that it would take for that tree to you know reincorporate the same amount of carbon again in a tree uh, trees trees take longer to grow to, to uh, you know to, to significant size than we have right now to uh, address climate change so so that's another aspect of the work of the department of, and the work of uh, the Leahy Review of Forestry that I, I hope will proceed in part guided by this purpose of the Crown Lands Act. Um, I want to I want to say uh, just a last thing again about well two last things. Uh, one is that the point has been made, and I think it's important to remember as the department uh, and and the government. Um, commits and recommits to the Leahy Review um, and does not backslide, that the Leahy Review and the Leahy recommendations are a compromise. They are the compromise. If we compromise on implementation of Leahy, we're not, we're not making the change that we need to make. The, the compromise is baked in to the triad approach. Um, and then the last thing I want to say, and I've said it before outside this legislature to people who were um, uh, raising their voices uh, earlier in this session, and I've said it uh, you know, in different parts of the province when I've met with people, um, I, want to, I want to acknowledge the work and the stewardship of many citizens. The Crown land is, is, is our collective land. It's, it's, it's our common land. And Many Nova Scotians, you know, it generously and also because of, of a lack of confidence in, this, in the governments, in the department stewardship of Crown Land, are keeping an eye and putting a lot of time into that. Um, and I want to acknowledge that because it's it's significant. It has resulted in in changes, including 
including that political move to call for the Leahy review, you know, years after the natural resources strategy had been effectively abandoned. Um, it's important. It's important, and I really appreciate. Uh, I really appreciate people's time and effort and caring, and I really appreciate all the learning that I have done as, um, as our caucus's uh, spokesperson on this file. So thank you very much. Trying to recognize the Honorable Minister of Lands and Forestry, it will be the close third reading on Bill Number 9, the Crown Lands Act. The Honorable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I move to close uh, third reading on Bill Number 9, Crown Lands Act. Thank you. Motion is for third reading of Bill Number 9, the Crown Lands Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please indicate aye. Aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill 9, an act to amend Chapter 114 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Crown Lands Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honorable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 28, the Land Titles Initiative Acceleration Act. We'll now call Bill Number 28, the Land Titles Initiative Acceleration Act. The Honorable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that Bill 28, the Land Titles Initiative Acceleration Act, be now read a third time. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the members opposite for their comments at second reading. Clearly, there's much support for these amendments, amendments that represent a step towards correcting an historic wrong. I want to thank the members opposite, Mr. Speaker, for that support. But I also want to acknowledge all the hard work from my colleagues across multiple departments who are united in the common goal of accelerating the land titles clarification initiative, Mr. Speaker. As outlined during second reading, this legislation will expedite the land claims process and remove more barriers so that residents in five historic African Nova Scotian communities can get clear title to their land, the land that their families have been living on for generations. With legal certainty of ownership, Mr. Speaker, more Nova Scotians in these communities will finally be able to exercise the benefits of land ownership that the rest of us take for granted, such as obtaining a mortgage, dividing or selling their land, accessing housing grants, or building equity in their homes. The actions we will be taking through this legislation, Mr. Speaker, will not only significantly expedite the land titles initiative, it will also help us continue to build trust with African Nova Scotian communities, create positive and lasting change, and is just one more step in addressing an historic injustice. Those brief remarks, Mr. Speaker, I'll take my seat and look forward to hearing comments from my colleagues. The Honourable, Mem Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, stand and uh, give uh, brief reply to uh, Bill 28. Uh, my uh, progressive conservative colleagues as well as myself certainly support this legislation and recognize uh, the goals of uh, that it's set out to achieve. Um, and uh, it's certainly beneficial to uh, many African Nova Scotian uh, families in, in the few communities that are here. Uh, we're very glad to see that uh, the government's extending this and uh, certainly hope that uh, uh, there will be a phase three if, uh, if this doesn't uh, resolve any of the outstanding work that needs to be d done. So with that, uh, I'll sit and the PC caucus does support this bill. Thank you, Mr. Cha uh, Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased uh, to speak in support of this bill. The NDP caucus uh, will support this bill. We're glad to see it. We're glad to see progress. Um, as I said on second reading, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that progress has been quite slow on this file. Um, that included a court case um, with, uh, with the government um, and hurdle after hurdle. Uh, and so I want to start by just thanking um, and acknowledging the families 
who have been here for generations in most cases, <laughs> much longer than my family has been here, um, who have had to withstand the lack of certainty, the lack of security, and the systemic disadvantage that comes from not having clear title to your own land. Um, and so we are very pleased that that situation um, continues to move forward. Uh, and you know the situation with land titles in historically black communities in Nova Scotia is one of the clearest examples of systemic racism in our province. Um, land was given to the, loyal, to the loyalists in the 1800s, but only white settlers were given title. So everyone got land, but if you were white, you got title. If you were black, you didn't. Um, we know that property ownership and inheritance are significant sites of power and privilege in our society. Um, and so starting in 1800 and you know, right through to 2021, in many cases, um, African Nova Scotians have been denied that. Uh, I want to note on that, on that line that this hasn't been the case for everyone who has denied clear title. Um, you know, uh, some Acadians also experience that. Um, but when the government determined that it wanted to remedy the situation, um, it was remedied. No one applied, it went quickly, um, it was cleared up. Um, and that speed uh, has not been applied and, and still isn't quite being applied uh, for the communities that are impacted by this bill, which, is, which are North Preston, East Preston, Lincolnville, and Sunnyville. Um, it's encouraging that this is called the Land Titles Initiative Acceleration Act, but we still uh, don't quite understand what the speed standards are here. How quickly will this happen? How much capacity um, has been created? We definitely applaud the appointment of Angela Simmons as the executive director of the program. It's incredibly encouraging. She has been a tireless champion uh, for African Nova Scotian families and on this file in particular. She has been working on it since she was a law student. Um, she's tremendously capable. Um, and you know, we our understanding is that many of the stakeholders uh, have increased faith in the process, knowing that she'll be there to guide it. Um, but we are very hopeful uh, that you know the government will be able to assuage, if not us, then then those families still going through this process, how progress will be evaluated, how communities will be involved, um, and how this process will genuinely be accelerated. So uh, this is a great step in the right direction. Um, we support the bill and, and we hope that progress is swift uh, and justice is as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Finally recognize the Honorable Minister of Justice will be to close third reading of bill number 28, the Land Titles Initiative Acceleration Act. What up? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, again uh, my colleagues uh, throughout the legislature for their uh, remarks. Uh, most uh, significantly, uh, it, it seems the, the continued uh, support uh, for this bill uh, as, as through the other uh, readings and uh, at this point as well. So uh, I think uh, what this shows again is uh, the um, unanimous recognition of uh, the need to address and uh, improve uh, the speed of delivery of um, the uh, land uh, title clarification process. Uh, and indeed, uh, as I mentioned in the second reading, the, the feedback and the input from families and, and communities that have been involved in the process uh, actually is what uh, led to uh, the specific amendments and changes and investments that are, are being made to, uh, again, accelerate uh, this process. And uh, with those few words, Mr. Speaker, uh, I now move to close a debate on Bill 28. Thank you. Motion is for third reading of Bill number 28, the Land Titles Initiative Acceleration Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please indicate aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill 28, an act to amend Chapter 250 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Land Titles Clarification Act, respecting that the Land Titles Initiative. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honorable Government House Leader. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 47, the MGA and HRM Charter, respecting accessibility. We'll now call Bill Number 47, the Municipal Government Act and the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting accessibility. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill Number 47 be now read for a third time. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am uh, pleased to uh, be speaking to Bill 47, the Municipal Government Act and the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting accessibility. The Progressive Conservative Caucus is in support of this bill, along with being committed to working with all municipalities and the government in partnership, ensuring Nova Scotia is fully accessible by 2030. Mr. Speaker, I was a bit disappointed that the amendments to Bill 47 presented by the PC party in Nova Scotia were not passed. Mr. Speaker, the proposed amendments that we presented were to ensure that the Department of Municipal Affairs would not download this to the municipalities and will continue to fund the majority of the required grants support for grant support for small businesses to meet the requirements under the Accessibility Act. Mr. Speaker, in closing, again, the Progressive Conservative Caucus will be in support of this bill and along with being committed to working with municipalities and the government in partnership, ensuring Nova Scotia is fully accessible in 2030. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Cape Breton Center. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to say the NDP caucus will be supporting this legislation as we've heard that it allows some municipalities to undertake specific projects with businesses. The goal is to make this province accessible by 2030, Mr. Speaker. Delays only put off the social inclusion and hold our communities back. Mr. Speaker, we believe that although providing funding for this work is not the responsibility of municipalities, there is more harm done by preventing these projects than there is in the problems that may result from it from this enabling legislation. However, it was the job of the government to find to find out if municipalities share that view through through uh, consultation. This has been the theme in legislative session. Some government consultation is done, but stakeholders find that there's not appropriate follow-up or sharing of information. Legislation apparent apparently based on the outcome of consultation comes as a surprise to those who will be most affected. Mr. Speaker, we will vote for this legislation in the hopes that most small businesses understand the intense financial pressure that municipalities face and will not demand assistance that should be coming from the province. On the topic of what should be coming from the province, I am concerned to see that the Department of Communities, Culture and Heritage Program, Business Accessibility, has had fewer participants in the past year than in, than in the year 2018 and 2019. In February 2019, the government reported that they had invested more than one million that year to help 41 businesses increase their accessibility, Mr. Speaker. For the 2021 program, only 21 businesses received grants totaling 488,091. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, the night is getting long. That's less than half of the funding. Why, why this drop in accessibility grants for businesses with all this attention on giving municipalities the power to offer direct financial assistance to businesses, I hope that the government will be ensuring that its own programs are fully subscribed and well-funded so that we are all working toward the 2030 goal as quickly as possible, Mr. Speaker. Finally, a point I made in the second reading, the municipalities have been asking for increased funding. I will table the NSFM resolution concerning municipal funding that passed in 2018 and was retained in 2019. Part of this request is for the province, and I quote, the province of Nova Scotia to cost share 50-50 in all municipal projects required to comply with the Accessibility Act if those projects do not receive other funding beginning in 2019, end quote, Mr. Speaker. As I vote in favor of this bill, 
that will allow few municipalities to help businesses with their accessibility upgrades. I remain eager to know if the government is willing to help all municipalities comply with the act as requested. And that, with that, Mr. Speaker, I will take my seat. Fine, recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. It will be to close third reading on Bill Number 47, the MGA and the HRM Charter, respecting accessibility. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Cape Breton and the member from Truro Bible Hill, uh, Salmon River, for uh, the, the points that they made. And I will assure you that we will continue to work side by side with our municipal leaders uh, in, in NSFM in every corner of this province to assure that they are uh, that they're sustainable and that their their needs are, are met. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I move to close debate on bill number 47. The motion is for third reading of bill number 47, the Municipal Government Act and the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting accessibility. Would all those in favor of the motion please indicate aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill 47, an act to amend Chapter 18 of the Acts of 1998, the Municipal Government Act, and Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting accessibility. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. You, Speaker, would you please call Bill Number 50, the MGA and HRM Charter, respecting codes of conduct. Yeah, the, we'll now call Bill Number 50, the MGA Act and the HRM Charter, respecting codes of conduct. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill Number 50 is now read for a third time. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to third reading to Bill 50, Municipal Government Act in the Halifax Regional Municipal Charter, respecting codes of conduct. Mr. Speaker, we know that the code of conduct for municipalities has been a long-standing topic of discussion since since 2018 amongst the stakeholders. Mr. Speaker, our party feels the opportunity for this bill continues to be that the department's ability in consultation with stakeholders is to create provide, and provide a clear and consistent set of standards with sanctions. The implementation of this process will help, le help level the playing field for all municipalities in Nova Scotia. Our caucus is supportive of much of the content of this bill, we feel it has potential, but only if the stakeholders and municipal, who are the municipal, municipal units are consulted. So Mr. Speaker, thank you again for the opportunity to speak to Bill 50. The Progressive Conservative Caucus will be in support of this bill. And I hope that we can strengthen our partnership with all municipalities by implementing a process with clear and consistent actions across the province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am happy to support Bill 50, an act respecting codes of conduct. Enforceable codes of conduct at the municipal level, level are long overdue, Mr. Speaker, and we in the NDP caucus are supportive of this. In the last municipal election, we saw women, we saw women break through in historic numbers. We also saw some breakthroughs in terms of racialized candidates, Mr. Speaker. The face of municipal representation is changing, and this is very good news. Not everyone can see themselves reflected in the makeup of our councils. What's worse, though, is that some people do not feel welcomed or respected even when they become elected. Enforceable codes of conduct are crucial to ensuring that progress in more diverse and in more diverse representation on council keeps moving in the right direction, Mr. Speaker. Something we heard in law amendments, codes of conduct are not much use if they are not enforceable with clear sanctions. As a councillor, I have personal experience uh, of this, Mr. Speaker. While waiting for a meeting to begin, I bent over to pick something up and another councillor commented, good thing she stood up. I was going to spank her on the fanny. As a young female, female counselor, I deserved as much respect as anyone else. The comment was patronizing 
sexist and degrading, Mr. Speaker. The comments stopped me quite literally in my tracks. We had a code of conduct. What was lacking was an understanding of how that code of conduct should guide interactions and what would happen if a counselor crossed the line. I became well aware that the diversity officer was not able to sanction the counselor. Truth be told, I felt that um, he might that this counselor might never have, a have addressed me in that way if there had been training and an understanding that specific sanctions would follow a breach of, co of the code. What many municipalities, Mr. Speaker, have been calling for is a code with teeth. Known prescribed sanctions can prevent a lot of harm before it begins. I am happy to see that in, that in this bill. In the Committee of the Whole, I was, I was disappointed, though, Mr. Speaker, that the Liberal government voted against the funding for municipalities to prepare and implement these codes. We know that financial inequalities across municipalities is a problem. The robust, uh, the robust implementation of codes of conduct should be an option for every municipality, regardless of their budget, Mr. Speaker. So with that, I will end, I will end on this. If the government continues to bring these, bill, these enabling bills to do more for so far this session, Mr. Speaker, it needs to make more funding available to the municipalities. I would welcome a bill, a budget line, or an announcement that provides substantive response to the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities' repeated request for an increase into the Municipal Equalization Program. Mr. Speaker, and with that, I am happy to support the fact that there is going to be uh, codes of conduct, and I will take my seat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Trying to recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs will be to close uh, third reading of Bill Number 50, the MGA and the HRM Charter respecting codes of conduct. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Cape Breton Centre for sharing her very personal story and assure her that uh, there will be extensive consultations and sanctions along with this code of conduct. And I want to thank the member from Truro Bible, Bible Hill, Salmon River, for his support. And I, again, would like to assure him that we will be reaching out to our NSFM members um, for extensive consultation. Mr. Speaker, uh, with these two bills tonight, I'd also like to thank um, all the stakeholders involved in the consultation. I'd like to thank the Department of Municipal Affairs and their staff that work around the clock to, to uh, engage, listen, and bring forward legislation that's reflective of the needs of our municipalities. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I move to close debate on Bill number 50. The motion is for third reading of Bill Number 50, the Municipal Government Act and the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting codes of conduct. Would all those in favor of the motion please indicate aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill 50, an act to amend Chapter 18 of the Acts of 1998, the Municipal Government Act, and Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting codes of conduct. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please allow me to conclude the government's business for today? <laughs> I move that the House to now rise to meet again tomorrow, Friday, April 9th, 2021, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 11.59 p.m. Following the daily routine and QP, business will include, of course, the continuation of the, the Committee of the Whole and Subcommittee on Supply, followed by second reading of Bills 98, 103, and 105, as well as third reading of Bill 4. The motion is for the House to adjourn to rise again tomorrow, Friday, April the 9th, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 11.59 p.m. Would all those in favor of the motion please indicate aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. The House is adjourned until tomorrow at 9 a.m.